Suspense. This is the man in black. Here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our star this evening is Miss Maureen O'Hara, whom you've seen rise to stardom in Hollywood within the short space of a year. Her performances in the 20th Century Fox production, How Green Was My Valley, then more recently in The Immortal Sergeant, and now currently in the RKO production, This Land Is Mine, have given her an enviable place in the ranks of America's new film favorites. Miss O'Hara makes her first appearance on our suspense stage tonight as the heroine of a study in homicidal mania, The White Rose Murders by Cornell Woolrich, which is tonight's tale of suspense. If you have been with us before, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue you, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation, and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so it is with the White Rose murders and the performance of Maureen O'Hara. We again hope to keep you in... Suspense! He stood there waiting. He knew that presently they would come out of the second-rate dance hall, out into the dimly lit street. He listened a while and smiled as the orchestra played that tune inside. And then they came out, the two girls, and still he waited, close enough to hear what they were saying. Well, I'll see you at the office tomorrow, Sally. Oh, I don't know how I'll get up. It's after one o'clock. Six hours sleep. Oh, I'll be dead tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Me too. Oh, gosh. Uh, I gotta have at least eight hours or I'm no good at all. I wish I had someone to walk me to the bus. It's four long blocks. I'll walk you down, Sally. Oh, don't bother. We go in different directions. Well, it's but... no trouble. Really, I don't mind. Well, really, it's not necessary. Come on. In the narrow alley that divides the dance hall from an ugly office building, he stood smiling. Just a little inside the alley, he stood stiffly against the wall, his head back, eyes closed, arms straight down, and in his left hand, a white rose. Well, all right then, Sally. Good night. Good night, Joan. See you in the morning. Dum, da, 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 da. Oh, I hope I don't have to wait long for the bus. <gasps> Who are you? Keep away. Keep away from me. Let me go. Let me go. The girl is dead. Tenderly, the figure straightens her hair and gently places the limp body on the ground. Then he opens her clenched fist and carefully, so that the thorns will not bruise her flesh, he places in her hand the white rosebud. <laughs> Pardon me, my good man. Is it true that you are the famous detective Terence Riley? Huh? Oh, Jenny, I didn't see you come in. Well, now that I'm here, how about offering to buy a cup of coffee for the girl you're going to marry? If you can ever get up enough nerve to ask her. Oh, it's no use, Jenny. I guess we better call it quits. I'm just a dick on the homicide squad, and that's all I'll ever be. And I'm a rich debutante. We don't belong together. Oh, you've been reading too many of those romantic stories, Terry. What is it this time? What's wrong? Yeah, they call him the White Rose Killer. He's got to be caught. It's a general demotion coming on if he isn't, and that's all I need to get back into uniform. Oh, don't worry, darling. You always look good in blue. Yeah. Just to match the way I feel. Tell me more about the White Rose Killer. What's he like? That's the stumble. He, he could be anybody. 
No one's ever seen him except the dead. And they don't talk about it afterwards. He just slips out of the shadows and kills and then slips back again. How many has he murdered? Four. And he's not through yet. It's going to be one of those chain things if he's allowed to keep on. Are you sure it's always the same one? Yeah. That part of it we're sure of. The same touch, the same way of operating every time. How do you know that? Well, it's a rose. A white rosebud. Death rose. Puts it into each victim's hand after he kills her. Her? Yep. It's always a woman. A young woman between 19 and 23. What's behind it? Do you have any idea? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. But here's what I figured out. You know what a rose stands for. Symbolically, I mean. Why, yes, it's, uh, it's the flower of love. The white rose, uh, the bud, has another meaning. Purity, loyalty, devotion, and especially it stands for a young girl. That's right. And that's about the way I see it. So maybe it's a double cross, committed against our murderer by some young girl whom he worshipped and who betrayed his faith in her. You ought to be a detective, not me. <laughs> Thanks, darling. I've got a very fine teacher. Ah, <laughs> sweet. There's another thing. The murders were all committed near places where there was music, dance halls, and cabarets and the like. There's a song that brings back the original shock that, you know, gives him the final push over into the darkness. As far as we can figure out, it's the beer barrel polka. Well, how does he commit the murder? Is it always the same way? Mm, always. Strangulation between the hands, with a thumb into the windpipe to keep his victims from crying out. But isn't there anything else you know about him? No, that's, that's why it's so hopeless. He's insane, of course. But there's only this one phase to his insanity. Probably perfectly normal in appearance and behavior. You could pass him on the street and even know it. Well, it's only when he sees someone vaguely like the girl he loved and hears that song that the one defective wire in him is jangled and short circuit. But Terry, the flowers, don't the flowers tell you? He must get them somewhere you could trace. Well, we don't know where he gets them. Maybe he steals them or... Terry, what if you were the one to get him? Well, it would mean a citation and a promotion. And then all the things that stand between us would disappear? We could get married? Well, the chances would be a lot better anyway. But what chance have I? Everyone in the department has been working their heads off for weeks and they've all failed. Uh-huh. Uh, Terry, what were the girls like? The ones he killed... Well, as, as I told you, they were all between 19 and 23. Their heights were pretty much the same, too. They were all tall girls, around 5 feet 6 or 7, a little taller than you, and all dark-haired. How did they wear their hair? Why, they... Say, what is this? Oh, nothing, darling, just, just interested. How did they wear their hair? Well, from what I remember, they uh, wore it sort of loose and curly down the back. I suppose each one had a resemblance to that long-dead love of his. That's probably it. Well, anyway, that's how the record stands. And we're all waiting for it to happen again. I see. Uh, Terry, um, I'd like to go home now. I shouldn't have told you all that stuff. I've given you the creeps. Oh, come on, Terry. Take me home. <laughs> Later, Jenny stands by the window in her room, looking out, thinking. She doesn't move for a long time. Then suddenly, quickly, she goes to her closet and begins to rummage through her many pairs of shoes. Carefully, she picks one pair with three-inch heels. Five foot six or seven. Then she walks quickly to the dresser, opens a drawer takes out a comb and starts redoing her hair. Worn loose and curly down the back. Well, here we go. Edwards! Edwards! Yes, miss? Is the car ready? Yes, Miss Virginia. I've been waiting for you. Let's go before Mother sees me. Your mother's been looking for you, miss. I hope you didn't tell her. No, Miss Virginia, I didn't. Good. Come on, Edwards. Where do you wish to go, Miss Virginia? The Starlight Dance Hall on Grove and 2nd Street. The Starlight, miss? Yes, Edwards, that's the place. I wouldn't go there unescorted if I were you, miss. It's one of the worst places in the city. 
This is a very bad reputation. The Starlight Dance Hall, Edwards. Very good, miss. Very good. Jenny walks slowly around the low light of dance hall, trying to make herself conspicuous. A tall figure leaning against a pillar watches her intently as he idly smokes a cigarette. He doesn't seem to belong there. His clothes don't have the nattiness of a dance lover. Jenny pauses not far from him. Deliberately, he throws his cigarette on the floor, steps on it, and slowly walks over to her. Hello. Oh. Oh, hello. You're not with anyone, are you? Oh, no, I, I'm alone. I thought so. I've been watching you all the time. Have you? I haven't seen you dance yet. I don't know anyone here. How about dancing with me, then? All right. Come on, let's go out on the floor. Do you come here often? No. I never go to the same place twice. You don't? Why? I'm always looking for new faces. I'm restless. Do you find the faces you're looking for? Listen. Listen to that song. I like that. I like it very much. Yes, it, it is a nice song. You know, you remind me of someone I used to know. I'm trying to think who. I do? Yeah. Do you mind if we stop dancing and go over and get a drink? No, uh, let's go. Oh, look. They sell flowers here. Yes, I see. I'll get you some. What kind would you like? Oh, uh, any kind. Uh, you pick it out. All right. Let's see. There's something kind of innocent and young about you. Different from most of the girls that come here. Can't we stay here a little longer? It's intermission now. They won't play again for ten minutes. Come on. But I, I, I like it here. Let's stay a little while longer. Alan, let's go down for some air. We can come back in a few minutes. Come on. But... We'll be back before the music starts. Oh, you're hurting my arm. Am I? I'm sorry. <sighs> Fresh air smells good, doesn't it? So dark here. Let's go back. You're not scared, are you? Oh no, it's it's. it's Let's walk just down this I... alley and back. Well, please, please. No, you let me don't. go. Thanks. That's a lovely necklace, beautiful. Why, you're just a cheap. Shut thief. up. All you wanted was my necklace. So long, beautiful. Look out. What's the matter? Behind you, look. Holy, she's dead. A girl, murdered. With a white rosebud in her hand. Well, Jenny, happened again last night. Just like the other times. A girl strangled in an alley and a white rose in her hand. Any news of the killer? No. He might just as well float through the air for all the trace he leaves. He must have bought the flower upstairs in the dance hall. He must have been there earlier, bought it, and saved no, it until... No, there was only one rose sold up there all night. And to a man who had a different girl with him. We had the flower girl at... How did you know that they sold flowers there? I didn't tell you. Well, I... Uh, I must have read it somewhere. You couldn't have. It wasn't in any of the papers. No details were given, just the statement that an unidentified body was found. Well, I... Yeah, well... I just imagined that they'd sell flowers in a place like that. Well, I'm glad you don't go near those dance halls. Why, with this nut running around oh, loose... Oh, don't bother about that. We'd better catch this killer. And fast. Where do you get this we stuff? To hear you talk, you'd think that you were on the case, too. Wouldn't you think so? To hear me talk? Again, Jenny tours the low dives, hunting for the white rose killer. Her 
search carries her to the waterfront. And as she walks past each dingy bar, she listens to the jukebox music. After midnight, she passes a dirty windowed saloon. The thin music catches her ear. She pauses and listens, her eyes alive for some sign, some indication of the person she's looking for. Then suddenly her body becomes rigid as her eyes fall upon a figure huddled in the shadows. Someone's watching me. Slowly, she starts to walk up the street. Behind her, the heavy tread of a man's footsteps keep pace with hers. It's a quiet tread, unhurried but deliberate. For several blocks, it keeps the exact distance. Jenny starts to walk faster. I've got to know if he's really following me. The man quickens his pace. Jenny starts across the street. The man follows. She's sure now, sure that the man is following her. She fumbles for something in her purse. Her hand closes around a gun. If he tries anything, I'll shoot. You in any trouble, lady? Oh, no, officer. It, it's all right. You scared him away. Scared who away? Oh, just a man who wanted to bring me flowers. That's all. Well, he brought you one anyhow, lady. What do you mean? Right there on the ground, right by your feet. A white rose. <laughs> Coffee, Mabel. Sure, coming right up. Here you are. Terry. Terry. Hello, Jenny. Sit down. Thank you. Say... What's the matter with you? Look, darling, read the gossip column in this paper. What daughter of a socially prominent family is that way about a detective and waits for him outside the station house in her limousine every night? Private chauffeur and all. But Mama says no. That's not so funny. Oh, they held a big family war council over me just now. Indian powwow, feathered headdress and everything. They did, huh? Well, what did they decide? Oh, I was asked to give my word that I wouldn't see you anymore. I refused, of course, so I had to be exiled. Where to? Our summer home. It's just a few hours out of town, but I'll be there all by myself, just with Mrs. Crosby, the housekeeper. Oh, maybe they're right. Why don't you listen to them? Are you on their side, too? No. When are you leaving? Right away. Edwards is driving me out. I just slipped out to let you know. Here's the address and phone number of the place in case you want to reach me. Don't lose it. I won't. Well, what's new and exciting about the White Rose Killer? Our famous lover of flowers? <laughs> We're still trying to track him down. I suppose I'll go looking for him at the flower show that's just opened. Oh, a flower show just opened? Yeah. Well, uh, goodbye now. I'll be seeing you. What uh, floor is the flower show, please? Third floor, miss. Three, please. Third floor. Where's the rose display, please? Uh, to your left, over there. See where the man in the gray coat is? In the gray coat? Oh, yes, thank you. They are lovely, aren't they? Oh, you... You startled me. I... I'm sorry. I was just admiring the roses. Oh, yes, the nicest flowers here. I, I just can't keep my eyes off them. Yes, you, you can feel that way about some flowers. Well, that's the way I feel about... White roses. Have you been here long? I really don't know. I suppose so. You, you see, I've come here every day since the show opened. I like to be near the roses, the white roses. 
Those big ones are nice. No, I, I like the little ones best. The little tightly curled rosebuds. They're so little and innocent. Oh, well, I, I really better be going. Are you going down? Yes. Down, please. Here, miss, I, I took a rose for you. Thank you. It, it's lovely. Would you, would you care to have a drink with me? Why, yes, thank you. I know of a little place a block or two down there. They have nice music. We'll go there. All right, whatever you say. <laughs> This is it. Where's the music? A nickel in the jukebox does it. Any special song you'd like? No. Uh, go ahead and pick one. Okay. There we are. Oh, that's my favorite song. Reminds me of a, a girl I used to know. Oh, uh, excuse me, I... Uh... I want to powder my nose. I'll be right back. Do you mind? No, of course not. Evans Police Precinct. Sergeant Thomas speaking. Hello. I is Terry Riley there? Uh, just a moment. I'll see. Please hurry, it's important. No, sorry, miss. Terry Riley's not here just now. Oh. Uh, will you, uh, will you tell him... Tell him that I can't keep that date with him. Goodbye. Do you always go to the phone booth when you want to powder your nose? Why, I, uh, well, I... I had to make a call. Uh-huh. Well, I'm afraid I'll have to leave you. Oh, wait. Uh, let me come with you. I'm sorry, miss, but I've got other things to do. Oh. What's the matter? That car. Someone that knows me. Let's get away from here. That's just what I'm going to do. So long, lady. Wait, wait. Please don't go. Miss Virginia. Miss Virginia. I'm sorry, Miss Virginia, but I must speak to you for a minute. Oh, Edwards. What do you want? I'm sorry, miss. You'd better come with me at once. I've been looking for you everywhere. Your mother's been taken seriously ill. Mother? Where is she? She's out at the country place, miss. I drove her there shortly before dinner. She wanted to pay you a surprise visit. Oh. I believe the shock of not finding you there upset her, miss. Is she very bad? She had the doctor with her when I left. Mrs. Crosby has gone away for the day. Your mother needs you, miss. Well, let's go. Hurry, Edwards, please. Right, miss. Where is Mother Edwards? In her room, miss. You'd better hurry. Mother? Mother? It's Ginny. Is the doctor in there with you? Mother? Why, there's no one here. The room's empty. The bed hasn't been touched. Edwards, what are you doing? Merely playing a song, miss. A favorite of mine. Uh, a favorite? Yes, Miss Virginia. Where's Mother? She's in the city, miss. You lied to me. I'm afraid I did, Miss Virginia. Why are you locking the door? You know why, Miss Virginia. It... it can't be. You're not the... The white rose killer. But you see, I am, Miss Virginia. Driving you and your family around day after day. Sitting there right in front of you all the time. It was amusing to watch you hunting for me. Hunting for someone you saw several times a day. But it, it can't be. You're not insane. Of course not. Who said I was? Edward, you know I'm not the girl who betrayed you. Yes, I know that. Well, then unlock the door and let me out. Please, Edwards. I've killed five times. I've never regretted it. I'm going to kill you, Miss Virginia. Why, Edwards? Why? Because you've been so clever. Too clever. You made yourself look like her, the girl who deceived me. I could have killed you the day you first went out looking for me, but I had to be careful. Oh. I almost caught you that night at the waterfront. 
The night I dropped the white rose when that police car came. Edward, I... I've never done you any harm. Your sweetheart, Terry. He loves you, doesn't he? Yes. That's good. Because now you won't be able to deceive him like my girl deceived me. Keep away, Edward. Keep away or I'll... <laughs> you oh. thought you'd use your gun, eh? Well, don't think I was fool enough to overlook that. I took your gun out of your purse. It won't do you any good to kill me, Edward. I didn't have anything to do with it. No, and you're not going to have a chance to break another man's heart like she broke mine. Jenny! Jenny! Where are you? Terry! Jenny? Terry! <laughs> it won't do you any good to call to him. He can't get in here without breaking down the door. Keep away from me. Terry! It will be too late then, because I'm going to kill you now. Just let me get my hands on that pretty white throat. Oh, keep away. Keep away from me. Uh, Terry, stop! Uh, Jimmy, are you all right? Yes, Terry, I... I'm all right. Oh, take it easy. Here, sit down. Oh, Terry, I was so scared. There was nobody here but Edwards and I. How... How did you know where I was? Oh, it was simple. You were supposed to meet me at the coffee shop. You never broke an appointment, and when you didn't show up, I called the number you gave me. You told me the housekeeper was here all the time, and when there was no answer, I got suspicious and came down. Besides, when I got a message down at headquarters that you had to break a date with me, I knew something was wrong. Are you sure you're all right? Yes, I... I'm... Uh... Terry! Look. On the floor beside Edwards. A white rose. Must have fallen out of his pocket. That was meant for me. Oh, Terry, it's... It's all crushed. Yeah. Crushed and dead. Just like the white rose killer. So closes The White Rose Murders, starring Maureen O'Hara. Tonight's tale of... Suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who, speaking for Columbia, hopes you have enjoyed Miss O'Hara's performance and our play. week because of a special broadcast of the all-star baseball game suspense will not be heard but again the following week we will be back with another play on this series and more of your hollywood favorites the producer of these broadcasts is william spear who with ted bliss the director bernard herman and lucien marowick conductor and composer and cornell woolrich the author collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. an attack of laryngitis, Gracie Allen is unable to appear in person at this time. So the program you are about to hear is a transcription of this evening's earlier broadcast. Another cup of Maxwell House coffee, George? Sure. Pour me a cup, Gracie. Do you know Maxwell House is always good to the last <laughs> drop? That drop's good, too. Yes, it's Maxwell House coffee time, starring George Burns and Gracie Allen.
With yours truly, Toby Reed, Gail Gordon, Hans Conrad, B. Benadaret, Elliot Lewis, Meredith Wilson of the Maxwell House Orchestra, and Bill Goodwin. For America's Thursday night comedy enjoyment, it's George and Gracie. And for America's everyday coffee drinking enjoyment, it's Maxwell House. Always good to the last drop. On his way home from the office, George has dropped in at the corner cigar store. Pops, the ancient proprietor, is quite interested in the bouquet of yellow roses that George is carrying. What you going to do with them roses, Mr. Burns? <laughs> Take them home to Gracie, Pops. Mm. Women folk dearly love flowers, don't they? Yes, they do. I had a date yesterday with a girl who was wearing an orchid. <laughs> college girl. You dated a college girl? Yeah. Vassa, 1885. <laughs> sure looked pretty with that big orchid on. Where'd you meet her? Picked her up outside Tom Brenneman. <laughs> Cup of cigars. Ready, Pop. Hello, George. Oh, hello, Mr. Bang. Hi, Joe. What's with the yellow roses, George? Selling them for a sideline? Taking them home to Gracie. Yeah? What's the occasion? No occasion. We saw them in the florist window and realized it's been a long time since I took her any. George, you can't take your wife a dozen roses for no reason. She'll think you've got a guilty conscience. Huh? There are only two times when a husband takes flowers to his wife. When she's got a birthday or he's got a hangover. <laughs> but you know, I've never done anything wrong. That's just it. it. You're ignorant about these things. Now listen to the voice of experience. Don't take those roses home. You see, I had a card put on them and everything. See, it says, to the sweetest little wife in the whole world. From her boopsie boy. <laughs> She used to call me that. Oh, brother. With that corny card on them, she'll know something's wrong. Mm. Take my advice, George. Leave those roses right here on the counter. On the counter? Well, eh, maybe you're right. Thanks for tipping me off, Joe. That's okay, George. We husbands have got to stick together. Let me have a couple of my favorite cigars, Pop. Oh, you mean them two for nickel perfecto royales? Yeah. <laughs> now, you'd better buy my whole stock of them things, Mr. Burns. There's another fella been threatening to take him. Another customer, huh? No, no, no. Fella from the board of health. <laughs> I'll see you later. Must you leave, Gertie? Well, I'd better, Clara. Joe will be home pretty soon, and he'll want to fix him some lunch. Yes. He's such a wonderful husband. I always wait on him hand and foot. Really? You know, I wait on George with my hand, but there are so few things I can do with my foot. <laughs> <laughs> but Gracie... Ha Let it go. <laughs> uh, would you and Joe like to go to a movie tonight? I don't think so. Joe went to one last night while we were at ladies' aid meetings. Oh, yes, that's right. So did George. You know... If I hadn't said no, he'd have gone to see that one with all the nudists in it. Nudists? Yeah, the Naked City. <laughs> but Gracie, make it... Uh, let that one go, too. I'm home, Angel Pie. Oh, hello, Gracie. Hello, Joe. What are you hiding behind your back, Joe? A little surprise for my precious girl. Close your eyes. Uh, all right. They're closed. Now open them. <laughs> Yellow roses. Oh, you sweetheart. Read the card, honey. For the sweetest little wife in the whole world from her booty boy. Oh, Joe, what a cute name. I thought you'd like it. Oh, see, that's what I used to call George. Well, I'd better go put these in water for you, baby dumpling. Excuse me, Gracie. Oh, Gracie, what a shame your husband can't be as romantic as mine. Well, George is improving, Clara. Spring has already made his kisses longer. <laughs> really? Yes, since the first of April, they've lasted over a minute. <laughs> Added together, that is. <laughs> but 
But he never brings you flowers. Well, now, give George a chance. Maybe she's waiting right now to surprise me with some flowers. I'll rush right home. I'll see you later. Goodbye, Clara. Goodbye. That chance she has of getting a surprise, poor child. What a shame she couldn't have married a kind old man. <laughs> I'm home, dear. So I see. George. What? I've got my eyes closed. You'd better open them. You'll fall over a chair. <laughs> did you, uh, bring something home for me? Oh, yes, I did. Oh, where are they? Put them in a tub of water on the service porch. Oh, a whole tub full? Down here, Paul. Brought home all the dirty shirts I had at the golf club. <laughs> On your way home, didn't you buy something for me? Oh, sure. I almost forgot. Oh, where are they? Right here. Two bars of laundry soap. <laughs> oh, you don't love me. What's wrong, sweetheart? It's good laundry soap. Oh, you, you and your soap. I just came from the Bagley's house, and Joe brought Clara a dozen yellow roses. Yellow roses? Yes, and they have the most romantic card on them. It said, to the sweetest little wife in the world from her booksy boy. Yes, George, where are you going? To see a certain guy. And when I get through with him, you'll have a lily in his hand. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Flowers for strangers, but none for your wife. <laughs> me, George. You're choking me. Darn right I am. Sure. Those roses cost me five bucks and you stole them and gave them to your wife. George, you don't know what you're saying. I had no intention of touching those roses. But they were lying there on the counter, dying for want of water. <laughs> now, look. I only wanted to save their lives. Yeah, but they were so young. So lovely. <laughs> it was like 12... Piteous little voices calling out to me. Water. <laughs> Water. <laughs> oh, we die. <laughs> well, I didn't give those roses to my wife as a present. She took them to nurse them back to health. She had the swell of you. Wait a minute. <laughs> Uh, the oily line won't work. Now, listen to me, Bagley. You go right down to that flower shop and have five bucks worth of roses sent to Gracie. Understand? Okay. And print my name on the card. Okay. And don't bother feeling their pulses. <laughs> if they're sick, we'll nurse them back to health. <laughs> washing your shirts, dear. Have you any other delightful little surprises for me? Now, Gracie. Perhaps you'd like me to sew your pocket shut. Sew my pocket shut? No, why not? You never reach into them for anything. <laughs> now, look, honey. I know you're upset, but just in a few minutes... Come in. Flowers for Mrs. George Burns. Flowers? To me? Oh, how wonderful. Let's see what the card says. To Gracie, the sweetest rose of all. From George. Oh, darling. Gracie. Oh, Gracie. You shouldn't kiss me before this boy. Well, you can kiss you later. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like I got here just in time. Mr. Bagley said to hurry. Who? Mr. Joe Bagley. He's the one who sent the flowers. Oh, this wasn't your idea, George. It was Joe Bagley's. But he knew you wouldn't think of it, so he tried to cover up for you. Just think that my husband needs help from another man. But, oh, I should have suspected this on our wedding day. When you had the bellboy carry me over the threshold. <laughs> but, honey... Oh, don't put Joe's lovely flowers in water. Darn it, kid. Why did you have to stick around? Why didn't you leave the flowers and scram? I'm waiting for my five bucks. <laughs> five bucks? Yeah, those flowers are COD. 
Oh, kill that Bagley. <laughs> Look at me. I want to talk to you. I haven't time now. I'm making spaghetti sauce for dinner. But, honey, I don't like spaghetti sauce. Well, Joe Bagley likes it. <laughs> huh? If you're not gentleman enough to show your appreciation to him, I am. I've invited Joe and Clara for dinner, and we're having spaghetti sauce. I won't eat it. You will, too. In fact, if Joe Bagley sets foot in this house, I'll eat rat poison. Well, you put spaghetti sauce on it. <laughs> So you could only listen for a... See who's at the front door. Okay. Howdy, little man. Oh, hello, Mr. Judson. Hey, you look sadder than a Texas steer that strayed into Oklahoma. <laughs> Are you in distress? Uh, I'll say I am. There's a neighbor of mine who keeps getting me in trouble with Gracie. She ought to be shot. But shooting's too good for a man like that. You ought to tie him hand and foot and stake him down just outside the Texas border, face in Texas. <laughs> what, uh, what led to? He'll lay there and drool himself to death. <laughs> hey, uh, by, by the way, who is the fella? Joe Bagley. Joe Bagley. I, I don't see how he keeps from getting in trouble with his own wife. You know what he done last night? What? He told his wife that he was going to remove it, but he didn't. He went to one of them stag parties with there was a hula dancer. Are you sure? He sat right beside me. <laughs> oh, you watched the hula dancer, too? Oh, well, now, only out of patriotism. Her skirt was made of Texas prairie grass. <laughs> so Bagley went to a stag and his wife thinks he went to the movie. Mr. Justin, this is my chance to get revenge. When he and his wife come to dinner tonight, I'll expose them. Woo-wee! You'll be in hot water. <laughs> I'll say you will, and then right it. At... Here comes Gracie. Who are you talking to so long, dear? Oh, hello, Mr. Justin. Howdy, little lady. Will you stay and have dinner with us? Oh, well, now, I thank you kindly, but i got to get down to the railroad station. The foreman of Moranch is sending a load of wild horses that he broke. Well, I hope you'll be able to mend them. <laughs> you hope you'll be able to mend? <laughs> oh, I like your sense of humor, man. Blossom time, a mighty cheering thought, Meredith. Can't you almost smell those blossoms, Toby? We had a half a dozen Jonathan trees in the backyard back home in Iowa. My mother babied those trees like one of the family. Well, it's easy to understand, Meredith. All winter, the apple tree stands its gnarled branches stark against the sky. And then one wonderful day in spring, there's this glorious flood of delicate, fragrant blossoms. Yes, wherever you go in America, from the fertile apple country of Winchester, Virginia, to the Yakima orchards of the far west, the fresh, fragrant blossoms of our apple trees are a beautiful and heartwarming part of our well-loved American scene. Yes, and today, wherever you go in America, you'll find folks enjoying the coffee that's become so much a part of this American scene. That coffee is Maxwell House. Americans love coffee, good coffee, which makes this a fact to remember. Today, more Americans buy and enjoy Maxwell House than any other brand at any price. Now, why do folks who want good coffee prefer Maxwell House? The answer is flavor. That famous good-to-the-last-drop Maxwell House flavor, you can credit to the expert blending of these choice coffees. Manasalis for Melanin. Medellin for richness. Other choice coffees for robust vigor. And 
and Bucaramanga for fine full body. All skillfully combined by experts in the truly great Maxwell House blend. Radiant roasted to flavor perfection. And brought to you vacuum packed and roaster fresh. Tomorrow, discover the extra flavor, extra satisfaction of America's favorite brand of coffee. Enjoy the very best in coffee drinking pleasure for only a fraction of a penny more per cup than the lowest price coffee sold. Tomorrow, ask for Maxwell House. Always good to the last drop. last, George has a chance to get even with Joe Bagley. Joe told his wife he went to a movie last night, but George knows he didn't. Both couples are seated at dinner now, and George is ready to spring the trap. George, you're not eating. You just sit there and smirk at me like the cat that swallowed the canary. George Burns, did you spoil your appetite by eating a canary? <laughs> no. Uh, by the way, Joe, seen any good movies lately? Movie? Yes, Joe went to one last night. What'd you see, Joe? Uh, well, the Treasure of Sierra Madre. Yeah, that's it. What a coincidence. That's the picture I saw last night. But I didn't see you at the theater. Uh, have another meatball, George. <laughs> I couldn't eat one. Just hold it in your mouth. <laughs> I want to talk about the treasure of Sierra Madre. Swell plot, wasn't it? Uh, yes, well. Why don't you, why don't you tell it to Clara? Yeah, tell me the plot, Yeah, Joe. it was a good plot. Yeah. <laughs> Quick, George. Somebody take me to the kitchen. Somebody Something's caught in my throat. Oh, George, I'm in a spot. I didn't see that picture last night. I went to a stag party. No. <laughs> yeah. You saw the picture. Tell me the plot so I can tell Clara. Why, sure, pal. I'll be glad to. Ah. <laughs> what are you laughing about? Well, the picture is a comedy. I laugh when I think of it. It's uh, all about this girl named Sierra Madre. <laughs> I thought Sierra Madre was a mountain range. Oh, no, no, no. In the picture, it was a girl. Played by Shirley Temple. <laughs> and Humphrey Bogart plays a minister. Bogart a minister? Yeah. He married Shirley Temple to Walter Houston. <laughs> what do you know? Hollywood finally came up with a new plot. Huh? Well, that's enough to tell Clara. Come on. Oh, you stopped coughing, sweetheart. <clears throat> Did George fix you up? Yeah. I fixed him up good. <laughs> and now I can tell you the plot of the picture. It's all about this girl named Sierra Madre, played by Shirley Temple. And a minister played by Humphrey Bogart. He marries her to Walter Houston. That's the plot? Yeah. George Burns, where were you last night? <laughs> huh? You weren't at the movies. That's not the plot you told me. But, sweetheart... Three men looking for gold. Of all the ridiculous things. <laughs> I should have known you made it up. But... Honey, you... Where did you go last night, you fiend in husband's form? <laughs> Come, Clara. Let us leave this unpleasant scene. Yes, lover. I'm sorry you had to learn that there are husbands who lie to their wives. Oh, no. Look, honey, it's almost midnight. For the millionth time, the treasure of Sierra Madre was about three men looking for gold. Don't lie to me, George. But I'm not. Walter Houston was an old desert rat. That's a fine way to talk about Shirley Temple's husband. <laughs> she wasn't married to Houston. That's a fine way to talk about Shirley Temple. <laughs> but she wasn't even in the picture. Can't you see the plot Joe told was a phony? Shirley Temple marrying Walter Houston. It would be ridiculous for a girl that young to marry a man that old. How dare you call our marriage ridiculous? <laughs> Gracie, it's too late to take you to the movie tonight. 
But the plot I told you is the right one. It's three men panning gold. Hmm, a likely plot. Men love gold. Why should they pan it? <laughs> I know someone who'll be up this time of the night, Bill Goodwin. And he sees every picture that's made. I'll go get him. Oh, and tip him off to what to say. Oh, no, I'll go with you. <laughs> And so a few minutes later, George and Gracie rushed up to the desk at Bill Goodwin's apartment hotel. Whom did you wish to see? Uh, Bill Goodwin and hurry. Yes, it's very urgent. One moment, I will see if he is in. Bill, there's a cute girl here with an old gent. They're asking for you. It looks like trouble. Okay. I am sorry. Mr. Goodwin has gone to join the French Foreign Legion. <laughs> So you can't force him to marry your daughter. <laughs> She's not my daughter. I'm George Burns, and this is Mrs. Burns. Oh, my mistake. Uh, hello, Bill. It's George and Gracie. Yeah, that couple that works on your radio program. <laughs> yeah, that's us. Okay, Bill. He's just leaving. He says, wait here at the desk. He'll be right down. Oh, look, George. Here comes Professor Cockendorfer, the man you heard lecture on antediluvian fossils. He lives here. Oh, H hello. Give me one Professor Corkendorker's key, please. <laughs> uh, hello. hello, Professor. Someone spoke? <laughs> yes, remember me? Of course I remember you. You think I'm blind? I got eyes like a house. <laughs> I know. Uh, you wish to see me? No. I'm waiting for Bill Goodwin. Oh, yeah, he likes pretty young girls like you. <laughs> I'm not a girl. Uh, by the way, Professor, have you seen the treasure of Sierra Madre? No, did she lose it? <laughs> I heard her look, I got eyes like a house. <laughs> Maybe I find a house who saw the picture. Uh -huh. Well, good night now. I get on the elevator. He walked into the coffee shop. Yeah, he always gets them mixed up. Hi, Burgess. Uh, you want to see me? Yeah. Uh, Bill, you can save my life. Did you see the treasure of Sierra Madre? Yeah, George, I went last night. Oh, wonderful. Tell Gracie all about it. Okay, uh, let's step into the coffee shop and sit down. What floor is this? <laughs> this is the first floor. Slow elevator, but they... <laughs> Slow elevator, but they serve nice coffee. Well, you're wrong about the elevator, Professor, but you are right about the coffee. It's the best. It's Maxwell House. Bill, don't get sidetracked. Tell Gracie about the picture. Okay, George, but here's the waiter. Give him your order first. Now, what do you have? Uh, bring three cups of Maxwell House coffee. Yeah, three cups of Maxwell House coffee. Uh, I believe I'll have three cups, too. <laughs> you know, Maxwell House is so delicious, one cup is just a teaser. Now, Bill, let's, let's get to the movie. Tell Gracie just what happened. Okay, now I'll start with the sensational love scene. Now, this gorgeous redhead Wait a was, was... Wait a minute. What love scene? Where was there a, a redhead in that movie? Sitting beside me in the balcony. <laughs> Bill, we're only interested in the picture. Tell Gracie the plot. Well, George, I don't know the plot. Why not? When you're sitting in the balcony with a gorgeous redhead, who watches the picture? <laughs> Bill, you must have looked at the screen once or twice. Don't you remember? Those three men struggled across the desert, almost died at first. They did? Why? To get the greatest treasure in the world. Well, that's silly. They could get Maxwell House in any market. <laughs> what a treasure. No wonder more people buy Maxwell House than any other brand of coffee in the world. I'm talking about gold. Gold schmold. Who'd look for that? <laughs> Can you pour gold in a percolator and get a steaming, fragrant drink that'll start your day out right? No. For that, you need Maxwell House. Oh, now, you see, George, even Bill doesn't believe that ridiculous plot about looking for gold. Well, I certainly don't. Now, listen, you two. Somebody said, too? That's my floor. I get out here. Uh, I wonder... I wonder who... Is that the buzzer? Mm -hmm. Who's at the door this time of the night? Oh, that's Meredith. I called him to drive me home to Mother. 
What? I won't live with a man I can't trust. Come in. Good evening, all. You sounded distraught on the phone, Gracie. Is something amiss? Yes, Meredith. I'm leaving, George, and I want you to take me home to Mother. Very well, although Mama may not approve of my bringing home a married woman. <laughs> I mean my mother. Oh, well, that's a horse of a different color. <laughs> uh, that's merely a saying and intends no reflection on your mother's figure. Oh, yes. Why don't you run along, Meredith? Gracie isn't leaving yet. I am, too. If you weren't where you said you were last night, how do I know where you were all the other nights? Where were you the night before last? I was with you all evening. The only time I left your side is when I went into the kitchen to get a glass, get you a glass of milk. Uh huh. And who did you have a date with in the kitchen? <laughs> Gracie. Where were you two years ago last night? I don't know. Where were you on our wedding night? <laughs> I was with you. Any witnesses? <laughs> Certainly, you. Oh no, you're not dragging me into your sordid past. <laughs> Oh, look, honey. Let's go, Meredith. I won't live with a man I can't trust. Gracie, honestly, I went to the movies last night. Oh, George, it's bad enough to lie, but it's even worse not to admit it when you're caught. Okay, if that's what you want, I'll say it. I didn't go to the movies last night. I never saw The Treasure of Sierra Madre. Oh, it's too bad you missed it, George. It was an excellent picture, all about three men who went hunting for gold. Oh, then you did see the picture, George. Sure. You lied to me. <laughs> You just told me you didn't see it. Let's go, Meredith. I won't live with a man I can't trust. Oh, what? <laughs> and now here is an important announcement. Daylight saving time will be in effect in many communities next week. But this will not change the regular time of broadcast for Maxwell House coffee time, except in Portland, Oregon, California, and Nevada, where it will be heard one hour earlier. Remember, Portland, California, and Nevada listeners... Beginning next Thursday, tune in George and Gracie one hour earlier. Good things. The easy way. Do you like good things the easy way? Then get instant Maxwell House coffee. So good. So good. True coffee flavor and fragrance because instant Maxwell House is not a so-called coffee product. It's all pure Maxwell House coffee in instant form. And so easy. So easy. Instant Maxwell House means great coffee instantly in your cup. No fuss, no muss, no bother. The preceding was transcribed. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. I'm E.G. Marshall. The human brain, we are told, contains three layers, areas. The conscious, the subconscious, and the unconscious. We have, all of us, experienced the effects of these areas. Especially that strange no-man's land between waking and sleeping. Between dreams and reality. When we are never quite sure where we are, or at times even what we are. So then... We can understand, relate to Vicki Carson's strange adventure. Our mystery drama, The Garden, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Jennifer Harmon and Jack Grimes. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Say, do you know what happens this time of year? The swallows come back to Capistrano. Nope. The buzzards come back to Hinkley Ridge, Ohio? No. Uh, bulldogs all over the world begin to shed? Not even close. Oh. This, my friend, is the time of year when you can get a super little deal on the practical but elegant Buick Apollo. And just between you and me, it may very well be the best chance you'll ever have to buy a Buick. I could have sworn this was buzzard day in Hinkley. Hey, ma'am, what's for dinner? Hey, ma'am, what you got? 
What's for dinner? Your ShopRite supermarket suggests choice beef first cut chuck steaks, just 59 cents pound this week. Save two on smoked hams. Shank portion, 69 cents pound. Butt portion, 79 cents pound. For a quick meal, try Swanson's Frozen Hungry Man Dinners, just 99 cents each. For dessert, ShopRite's produce department is featuring fresh honeydew melons, 79 cents each. They're great, topped with ice cream. There's a lot more for a little less at your ShopRite. Stop in soon at ShopRite. She loves the family. She wants the best. She does all that she can do. She lets ShopRite do the rest. Hey, Ma, what's for dinner? ShopRite has the answer. Well, good evening, uh, Mystery Theater fans. This is uh, Gene Shepard, and we're sitting here having a very friendly roundtable discussion with many of our listeners who gather nightly here at uh, the 710 spot on the dial. And if you'd like to join our little evening gatherings, I'm on every night at, uh, let's see, it's 9.15 now. 9.15. You write that down and make sure that uh, you bring all the things you need to be prepared for a fantastic evening. I'm on every night from 9.15 until 10. Join our little group some night. We sit around and discuss the world and enjoy life and and uh, walk around in the weeds and uh, just be people. 9.15 on WOR. I think I may say without fear of denial that man has thought more about life and death, particularly death, than about any other subject in the world. Some say that death is the end of us. Others said it is a rebirth. Others, well, no matter, for no one really knows. Or perhaps they do. Perhaps at least two people know. Vicki Carson and Jack Gibbons, who... But uh, enough. Let them, not I, tell their story. Oh, where am I? How did I get into this terrible place? This, this forest, this, this jungle. Help me. Please, someone help me. Hello? 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 Who are you? Where are you? There's such a fog, I can't see. Keep calling. Keep saying something, anything, so I can follow the direction of your voice. Oh, yes, yes, sir. Well, say something. I don't know what to say. Anything. Say it. Oh, damn, I'm caught again, these blasted thorns. You, you hear me? Say something, anything. A, a, a poem, a prayer. A prayer. Oh, all right. I, I don't know any prayers. Wait, I know. Uh, now is the time for all good men uh, to come to the aid of their country. Okay. Okay, keep saying it. Yeah. Now is the time for all good men to come to the aid of their country. Now is the time for all good men to come okay, to the okay. aid of their... Okay, that's enough. I, I've raised you. Oh, you poor man. Uh, You're all scratched. You're bleeding. Uh, You're covered with mud. Uh, you'd be too if you'd... Been trying for I don't know how long to fight your way out of this jungle. Oh. Uh, who are you? Vicky Carson. Jack Gibbons. What was that crazy stuff you were giving out with? Crazy stuff? Uh, now is the time for all good men to something or other. Oh, oh, that. Uh, it's an exercise they give you in typing school. I, I guess I did it so many times I'll never forget it. Oh, you go to a typing school? Well, I did before I became a secretary. I was a secretary, you see, and... Well, that's funny. Well, what? I said I was a secretary. I spoke of myself in the past tense as if... as if I was dead or... or like that. Well, you're anything but dead, you ask me. Now, nobody as beautiful as you could be dead. Oh, well, thank you. Where are we? What is this place? Well, you got me. You don't know? No. All I know is I'm here, so... Somehow, and it... Oh, this place, it scares me. I'll tell you the truth, me too. The, the trees... I, I don't know, maybe it's the heavy gray fog, but, but the trees all look... deformed. Evil. Kind of evil. Yeah. And the plants, the flowers... 
I, I don't know. There's something about them. You, you, hey, we can't just stand here. Never get out. We'll do that. Come on. Where to? Yeah, I don't know. We'll just keep walking till we get somewhere. Well, all right. Whatever you say. Well, all right. Come on. I, I can't move. I caught on something. My ankle. I, something's around my ankle. Well, here, let me see what... Hey! Something wrapped around my neck all of a sudden. Fine. Vines hanging from the tree. Jack, I think they're alive. Damned if they don't seem to be. But, buddy, now the vines are, vines are wrapping themselves around my... I'm strangling. <coughs> Crushing me. Crushing. Jack, help me. I can't help myself. You need help. The fire hose. Uh, 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 a man. Good Lord, it's like a giant. He... I said, you need help. Yes, yes, help. Well, help us. It'll cost you. Cost us? I help you, you gotta pay. Pay? I got something you need. You want it, you pay for it. Oh, anything, anything. Now remember that. Now stand still, the two of you, while I rip these vines away. There. Uh, uh, there. Uh, there. Uh, You're free. Uh, oh, oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Uh, who are you? You can call me Mordred. Well, what is this place, this awful jungle? It's not a jungle. It's a garden. A garden? I know. Looks more like a jungle. Well, that's what happens to gardens when nobody cares. See you. No, no, wait. Don't leave us alone. Don't worry. I'll be around again to collect. Collect? What you owe me. You said if I helped you, you'd pay anything. You will. Jack. Uh, oh, Jack, can't we rest a little? No, Vicky, we got to keep moving. Got to find a way out. If only that man, that, that ugly giant of a man, hadn't left us. Oh, I'm glad he did. The guy frightened me. Come on now, don't lose your nerve. After all, you're not alone anymore. I'm here. Oh, and I'm grateful for that. Believe me, I... Jack, listen. Yeah. Yeah, I hear it, too. Sounds. Whatever it is, it sounds... lovely and charming. Come on. Come on, let's see if we can locate it. Oh, Jack, not so fast. Slow down. Yeah. It's hard to breathe. It's bad air. Oh, thorns are catching my dress. The vines are tangling my feet. Okay, okay, we'll take it slow. He's easier. Is that better? Oh, much, thanks. Aim to please. I can't get a pulse, doctor. Jack, listen. Doctor, I tell you, I get no pulse at all. Did you hear that? The music? No, a voice. A, a voice that said something about... Oh, something about... Jack, I remember... I remember. Hey, 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 cool it. You, you remember what? Something. Something about a, a, an operation. A, a serious operation. Whose? I think mine. Yeah? Well, let, let, let's keep moving. We'll, we'll never get to wear that music. Now what? I, I'm sorry, but my feet are... Stepping in it. Oh, it's like mud. Hey, hey too. Now, what in the... Mud? It, more like glue. Oh, oh, quicksand. Quicksand? It is. It is. I'm, I'm sinking. Oh, it's deeper and deeper. I'm sinking. What do uh, we do? What, what do we do? Don't do anything. Oh, Jack. Huh? There. A woman. Just still a moment. Don't move. Vicky, she, she's the most beautiful. Now, come toward me. We can't move. Yes, you can. Move slowly. There's no hurry. I can move. So can I. But this, it's amazing. And don't talk. Save your energy. You haven't much left. Oh, that's it. That's right. Oh. And here you are, safe and sound. Oh, I don't know how you did it, but... Oh, thank you. Not at all, Vicky. Not at all. For a moment there, I thought... You know my name? You're surprised. Well, yes, after all, we've never met. Oh, but we have several times. Well, I, I don't remember ever. <laughs> Perhaps you don't recognize me. Who are you? 
What's your name? Whatever you please. Whatever. What is your favorite name? What name do you like most in the whole world? Oh, you wouldn't believe it. Tell me. Well, I don't know why. I, I can't even remember where I heard it or saw it. In a book, maybe, but... Well, anyhow, it's it's Drusilla. Drusilla? Oh, a beautiful name. Not as beautiful as you. I'm sorry. Excuse me, I, I shouldn't have. I mean... Well, you are beautiful, and I had to say it. Thank you. And now then, come with me, please. Oh, well, where? If you look over there, you'll see a wall and a gate in the wall. Follow me. The music seems to be coming from the other side of the wall. Yes. And hey, it, everything's kind of changing. The, the air smells good. Yes. Oh, I, I smell flowers. I mean, flowers that smell the way flowers ought to. Birds. I haven't heard birds singing since... Since when, Jack? I... I don't know. I, I, I can't remember. No matter. Here we are. Oh, Jack, look. Beyond the gate. Oh, Drusilla, that... That's the most lovely... Jack, look. Look, Jack. Flowers everywhere. Oh, and fountains, too. And, and, and birds. And... Oh, that heavenly music. Out of sight. Plain out of sight. Yes, thank you. But the garden really isn't mine. I merely take care of it. See that everything is properly cared for. Well, now shall we go in? Well, just lead the way. Vicky? I don't know, but I, I thought you were delighted with what you see. Oh, that's it. I'm afraid even a short visit here, I couldn't bear to go back there. But, child, it needn't be a short visit. In fact, it needn't be a visit at all. Are you saying we can stay? Forever. Oh, no. Mordred. You're not as clever as you think you are, sweetheart. These two belong to me. Oh, no. Oh, no. yes. You seem to forgot that you owe me and haven't paid. Mordred, Mordred, let them go. Not me, sweetheart. Not till they've paid in full. <laughs> How strange the tricks the human mind can play. Is it some sort of dream Vicky and Jack are going through? A vast gulf, a bottomless abyss, lies between the conscious and the subconscious. We'll perhaps learn precisely in which of these realms Vicky and Jack are having their strange experience when I return shortly with Act Two. The Bush, St. Louis. Suburban Savings in northern New Jersey would like to set you straight on savings. Straight off, Suburban offers you the highest interest allowed by law. A big 7.90% effective annual yield on Suburban 7.50% savings certificates. And Suburban guarantees it from 4 to 10 years. Minimum $2,500. Federal regulations allow premature withdrawals on savings certificates, provided prescribed federal penalties are adhered to. Of course, Suburban also has a whole selection of other savings plans that keep your savings headed in the right direction, straight up. Why not head straight over to your nearest Suburban Savings Office, conveniently located in Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, Sparta, and Wayne, and let them set you straight on savings. Tune in for a new feature show on radio, In Conversation, 
It's a lively half hour of intelligent and entertaining discussion between bright, inquisitive personalities and very well-informed guests. We'll be offering conversation on politics, theater, the media, sports, music, books, the press, filmmaking, and humor. Our hosts change almost every night, and this week you'll be hearing Nat Hentoff, author, journalist, and social critic, actress Celeste Holm, Arthur Knight, film critic, and tonight, Brendan Gill, author and drama critic for The New Yorker magazine. That's In Conversation, tonight and every weeknight. That's two, nine to ten, here at seven ten. Vicki Carson, wandering about in a strange and evil garden, unable to say how she got there, meets Jack Gibbons, and they in turn. Meet a giant of a man, Mordred, as vile and ugly as the garden itself. Later, to their relief and delight, they meet a lovely woman named Drusilla, who invites them into another garden, a garden of such beauty that they beg to stay in it. They owe me, these two. They're going back with me till they've paid in full. Oh, no, 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 not back there. Not to that awful place. Mordred, please let them stay with me. You know better than to ask that. Please, Priscilla, please save us from going back. My dear Vicky, I cannot. But you must. I can't bear it to go back to that horrible place. Child, child, you must. You see, the garden of death is... So that's what it is. The garden of death. And he, Mordred, is death. He is death. Vicky, child, listen to me. Enough him. talk. Come on, let's go. Wait, wait. What are you going to do with them? Two of them. How do you intend to make them pay? I don't see it's any business of yours, but <laughs> since you ask, I need someone to do the heavy work. Another slave? If that's what you want to call it, I can use him on the treadmill. He'll be able to ease my burden in many ways. As for her, <laughs> I can use her to make life more pleasurable in quite another way. Priscilla, no. Please, please don't let him take me back to the Garden of Death. I can do nothing to prevent it. Jack! Jack, save me! Protect me! Vicky, if I could. But I'm no match for Mordred. He, he could break me in two. Funny you should put it that way, Mr. Gibbons. That's exactly what I intend to do. Oh. Oh. Jack. Oh, if you'd only let me massage your back, your shoulders. No, don't touch them, please. I, I'm in such agony, I couldn't stand it, not even to be touched. Oh, it's horrible. Horrible. Horrible isn't the word for what he's doing to me. There is no word. I'm on that treadmill 12 hours a day. 12 hours. Horrible. For me, too. You? Well, oh, you got to be kidding. Look at you. Dressed like a queen. Your hair, your skin, your nails... Nobody was ever kept better than you. Kept? Yes. Like a prize animal. And me like a dog. What he's doing to me, words can't describe. Broken back, I'm afraid. Broken back. Oh, uh, car accident. I'm remembering. Car accident? What car accident? I don't exactly remember, but... Don't remember... Was, was I drunk? Jack. Yes, I... I think I was drunk and out of control. Car, out of control. Lumbar vertebrae. Third, fourth, fifth. Smash. That voice. That voice. What voice? I don't hear any. I do. I... I don't. Not now, but I thought... The way I did? The way I thought I heard someone saying they, they couldn't get a pulse? Yeah, I, I guess. Oh, Lord, what's happening to us? I think... You know what? I think either we're dead or dying. That's what I've been thinking. What makes you think it? She told us, Drusilla, that, that we're in... She called it the Garden of Death. Yeah, that's for sure. But every now and then we hear 
Those voices. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can't be sure, but I get the feeling I... I was killed in an automobile accident. Only maybe I'm not dead yet, like like I could be on an operating table in some hospital, sort of be, between there and, and here. Exactly. Exactly. And I, I had, or could be having, like this minute having, an, an operation. A serious operation, and, and I'm halfway on the borderline of, of dying or living. Oh, God, let me live. Let me live. Don't let me... Please, please don't let me stay here. Oh, come on, pull yourself together. Uh, I can't. can't bear being dead. What can you do about it? What can I do about it? Nothing. No, there is something. I've been thinking about it. I'm going to find my way back to the Garden of Life. Garden of Life? Drusilla's. I'm going to get back there somehow. How? I don't know. I don't know yet, but I will. I'm not ready to die. Not yet. I'm, I'm going to live, Jack. You'll see. I'm going to live. Jack? Jack, wake up. Uh, what is... What? Shh. Huh? Don't wake Mordred. Huh? And don't talk. Listen. Jack, I found a path to the Garden of Life. You found... Come with me. Come. Crazy. Plain crazy wandering around in the moonlight like this. I'll find the path. It's here somewhere. Uh, you seem awfully sure. I am. Every chance I got this week, day and night, I came out here and searched. Searched, and I found this path. How do you know it leads to the Garden of Life? It must. It goes straight in that direction. I followed it as far as a clearing, but, but had to turn back before I could... Jack! <laughs> yeah, you were right. Let's, let's not waste time. Come on. Where is it? You said the clearing. Not far now, not far. I hope. What have we got ourselves into? What have you got me into? This jungle, it's alive with God knows what. Oh, will you stop your moaning and groaning? If we can reach Drusilla's garden. Yes. There it is, the clearing. Where? Where? I, I don't see it. It's straight ahead. That big patch of moonlight. That's it. Come on now. What's that? If he lives, he'll never walk again. What's what? That voice. Didn't you hear that voice? No, Jack. Ah, uh, Jack! My back. My back. The pain. I. The pain. I, I can't move. I Jack. can't move. Oh, Jack. Uh, oh, you must be in terrible pain. Uh, uh, You've got to get to that clearing. Uh, You've got to do something. Oh. Drag him. Uh, See if I can drag him. Uh, uh, Jack. Uh, oh, made it. Jack. Jack. What? What? We'll rest a while. Here in the middle of the clearing. Uh, It'll do you good. Regain some strength. Yeah. Yeah. How is the pain? It's not... Not bad now. I can bear it if it doesn't get worse. Good Lord, what, what was that? I don't know. Shadows and... In, in the trees, flitting in the trees. Huge shadows. Birds. Big birds. Monstrous. Jack, I'm scared. Oh, oh they're coming out of the tree. Come and help me. I've never seen such birds. Birds. They're going to kill us. That's what they're going to do. Kill us. Oh, oh no. They're coming for us. They're clawing at us. They're being still terrorists. Just spread. Leave them alone. I command you, leave them alone. Trusilla. Go. Trusilla. It's Trusilla. Oh, thank God. Oh. Are you all right? Oh, yes. Thanks to you, yes. What are you doing here? How did you find this place? I found a path. We, we followed it. What is this place? It has no name. It's just an area of space between the two gardens. Mordred's and mine. Neutral ground. What are you doing here? Well, she wanted to get to your garden. Well, so did you. Don't blame everything on me. Blame? There's no blame in wanting to be in my garden. Only a fool would want to remain in Mordred's. Oh, you think so, do you? Mordred. Priscilla, don't let him take us back. Please don't. Softly, child. Softly. 
I'll do what I can. Which is nothing at all. They're mine, these two, and they will remain mine. Get up, you. On your feet. I can't. I'm... I'm in terrible pain, awful pain. I don't give a damn how much pain you're in. On your feet. Oh, must you kick him? None of your business what I do to him. I can make it my business. You know that. I've done it more than once when your brutality has become too much for oh, me. Oh, shut up. Go back to where you belong. Now, I'm telling you for the last time, get on your feet. All right. Oh, oh, all right. And you, sweetheart, get going. No, I... I can't go back. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, please, please. Mordred, enough. Let her be, or I warn you, I'll take this matter to the master. What's good that'll do you? There's one way to find out. Hold it. Hold it just a minute. Yes? Now, there's no sense bothering him with I this. I think there is. You've gone too far again. I don't know about that. I do. What's more, these two, Vicky and Jack, are on neutral ground between your garden but and mine. But they life. belong to me. To you, to you, always to you. Will you never learn I have as much right as you? Can't you get it through your stupid, greedy head that's pointless to argue like this, wrangle like this? It always ends the same way. If you mean compromise... What else would I mean? Mm, you take one, I take one. Yes. Uh, I don't know. I can get a lot more work out of him. He's in frightful pain. His back, he can't work in such pain. Drusilla, don't let him take me back. Mm. I'll take her... You keep him. No! Shh, quiet. I want to think about this for a moment, Mordred. Nothing to think about. I've decided. It's my decision, not yours. You had first choice last time. <laughs> you can't blame a guy for trying, huh? Okay. Which one do you want? Which one? That's the question. Which? <laughs> As Drusilla ponders her decision, Vicky and Jack watch her with eyes that hold indescribable yearning. For one, it will mean life. For the other, death. Which, then, will be the lucky one? The one Drusilla will choose to return with her to her garden. We'll know the answer when I return shortly for Act Three. Excuse me, sir, but do you know what happens this time of year? Right on, pal. I happen to know that right about now, a freak blizzard falls on Dumont, New Jersey. <laughs> and they're snowed in for the rest of the summer. Uh, happens every uh, year. No, 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 nope. Uh, you see, what happens this time of year is that you can get a particularly good deal on what is perhaps the most luxurious midsize car on the market. The midsize Buick Century Regal. Well, what good's a car when you're hopelessly snowed in? Uh, well, that's a point. And now, with another story of mystery and intrigue, here is Commander Neville Putney to keep you in... Anxiety. And what's this story about, Commander? Well, it concerns a middle-aged business executive named Fremont Witherton, who, after spending his entire career with the same firm, returned home one evening with his dreams suddenly shattered. Is that you, Fremont? It's me, Erica. Fremont, you look so peaked. Erica, I've been fired. That new plant manager, he's been trying to cut me out, and today he succeeded. Well, you don't need to give me that hangdog look. Just go out and get another job. I'm through, Erica. I'm 58 years old. Nobody will hire me for half the salary I've been making. My only hope is to kill the plant manager. Fremont, I hate rough stuff, but if you've decided, your Ross goes upstairs in the trunk. You load it, and I'll warm up the getaway car. <laughs> Hey, young man, how about that for a story? Well, that was a dilly, Commander, but you just can't leave us this way. How did it all come out? Time's up for now, but tune in Bob and Ray on WOR 315 to 7, and maybe you'll find out. There is no mystery about the morning when you come rambling with gambling. Good evening, evening mystery fans. Uh, this is John Gambling, and every morning, Monday through Saturday, here at WOR from 5 a.m. till 10, we get the crew together to try to uh, put the morning together for you, to tell you what the weather's going to be like, whether there's heavy traffic coming into the city, whether the subways and the commuter trains are running. Bob Harris is in WOR's weather center every morning with all that very complicated equipment that he has to help prognosticate the day's weather. Uh, we cover sports completely with Don Crickey. In the news department, Peter Roberts, Henry Gladstone, and Harry Hennessy. And up in the helicopter, George Meade or Fred Feldman, keeping an eye on the traffic scene. So all together, we do try to take any mystery out of the morning. And just to brighten up the beginning of your day a little bit, I think we have some kind of nice, listenable, and tuneful music. So tune in tomorrow morning or any morning for Rambling with Gambling. Now, back to the mystery. Why 
is life so full of troublesome decisions? Maybe life would be easier, pleasanter if there were no options, no choices. Maybe not. Can't say. And frankly, I can't say whether the strange and beautiful Drusilla will choose Vicky or Jack to take back to her enchanting and enchanted garden. Let's find out, shall we? Take me. Oh, please take me. No, no, me. Listen, Drusilla, I'll be a lot more used to you. I'll, I'll get over this bad problem. You'll see, and I'll work for you. Work even harder, longer than for Mordred. Don't listen to him. He's a liar and a cheat. Cheat? He's trying to cheat me out of what's rightfully mine. Who found this path? I did. So you found the path. So what? So I deserve to go with Drusilla. I was the one who wanted to live. Don't listen to her. I'll take neither of you. What? what? Neither? I'm sorry. Truly sorry. When we met before, I felt each of you close to being worthy of joining me in my garden. But now... No, I... I want neither of you now. But why not? Why not? You've changed, the two of you. There's hate in you now. Jealousy, greed. You're not worthy anymore. Mordred? Yes? Take them. Both of them. Back with you. <laughs> you hear me? I know you do. What do you want? Stop that thing a minute. I can't. It's a treadmill. You get on a treadmill, you stay on it. For some reason. Well, can you hear me? Listen. Priscilla was right. We've become greedy, selfish, full of hate. When it comes to hate, believe me, I am full of it. That's what I want to talk to you about. I've found a way to get back to the Garden of Life. Oh, not again. Yes, again, and this time we'll make it. It's simple. All we have to do is get the greed and hate out of our systems. Get to be more like we were when Drusilla first met us. Hey, you know, maybe you have got an idea at that. Of course I have. There's just one problem. What? How do we do it? How do we get rid of hate, for instance? Like... I hate you for getting me into the mess I'm in. I got yes, you. It. And more than that, you were willing to sacrifice me to Mordred so that you could be with Priscilla in the Garden of Life. I hate you for that. I mean, I really hate you. How do I stop? You can't stop. Mordred. Fools. The two of you, you can't stop hate. It's too strong to be stopped, too powerful. The most potent force in the human race. And who told you to take a rest? Give it now! Uh, here's another across your back so you don't forget. No. You. Yes, Mordred. Come to me in an hour. Yes, Mordred. I could only stand up to him. I didn't have his back. I had more strength. God, how I hate him. I do, too. And I must stop it. He can't stop it. Give him his due. He's right about that. There's nothing more powerful than hate. I wonder if there isn't. Uh, you just go right on wondering. But do it somewhere else. I hate the sight of you. Hello? Drusilla, can you hear me? It's Vicky. I'm at the garden gate. Drusilla? What is it, Vicky? Oh, I didn't know you were standing there. I wasn't until now. May I come in? Please, just for a moment. I'm sorry, no. You must stay on that side of the gate. I think she's gone, Doctor. No pulse at all. Well, perhaps for a moment. Did you hear that voice? Yes. What did it say? Well, you heard it. I keep hearing it. Now and then, I, but I can't remember a second later what it said. What is it you want, Vicky? I, I've come to tell you I don't hate anymore. Oh? I hated Jack and, and Mordred, but not anymore. So may I stay? Why do you look so sad? Because I am. When people lie to me, it makes me sad. But I'm not. 
All right, I lied. But only because I can't stand it anymore. I've got to come here. I'm, I'm just dying to be with you. Yes, I know. But I can't have you in my garden until you've put hate out of your heart. I can't. I, I've tried. I, I keep trying, but I can't do it. Not alone, no. But I am alone. No one in your world is alone. They just forget who's with them. Always. Who? God. God? <laughs> You've heard of him, I think. Well, yes, but... But what, child? How do you get in touch with him? Easily. Just think of someone else for a change. Do something for someone else. I, I don't understand how. Well, there's nothing to understand. Just do it. Massaging the heart is doing it, Doctor. I'm getting a pulse again. You must go now. That voice. I heard it again. So, so did I. Go now. Quickly. But I don't want to go. Oh, I can't go not back to Mordred and, and Jack and, and all the awful things back there. Drusilla? Gone. Oh, why couldn't you let me stay? Why? Why? <laughs> gun? Jack, that's a gun. Yeah. Where did you get it? There's plenty around. No sweat. What are you going to do with it? What I should have done long before now, and you're going to help me. Help you? Help you do what? Kill the dirty, rotten swine. Kill? Mort? I don't know why I never thought of it before. I guess he had me so scared the thought never crossed my mind. But it has now. It's the one way, the only way of getting free of him. And you want me to help you? Well, you will, won't you? Jack, that's murder. I'd call it justice. It's murder. It's killing someone. It's taking a life. You can't do that. Oh, yes, I can. Jack, listen to me. You want to be with Priscilla to live in the garden of life as much as I do. And to murder someone, there can't be anything worse than that. A hate worse than that. Murder Mordred and... And you'd be barred from the garden of life forever. All I want is to be free of Mordred. And I'm going to be whether you help me or not. Now, will you or won't you? I... Oh, Jack, I... Now, you listen to me. You've got no more chance than I have of living in Drusilla's garden. You've got as much hate in you as I have in me. So much that neither of us can ever get rid of it. Well, we can at least get rid of Mordred. Be free of him forever. After that... Well, life here won't exactly be a picnic. But it'll be a hell of a lot easier and happier. I'll play it smart, Vicky. Help me. Vicky. All right. What do you want me to do? Level with me, baby. What are you up to? Up to? Why, nothing, Mordred. Uh, for the last two or three days, you've been all sugar and spice. <laughs> a big change from the hellcat you were. Oh, you said you'd tame me, darling, and I guess you have. <laughs> I could use something to kind of pick me up. Uh, like what? A drink. A drink? You don't drink? Well, there's always a first time. Well, what do you know? You are changing. <laughs> well, sure, sure. What'll it be? Champagne. <laughs> right on. <laughs> now, let's see. Yeah, here we are. But, uh, sweetie, it'll take a while to chill. Well, can't we drink it warm? Warm champagne? <laughs> Well, why not? <laughs> Never had it that way, but like you said, there's always a first time. <laughs> hey! Oh, hey, now I know why they chill it. Warm champagne goes all over... Hey, quick, get in the glass. It's all over the place. Here you are. Yeah, there. Now, what do we drink to? Us. Yeah, sure. To us. Here, bottoms up. Bottoms up. Oh. Mmm, not bad. Warm champagne's not bad after all, huh? Again? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mordred! Uh, What's happened? Uh, I know, all of a sudden I feel weak and dizzy. Hey, what, what, what have you done to me? The glass. You put something in my glass. The room's going around. I feel sick. Sick, sick. You won't be feeling sick long, Mordred. Gibbons. Gibbons, what is this? That gun. The gun. You're going to kill me. Oh, you figured that out all by yourself? That's yeah. real smart of you. Oh, played me for a sucker, didn't you, doll? Silly old 
Sweetness and light, and I fell for it. Mordred, I, uh, I'm sorry. I... What are you sorry about? Uh, Got this rotten pig right where we want him now. No. Uh, no, don't, Jack, don't. Vicky, you're a fool. He gets it, and he gets it now. No! Vicky. Oh. oh, my God. Oh. It's all right. Oh, it's better this way. Better? Oh. Oh. I shot you. you. You threw yourself in front of him. Yes. Why? Why did you want to save him? Not him. You. From murder. From a sin of hatred you might never be forgiven. Uh, I, I don't get it. She, she said, Drusilla, if you want to rid yourself of hate and be with me, think of someone else for a change. <laughs> Do something for someone else. Vicky. Vicky! Drusilla? Come, Vicky. Come now, child. She's gone, Doctor. No question now. Come, my dear. Come. Yes. Yes, oh, oh yes, I'm coming, Drusilla. I'm coming. There now, there, there. Hush. Rest a bit, rest. Don't even try to move. Just rest here in my arms for a little while. I'm here, in your garden at last. Yes? I did something for someone else. I lost the hatred that was in me. Sorry, Doctor. Her heart just couldn't take it. Boy, don't worry about it. You've heard it for the last time. Now, would you like to see the garden? But I do see it. Only a part, a small part. Oh, but nothing could be more beautiful than this. The flowers. Oh, I've never seen such gorgeous colors. And the fountains are like... They're like quicksilver shining in the sun. And the birds, they're so beautiful. Oh, nothing could be lovelier than this. You'll see. Come. Vicky. Why do you turn back? Jack. Can't he come too? No, he's not ready, I'm afraid. But he will be one day. He'll join you here. But first, life must teach him all he needs to be taught. Life? Until life teaches him? Child, life on earth is a school. That's all it is. You go to school again and again... Until you learn all you need to know in your heart now to join me here. But you sound as if... as if a person has to die before coming here. True. You are, to use your word, dead. But all this? This unbelievable beauty? This incredible loveliness? This? It must be... It must be... The Garden of Life. No. You were in the Garden of Life. A garden filled with corruption, hatred, greed. Every vile sin a human being can create. But you've at last escaped into my garden. The Garden of Death. Then... Then you must be... Yes. Who else, child... Who else? I've never thought of death as being a beautiful woman, have you? Birth, life, death, only words, really. Symbols we use to express the unfathomable. Who is to say that life is not really death? Or death, life. And birth, a state somewhere in between. Who is to say? Not I, surely. I'll be back shortly. 
There is no mystery about the morning when you come rambling with gambling. Good evening, evening mystery fans. Uh, this is John Gambling, and every morning, Monday through Saturday, here at WOR from 5 a.m. till 10, we get the crew together to try to uh, put the morning together for you, to tell you what the weather's going to be like, whether there's heavy traffic coming into the city, whether the subways and the commuter trains are running. Bob Harris is in WOR's weather center every morning with all that very complicated equipment that he has to help prognosticate the day's weather. Uh, we cover sports completely with Don Crickey. In the news department, Peter Roberts, Henry Gladstone, and Harry Hennessy. And up in the helicopter, George Meade or Fred Feldman, keeping an eye on the traffic scene. So all together, we do try to take any mystery out of the morning. And just to brighten up the beginning of your day a little bit, I think we have some kind of nice, listenable, and tuneful music. So tune in tomorrow morning or any morning for Rambling with Gambling. Now, back to the mystery. Hello. I really don't know that there's much I can say. You heard, and what you heard has surely given rise to thoughts you may not have entertained before. As I said at the outset, there are those who believe that death is not death, but birth. That indeed, what we call life is in itself a death we go through to find the reality of life. I wish I knew for sure. Our cast included Jennifer Harmon, Jack Grimes, Nancy Coleman, and Joe Silver. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time. Suspense. This is the man in black, here again to introduce Columbia's program, Suspense. Our starring Hollywood cast of characters reads as follows for tonight. As Aunt Julie, one of those stark, severe, and terrifying women who is encountered ever so often along the grimmer outposts of the American countryside, Miss Agnes Moorhead. As Carol Linden, the girl who returned to a scene of childhood happiness and found terror living in the house, Miss Ellen Drew. As Paul, Carol's husband, who had his own ideas as to the explanation of these strange events, Mr. Ted Reed. A first radio play by Larry Roman called Uncle Henry's Rosebush is tonight's tale of suspense. If you have been with us before, you will know that suspense is compounded of mystery and suspicion and dangerous adventure. In this series are tales calculated to intrigue, to stir your nerves, to offer you a precarious situation and then withhold the solution until the last possible moment. And so it is with Uncle Henry's Rosebush and the performances of Agnes Moorhead as Aunt Julie, Ellen Drew as Carol and Ted Reed as Paul. We again hope to keep you in suspense. I'll tell you the story exactly as it happened. There's no use pretending. I'll never forget, and I know I'll not awake and find it all a dream. It's real, and for the rest of my life, I shall know it's real. Paul was to have his va first vacation since we were married. I suggested we visit my Aunt Julie and Uncle Henry, who had a small farm upstate. They had always been very kind to me. When I was a child, I used to spend my summer vacations with them. They loved children. I've often wondered why they never had any of their own. Some time ago, I'd lost track of them. They'd never seen Paul, and I was certain they'd like to. Paul said it would be fine. We'll surprise them, I thought. We were the ones who were surprised. Just a few more miles, Paul. I remember this road. We used to hike along it going to the village. Ah, this country air is wonderful. Two weeks of green grass and wicker chairs. 
I can't think of anything better. Oh, you'll love Aunt Julie and Uncle Henry. They live alone, quiet and peaceful. It'd be quite a change from the city. Yeah. Well, they must be happy together. Oh, they are, but they're lonely. Smooth lawns and orchards. And flowers. Uncle Henry planted huge rose bushes around the porch. Every night as I crawled in the bed, he used to bring me a rose. They're his favorite flowers. Ah, uh, vacation, here we come. Come on, car, let's go. Just around the bend. Here we go. There it is. Uh... Carol, look. Why, Paul... Are you sure this is the place? Yes, but all the weeds and the broken shutters. Looks as though it's been neglected for months. I don't understand. Yeah, perhaps it's deserted. Oh, but it can't be. It's their home. Well, come on. Let's go up and see. Uh, the dirt on this porch must be an inch thick. No answer. Nobody here. Look, Paul, over there at the end of the porch. The rose bush. Uncle Henry's rose bush. Why, it's trimmed and neat. It's the only thing that seems to be taken care of. Oh, then somebody must be here. Maybe they can tell us what happened to Aunt Julie and Uncle Henry. Knock again. Mm -hmm. Someone's coming. Well? We're looking for a Mr. and Mrs. Connors. They used to live... Uh, why, Aunt Julie, I didn't recognize you. But it's me, Aunt Julie. It's, it's Carol. I wasn't expecting you. Oh, Paul's vacation. We thought we'd spend it here. Well, you've been asking for us for years. This is Paul, my husband. Oh, Carol's told me so much why about you. Why did you come? What? I said, why did you come? Well, aren't you glad to see us? Aunt Julie, something's happened. Nothing's happened. Oh, but it did. Tell me, Aunt Julie, we'll help. Well, of course we will. You shouldn't have come. Well, Carol, if she doesn't want us, let's go. No, Paul. This isn't like you, Aunt Julie. Something dreadful has happened, I know. Go, it. Carol, please go. Listen, if it's money, Aunt Julie, well, well we haven't got too much, but you're welcome to I it. tell you, nothing's wrong. Oh, but there must be. This house... You're her husband. I'm asking you to take her and go away. Oh. Come on, Carol. We're not wanted. Let's go. We're going to stay. Well, there you are. She's your niece, and you know how stubborn she can be. We're going to stay. Where's Uncle Henry? I say, where's Uncle Henry? He's... He's not here. Oh, but where is he? He's not here. Isn't that enough? Oh, what'll he be back? He won't be. Oh, but Aunt Julie... He won't ever be back! I stood there bewildered. Aunt Julie had run out of the room. Perhaps she was crying. I don't know. I just knew that Uncle Henry was gone. That he had left her. It seemed strangely impossible. They'd always been so happy. So supremely happy that it seemed that the only thing that could separate them on this earth was death. <laughs> and now this. I couldn't believe it. Paul and I walked into the living room. It was almost as dusty as the outside. The curtains were dirty, the floor littered with old newspapers. The entire room showed the same signs of neglect as the outside. And when I recalled how neat Aunt Julie had always been with her housework, oh, a feeling of apprehension crawled up my back. Frankly, I was fright frightfully worried, and, and I could tell by the look on Paul's face that he was worried, too. I don't like it, Paul. There's something strange here. Yeah. I never saw a house in such a mess. It's not just the house. It's more than that. Something much more. I'm sure of it. Well, really, Carol, it's none of our business, don't you? Well, perhaps not, but you don't know Aunt Julie like I do. She'd never ask for help. No matter how much she needed it. I'm just not prying, Paul. It's... I suppose you're right. They've always been so kind to me. I've got to help them. But how can we, Carol? We don't even know what's wrong. They were always so happy together. Somehow, I can't believe they've broken up. Something else has happened. Something terrible. And I'm going to stay until I find out what. <laughs> well, in that case, we'd better find a place to sleep. All the bedrooms are upstairs. Come on. Right. Well, look at the 
the dust on the banister. I bet this place hasn't been cleaned in a month. Paul. Huh? Did you see the way she looks? Yeah. Gee, her face seems completely wrinkled with worry. No wonder I didn't recognize her. She seems much older and, and frightened. Well, do you think she's ill? I don't know. I wish I did. Well, look at that hall. Gloomy and dirty. Uh, where do these doors go to? Well, that one's to Aunt Julie's room, and this one's Uncle Henry's. The one across the way is the spare. I guess that's ours. Well, let's go in. Wow. What a mess. Well, might as well get busy cleaning. Yeah, there's nothing like a good round of house cleaning before supper. Paul, so long as Uncle Henry's not here, maybe we can take his room. It's got an adjoining door to Aunt Julie's, and... Then in case she needs us, we'll be near. Okay. It doesn't matter to me which room we clean. Let's go. Here. It's this one over here. Well, this is... Paul, look. It's it's all clean and neat. Well, I'll be darned. It's the only clean place in the whole house. I don't understand. Every room is inches in dirt, except this one. The outside is completely neglected. Except the rose bush. Uncle Henry's room and Uncle Henry's rose bush. I don't get it. Well, look, uh, on the dresser there. Aunt Julie's picture and a pipe and tobacco. Why, that's Uncle Henry's favorite pipe. <clears throat> Drawers full of shirts, socks, underwear. Cal, if your uncle went away, why did he leave this? I don't know. Strange, but... What's that paper, Paul? Why, it looks like... It is an, an insurance policy for $30,000 payable to your Aunt Julie in case Uncle Henry dies. Carol, what this is... What are you two doing here? Uh, Aunt Julia, I What are you doing, doing here? Well, we thought that What's we that did... in your hand? An insurance... Give it to me. But I... And keep out of this room. Well, we didn't... Don't ever I... I didn't know how to take this. Uncle Henry's pipe and all his clothes were still in his room. And yet, Uncle Henry was gone. And I couldn't understand why Aunt Julie got so angry. I looked to Paul for an explanation I could tell he had something on his mind, but I didn't dare ask him what it was, and he didn't say. After Aunt Julie's outburst, we went back to the spare room and cleaned it. Then we washed and started downstairs for supper. Watch your step, Carol. These aren't the strongest-looking stairs. It'll be all right. Paul, what do you make of Aunt Julie's behavior? Frankly, Carol, I'm worried. I'm frightened. May as well admit it. There's something strange here that frightens me to death. Well, I... I don't think there's anything to be frightened of. It's just that... Oh, there, that's the last step. This way to the kitchen. All right. Oh, as I was saying, I, I don't think there's... Look out, Carol! Ah! Well, that was close. That vase just missed you. A vase? Yes, and it was a heavy one. The one at the top of the stairway. Oh, it would have hit me. Yeah. Oh, Paul, I'm frightened. Look, coming down the stairs. What happened? The vase fell. Just missed Carol. Oh, don't worry about it. I didn't like the vase anyway. The vase? What about Carol? She almost got killed. Never mind, Paul. It was an accident. An accident? We were just going in for supper, Aunt Julie. Care to join us? Well, I... Oh, come on, Aunt Julie. It'll do you good. Oh, all right. Here. You two sit right down. I'll have something prepared in a minute. I'm not very hungry. Oh, nonsense, Aunt Julie. I'll, I'll fix something that'll make your mouth water. <clears throat> you know, when, uh, when Carol and I get through cleaning this place up, it'll look just like new. Yeah? Sure. I, I think when Carol and I have a family, we'll take them to a farm. Really? Yes, yes. You know, this, this place would be swell for children. Oh, uh, what do you mean? Uh, what? <laughs> oh. <laughs> What did I say? What's the matter? Uh, what's the matter with Aunt Julie? Uh, where is she going? I don't know. I, I was just trying to make conversation. Just talked about children on a farm, that's all. Oh, Paul, I'm frightfully worried. Do you think we ought to call a doctor for her? I don't know. We have to do something. She certainly doesn't look too well. But maybe she isn't really sick. What do you mean? Well, maybe if your Uncle Henry did leave her, well, then maybe... You mean, you mean she still loves him? It's possible, but... Oh, but you don't really believe it. Oh, Carol, I don't know what to believe. I just know something's wrong. Uh-huh. I'm not hungry, Paul. 
Me either. Let's go for a walk. Maybe we can figure something out. Yeah, country so peaceful and beautiful in the night. Yes, it is. I wish you could enjoy it. But I can't. Oh, don't try to fool me. Your first vacation in years and you run into this. Well, we have to help her. Of course. But how? Yes, we don't even know what's wrong. She not only won't tell, but we can't get near her long enough to talk to her. Suppose Uncle Henry really did leave her. He may have gone off in a huff. That would account for the clothes being here. Well, perhaps. And, and suppose she still is in love with him. Well, that would account oh, for... Oh, but even if that's so, could that make her feel so badly? Make her act like this? Not, not talking, neglecting everything? Everything except his room and his flowers. I don't know. A woman's love is a strange thing. If you left me, I... Well, I don't know what I'd do. Well, if that is the case, the thing to do is to make her forget. That won't be easy. No, I don't imagine it would be. But suppose... Suppose we take her to the city with us until she forgets. Well, we could ask her at least. Yeah. Yeah, come on. Let's go find her. Hey, watch out. You almost fell. Tripped. I'm all right. Let's... Look, Paul. What? Look what I tripped over. It's a mound of freshly dug earth. Well, what's that for? Paul. Paul, it looks like a, a grave. Oh, don't be silly. Why, it's just a, a... Forget it. Come on, let's find Aunt Julie. Paul, that... Forget it. Say, uh... What's that building over there? That's the barn. There used to be a swell old cow there with a bell around her neck and chickens and ducks and all sorts of pets. Yeah, this must have been a happy place. It was, but now... Paul, standing by the barn, it's Aunt Julie. Come on, let's ask her now. Aunt Julie! What you doing? Following me? How could you? Well, it was a nuisance. Oh, Aunt Julie. Oh, a cat with its neck wrung. This was the first indication of Aunt Julie's ruthlessness. It seemed so unlike the Aunt Julie that I knew. She was always kind. But there was no mistaking the anger in her eyes as she stood there in the dim moonlight, the strangled cat in her hands. She killed it, she said, because it was a nuisance. If she could do that, what else was she capable of doing? Paul and I went into the house. We went upstairs and put the finishing touches in our room and went to bed. I couldn't sleep. And as I watched the moon make its slow, solitary way across the heaven, I kept thinking, Paul and I are also a nuisance. Paul and I are also a nuisance. Toward midnight, I became drowsy and was just beginning to fall off to sleep when I, I heard footsteps in the hall. Uh, what? What? Paul. Paul, wake up. Uh, oh, what is that? Shh. I hear footsteps in the hall. Footsteps? Well, I don't hear anything. There. Hear it? Yeah. Must be Aunt Julie. Well, what, what, what would she be doing up this time of night? I don't know, but who else could it be? Well, I'll go see. Well, I'm coming with you. Now, quiet. Don't put on the light. I can't see. Oh, yes. Now I can. It is Aunt Julie. She's walking down the hall. I think she's coming this way. Quiet. Shh. I think she's... What's she got in her hand? Looks like a scissors. Scissors? Yes. What would she be doing with... Carol, she's coming this way. <gasps> Get back in bed, quick. What? Get in bed. All right, now, quiet. She went out. What? Yeah. She just looked in and left. Do you think she knew we were awake? I don't see how. Let's follow her. All right. Where's my other slipper? Ah, there. All right, come on. She's going downstairs. Come on, and be quiet. I think she's going outside. Let's 
go. Not so fast. Give her a chance to get out. There, she's out. Come on. Look, Pa. She's cutting a bunch of roses off the bush. She's taking them around to the back of the house. Come on. Here. Now get down behind this bush. <gasps> Look! Pa! She's going over to that... that mound and placing the roses on it. But Paul... Shh. But Paul, it... it looks like... A... Quiet, Carol. She's kneeling beside it. Now she's getting up. Coming back. Get down. She's gone. Paul, do you know what that is? I got a pretty good idea. Uncle Harry's roses with Uncle Harry's grave. I said it. I said it without thinking. Of course, we had no way of knowing Uncle Henry was dead. We had no way of knowing that that was Uncle Henry's grave or that it was a grave at all. But at that moment, stooping behind the bush in the blackness of the country, we felt it, not knowing why. Paul and I went back to our room as quickly and as silently as possible. Needless to say, we didn't sleep anymore. We just kept looking at each other, asking ourselves questions, trying to analyze our feelings. Soon we could see the streaks of dawn coming up over the treetops. And we slept the early morning hours trying to... We were trying to convince each other that our thoughts were ridiculous. Frankly, I don't think we succeeded. Finally, we decided not to mention it. To go on with the cleaning the next day as we'd planned, to make believe nothing had happened until we had proof. That day we spent cleaning, and all day Aunt Julie was nowhere to be seen. Yet I had a strange feeling that something, someone was watching our every move. Toward evening, Paul and I sat down for a bite to eat. More coffee? Oh, thanks. I wonder where Aunt Julie is. I don't know, Carol. That's a strange aunt you've got. Yes. Oh, look. The window. What is it? Oh, oh I, I saw someone looking in. What? There's no one there now. But I, I'm sure I saw... Probably just a shadow. Yes. Probably just a shadow. You're on edge, Carol. I'll be all right. Finish your coffee. I'll start cleaning the bathroom. We'll both work on the kitchen. And I'll take care of the downstairs. All right. Paul, you look worried. You know, this this whole crazy business. Let's not talk about it. But putting it. roses on a... I'm sorry, Carol. It's you I'm really worried about. If, if something should happen to you, I'll never forgive myself. Well, nothing will happen. Now finish your coffee. I'll start cleaning the bathroom. Okay, Carol. I won't be long. Mm-hmm. Well, this isn't too bad. There's the sink. Some hot water. There, that's it. A wash rag around the sink bowl. Oh! Oh! My dear, just the wind. Guess I'm getting jumpy. Mm-hmm. This place won't be half bad when it's clean. Oh, the medicine chest. Clean the mirror and the shelves. Oh. What? Uh, Paul? Paul? What is it, Carol? Come here. What is it, Carol? What's the matter? Look. Here in the medicine chest. Where? What's a hypodermic needle? What would a hypodermic needle be doing here? Well, it's not likely to be here for nothing. Look, alongside of it. A bottle of... What's it say? I... I can't read it. It's awful-looking stuff. Open the bottle. All right. That cork's in tight. There, there. Oh, nauseating. <laughs> Stuff like that would kill a person. Paul, it's not a joke. I'm sorry, Carol. Do you really think Aunt Julie... I don't know. Oh, it can't be, Paul. It can't be. Maybe not, but we better find out. And quickly, Carol, there's one more thing to do. I'm going to see if that's really Uncle Henry's grave. I'm going to dig it up. Oh, Paul, you can't. Don't you see? I have to. If it is, we're in danger. Oh, of course. I'm still not sure that falling vase was an accident. 
We have to find out about this business once and for all. Well, I'm coming with you. We walked out toward the back of the house. And through my mind flashed the succession of events. The neglected house, Aunt Julie's insistence that we leave, the roses, the grave, the insurance policy, and now the hypodermic needle and that infernal oil. All the evidence pointed to but one conclusion. I couldn't believe it, and yet, there it was, motive and method. And now we were going outside to dig up the last remaining evidence. Well, this is it, Cal. Sure you want to watch? I won't stay in this house alone. Look at the beautiful roses around it. Hurry up, Paul. Let's get it over with. Okay. Here goes. I never thought I'd turn into a grave digger. This dirt isn't packed tight. Easy to dig. It's getting dark. Yeah. Oh, I think I'll run in and get a lantern. I'll be right back, Carol. All right. Every one of those lengthening shadows looked like a ghost. It gets dark quickly in the country. I was afraid, but I knew Paul would be back in a minute. I picked up the shovel and began to dig. Ah, oh, there. That's better. I'm not so nervous. I'm working. Is that you behind me, Paul? Bring the lantern closer. Gee, it's so dark. Paul. Paul, I... Ah! Look at Henry! What are you doing? What are you doing? Ah! What are you doing to my grave? Put it back. Put it back. Oh, my flowers, my beautiful flowers, my lovely roses. You've hurt them. You've hurt my roses, and I won't let you. I won't. I won't. Keep away. Keep away, Uncle Henry. I won't let you hurt my roses. My sweet, delicate roses. Take your hands away. Take them. You broke them. You killed them. Stop it. Stop it, Henry. I'm going to kill her just as she did my roses. Stop it. Take your hands away. Kill her. Henry. 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 Oh. Oh, forgive me, Henry. I didn't mean... Are you all right, Carol? Yes. Oh, yes, I think so. What happened? What? Oh. Uncle Henry? Aunt Julie saved my life, Paul. And we thought she... Oh, can you ever forgive us, Aunt Julie? You didn't know. Then you he didn't wasn't know. was dead at all? No. No, he wasn't. Oh, I don't understand. He was living in his room all the time, Carol. I was taking care of him. When you two insisted on staying here, I, I kept him out of sight. Oh, I, I, I didn't want to kill him, and I had to. He would have killed Carol. Aunt Julie. Oh, if you only had left when I asked you to. But perhaps it's better this way. He never got that violent before. I could always take care of him. The hypodermic needle and the sedative calmed him when he got a little wild, but then, then when I saw him strangle the cat, I knew he was getting completely out of hand. Yes, it's, it's better this way. He's better off dead. <laughs> Poor Uncle Henry. The grave and the roses were a whim of his. <laughs> a whim. <laughs> and look, he fell right in his own grave. And so closes the story, Uncle Henry's Rosebush, starring Agnes Moorhead, Ellen Drew, and Ted Reed. Tonight's tale of suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us again next week, same time, when we will present another flowery bouquet of suspicion and terror and a homicidal maniac at large. Only this time... The roses will be white. The story will be The White Rose Murders by Cornell Woolrich. The tale of a killer who trademarked his crimes by leaving a white rose on the victim. Our star will be Maureen O'Hara. The producer of these broadcasts is William Spear with Ted Bliss, the director, Bernard Herman and Lucian Mahowick, conductor and composer, and Larry Roman, the author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense.
This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Once again, it's my pleasure to tantalize you with a mystery... And not a who-done-it, but a, so to speak, why-done-it. Frankly, I much prefer the why to the who-done-its, because they're just so darn difficult to solve, if you manage to solve them at all. For example, why... But no. Let Rose Corbin, our heroine, ask the question. But why, Hank? Why would anyone commit murder because of this coat? I don't get it either, Rose. It's just a plain, ordinary imitation leopard skin coat. We know that. Well, do we? What what do you mean? I I mean, this coat has been the cause of more than one murder and and, and attempted murders. It may look plain and ordinary, but, Rose, it, it can't be. Someone wants this coat. Wants it badly enough to kill for it. And, Rose, do me a favor, will you? What favor, Hank? Stop wearing it. Our mystery drama, Roses Are for Funerals, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Carol Shelley. It is sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and Uncle Ben's Long Grain and Wild Rice. I'll be back shortly with Act One. I'm not going to make the mistake the famous mystery writer E. Phillips Oppenheim once made and bet that you can't solve this mystery. You know what happened to him. You don't? Well, he bet his readers a large sum of money that they couldn't solve the mystery. And many of them did. So, no bets. Tell you what I will do, though. I'll play fair, as always, and make sure you have all the clues I have. Every single one. I'll even tell you when you've got all the pieces you need to put the puzzle together. And nothing can be fairer than that, right? Okay, then. Let's start at Kennedy International Airport, in a passenger lounge, where a very attractive young lady named Rose Corbin sits patiently waiting for her cousin, Hank North. Pardon, mademoiselle. Yes? Please, may I introduce myself? My name is Simon, Simon Laveau. Yes? Please, I must talk quickly, very fast, because my flight has already been announced for Paris. But what is it you want? You will think it is such a foolishness, mademoiselle, but I, I wish to buy your coat. You wish to buy my coat, this coat I'm wearing? Yes, please. It's a strange thing to ask, I know. It's a very strange thing to ask, especially when you're wearing the same kind of coat. Oh, no, 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 it's not the same. Wait, yours is real leopard skin, of course, while mine is only imitation. Uh, A different style, too, but... Please, let me explain, and then I know you will will agree to my very strange request. You can explain, but I'm not Uh, selling you this coat. Please, mademoiselle, the the, the problem is my sister. She's my twin sister in Paris. Vous savez, elle est très pauvre. She's very poor, and she's married to a man who does not make much money. I'm sorry about oh, that. Please, but... vous please, vous en prie, please listen. When we were children, my sister and I always wore identical clothes. Dresses, coats, hats, everything was the same. And so today, when I buy something, well, not like this coat I am wearing, which I bought here in the city, I always buy for her a, a, a duplicate. Oh, that's very thoughtful. Yes, very kind. But you see, I, I'm very selfish. When I see this coat, I want it. Oh, I, I, I want it so much. And so I said to the salesperson, I will take this and, and another one just like it. Of course, for my sister, you understand. But, but mademoiselle, there is not another one like it. So please, quickly now, eh? I have only a few minutes before my flight. And combien ça coûte, eh? How much did you pay for it? How much do you wish for it? I'm sorry, but I just don't want to sell my coat. Well, then, 
hundred dollars, huh? After all, it's, it's only made touching your plan. Look here, uh, even if you offered me two hundred. But me, that's not what I No. Please, please, try to understand. I must have it. Well, one thousand dollars, one thousand. For an imitation leopard skin Please, but was my sister? Now, if you're so concerned over your sister having a coat like yours, buy her one when you but get to Paris. But it's too late, mademoiselle. She's meeting me at the airport, and she will say, where is my coat? And I shall not I'm sorry. I'm really very <sighs> sorry, but... Please, here, one thousand dollars, and I beg the coat. Please. What are you doing? Take oh. your hands off. Please, will you? Don't you look, you tall. Oh, you ridiculous. Hey, 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 cool it. Go away. Yes, I'll be happy to if one of you <gasps> isn't Rose Corbin. Oh, that's me. Are you Hank? Hank? Yeah, that's uh, me. That's me. I was pretty sure you were Rose. You're wearing that rose in your coat lapel. What is all of this? Well, this woman insists that I sell her my coat. But they have offered her one thousand dollars. Yes, but if my cousin doesn't want to sell, you you don't want to, do you, Rose? No. Oh, well, but I do not have time to argue. I shall miss my flight. Please, please, I beg of you, sell it to me. Look, I'd I'd better find a cop. No, 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 don't do that. Please. Well, then you must be on your way. Please, the court, the court, I must have it. Okay, okay. There's a cop over there. No, I'll no, just no, go no. on. No, no, please, I'm going. I, I, I'm going. Oh, thank you, Hank. I'm so glad you came along when you did. She gave you a hard time, huh? Well, she tried to tear the coat off me, even ripped my lapel. <laughs> she put a kind of crimp in your rose, too. Broke the stem. Well, I might as well throw that away. Now it's served its purpose. Well, there's no need for that. Uh, look, I, I think I can repin it. Oh, thank you. Let's see. Say it's still pretty fresh. In fact, it's very fresh. After an eight-hour trip from London. I didn't get it in London. I got it here, at the airport florist, when I landed. When I told you I'd be wearing a rose so that you'd recognize me, well, I decided if the girl looked wilted, at least the rose didn't have to. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you are. Good as new. Oh, thank you. Except for your torn lapel. Mother will take care of that. Okay. I've got your bag, so uh, let's, let's go. Fun city awaits you, Cousin Rose. Hank? She seems to be awaiting me, too. What? Oh, the French girl, see? She still hasn't gone through the flight gate. She's standing there looking at us as if, well, as if she was still hoping to buy this coat. Ah, forget her. The world is full of nuts. Let's go. Well, yes, we have bridges in London, but nothing like this, Hank. The Triborough, you said? Yep. Yeah. Look over there. How's that for your first sight of New York City? Oh, it's sensational. It's too bad you didn't arrive at night. That skyline all lit up. It's out of sight. I'm sure it is. Oh, Hank, I'm so grateful to you and Aunt Ruth letting me stay with you on my first trip to the States. Letting you stay? Now, happy to have you. In fact, now that I see you, I'm delighted to have you. And very glad we're cousins twice removed. Why? Well, it makes us kissing cousins. <laughs> I hope you're right. About being second cousins, I mean. Personally, I can't figure it out. Maybe you, with that lawyer's brain of yours. Hey, what in... What is it? What's wrong? That car next to us. Hey, watch it. <gasps> hey, man, you're too darn close. Oh, good heavens, they certainly are. Crazy fool. What are you doing? Get over. Oh, we'll have an accident. But we sure will if they don't... <gasps> Well, they got the idea. They're pulling ahead, thank heaven. Pulling ahead, but right in front of us. Now, what in Hank, the... Hank, look out. They've stopped. Ow! Oh! Oh, Rose, Rose, are you okay? I don't know. I... Hey, here, what do you think you're doing? You, creep. Me? Yes, you. Give me that. Oh, never mind. I'll take it. Hey, take your hands off her. What kind of a nut are you? Let her alone. The coat. He's trying to take my coat. Get your hands off her, I said. All right. Uh, uh, Hank, Hank, you've knocked him out. No, no, no. He's, he's getting up. Come back here, you dirty creep. Hank, don't go after him. He could be armed. You could be hurt. He's getting back in his car. Get the license number. All right. Quick, Rose, the glove compartment, pad and a pencil. Right. Uh, jot the number down. Quick, he's burning rubber to get away fast. They tried to kill us, Mother. They did. I know they did. And, and he, the man who jumped from their car and ran back to us... He wanted my coat as badly as that woman at the airport. It's unbelievable. It's altogether unbelievable. It's incredible. That's what it is. Now, just a minute. You say she was willing to pay $1,000 for it. For imitation leopard skin. Uh -huh. <laughs> but she wanted it and had to have it for her twin sister? Yeah, well, I, I don't buy that, Mother. Uh, this uh, second attempt to get a hold of the coat. I mean, by a guy who was ready to kill us in an accident if it turned out that way. No. There's something about that coat. Something somebody wants. Yes, but what could any...
anyone want with an imitation leopard skin coat. Where'd you buy it, Rose? Harrods in London. I wish I knew how to straighten out the mystery of Rose's coat. Oh, dear. You don't straighten out a mystery. You solve it. And I ought to know. I've read hundreds of them every year. Solve most of them, too. We'll try solving this one, then, Aunt Ruth. Oh, well, as a matter of fact, I've been thinking. And I may have the answer. You have? Mm, just may have. Would you bring me the coat, dear? Of course. I won't be a minute. What do you think of her, Mother? <gasps> oh, she's beautiful. And she's just so charming, so poised. She may not have much money, son, but she does know how to wear clothes. And with a figure like that, uh, the clothes wear her. <laughs> Well, I don't mind saying she's exactly the sort of girl I hoped you'd marry one day. Yeah, well, in that case, I'm, I'm glad she came over. I'm glad you invited her. Oh, that's why I invited her. <laughs> Here it is, Aunt Ruth. Thank you, my dear. Oh, this rose you wore is wilted, poor thing. Small wonder. It's really taken a battering. I suppose it just decided to give up. <laughs> Mother, what are you doing? Now you know my methods, Watson. Apply them. I'm examining the lining. The lining? Oh, no, I could be wrong, but it wouldn't surprise me if something were hidden in this lining. For well, what, for goodness sake? Well, let me see. Certainly not jewels, or I'd be able to feel them. <laughs> <laughs> You're going over that lining like an expert, Mother. Well, that's what comes of being a mystery story addict. Oh, wait. Not heroin, either. <laughs> heroin? Oh, it's been done. Well, not anymore, though. The customs people were onto that, oh, ages ago. I'll go. Uh now, if heroin were concealed in the lining, mm -hmm. I'd be able to feel the, you know, the crinkly little glassine envelopes. Oh, what? There's nothing hidden in the lining. Nothing I can see, anyway. Oh, was it paper delivery, dear? Yeah. Now, why are you looking at the front page? It's as if you'd just been shocked out of a year's growth. Because it uh, could be I just have been. Hank, what? Listen to this. Headline reads... Woman murdered on Paris-bound plane. What? A, a woman identified as Simone Laveau of Paris, France. That's her. That's the woman who wanted to buy my coat. I know, I know. Just listen now. Was found dead in her seat aboard flight 219 for Paris late this afternoon. An hour after takeoff, a hostess, Andrea Klein, noticed that Miss Laveau was slumped in her seat and thought she was asleep. She secured a cushion to place behind the young woman's head and on doing so, discovered she was dead. Oh, no. Oh. Further examination disclosed a deep knife wound in her left side. Since the flight was only an hour out from New York City, Hostess Klein recalls that a man was seated next to her just before takeoff was nowhere to be found on board following the discovery of the murder. What does this mean, Hank? I'll tell you one thing it means, Mother. I'm going to police headquarters right now, and I'm taking that coat with me. Yes, but Hank... Rose, a woman who was willing to pay $1,000 for this piece of imitation leopard skin was murdered an hour or so later. Why? A man neither of us ever saw before nearly killed us in a crash on the Triborough so he could get this coat off you. Why? Well, we'd better find out why. Be because... Well, yes, because... Uh, I could be wrong. I hope I am. But this coat, it could be a death warrant, Rose. Whose? Yours. Now, of course, you're thinking. So Ruth North, Hank's mother, examined the lining of that coat and found nothing. So what? Obviously, the coat contains something. Maybe it does. Then again, maybe it doesn't. In fact, to be absolutely truthful with you, no. Why should I be? You have all the clues. Use them. I'll be back shortly for Act Two. I'm sure most of you will recall the famous incident when Sherlock Holmes said to Dr. Watson... Consider, Watson, the curious behavior of the dog. And Watson said, but Holmes, the dog did nothing. Precisely, Watson, Holmes answered. Precisely. Now that, my dear listeners, is precisely the sort of clue you now have in your possession. And like Watson, must figure out for yourselves. 
I can almost hear Holmes saying, but consider the coat, Watson, the imitation leopard skin coat, and Watson answering, but the coat is valueless, Holmes, and Holmes nodding wisely as he replies, precisely, Watson, precisely. Now, shall we go on? Joe. Hello. Contact ballistics. I'm fabrics. They're bullets. And that's what you want to know about. Joe. Joe, listen. Granted, I have what you call a special flair for forensic, but... Okay, okay. I'll look into it. Yeah. Yeah. Leave it to me, Joe. Bye. Lieutenant Maxwell. Show him in. Come in, uh, Mr. North, Miss Corbin. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant. Sit down, please. Coffee? Uh, no, thanks. Rose? Uh, no, thank you. Well, here's your coat, Miss Corbin. We found nothing. Not a thing. Nothing? I'll level with you, Mr. North. When you brought this coat in the other night, I figured, well... There's something, and I'll find it. Like there had to be something. You know what I mean? I mean, who offers 1,000 clamps for an imitation leopard skin coat, then gets herself murdered an hour later? Who crashes his car against another guy's car on the Triborough yet and tries to grab the coat off a of Dane? Who? Somebody that wants something in that coat. That's who. Yes, but you found nothing. I have personally put this coat through every test we know. Every inch of it has been examined under the microscope, the x-ray, the fluoroscope. We took the lining apart. Oh. And don't worry, we put it back together again better than before. It's beautiful. And, uh, pull the blank. Well, I don't get it, Lieutenant. I mean, if it was just that woman uh, willing to pay $1,000 for this coat, but... But a guy crashing his car into mine on the bridge and then trying to rip that coat off Rose, uh, Miss Corman. Lieutenant, there's got to be something about this coat. Well, I felt the same way myself, Mr. North, but there's nothing. No invisible markings, nothing hidden in the seams, nothing between the layers of the fabric and the collar, nothing. So to be honest with you, I don't get it either. Excuse me, could I ask a question? Certainly. What about the woman, Simone Laveau? Have you found out why she was murdered? No, I checked a couple of times with Homicide last time, 20 minutes ago. We got nothing here on her. Us, the FBI, the T-Boys. Right now we're checking the CIA and Interpol. They could maybe have something, but it'll take a little time. Well, thanks, uh, Lieutenant. Uh, you'll let us know if anything turns up? You'd better believe it, Mr. North. Well, so much for the coat, Rose. That's that, I guess. What would you like to do? Oh, don't you have to get back to your office? Yeah, well, not until late this afternoon. I scheduled my day so I could spend most of it with you. <laughs> Say, I know. How about the Museum of Art? We could spend a few hours there, even have lunch if you'd like that. Oh, how wonderful, Hank. Only I don't like the idea of having to carry this coat around all day. But, well, you won't have to. I mean, we'll check it at the museum. Okay? Okay. <laughs> hey, taxi! Taxi! Enjoy your sandwich, Rose? Oh, yes. Only I'm... Oh, I'm so full. You Americans make much bigger sandwiches than we do in Britain. <laughs> it's the American way. Everything on a big scale. Ah. <laughs> well, you feel up to looking at some more paintings? Hank, would you mind? I really don't. Two hours walking around those galleries upstairs. Oh, sure, sure. You're tired. Look, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll drop you off at home and then uh, head downtown to my office. Are you sure you don't mind? Oh, to be honest, Rose, I do. I mean, I want to spend as much time with you as I can. You want to stop and look at the Greek and Roman sarcophaguses? Sarcophagi? <laughs> tombs? <laughs> no. No, I've seen enough. Let's just get my coat from the check room and go home, where I can rest these aching feet. Whatever you say, Cousin Rose. Hey, there's something going on over there. I should say so. There's a big crowd around the check room. Police. 
Hank, what do you suppose has happened? I don't know. We're going to have a rough time, though, getting through that crowd to reclaim your coat. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Uh, you know what's going on over there? There's been a murder, I think. A murder? Yeah, a robbery or a theft or whatever it's called. Anyway, somebody stole a coat. A coat? Yeah, that's what I heard. You, uh, you don't happen to know what kind of coat? Yeah, I, I, I think they said a leopard skin coat, somebody said. Imitation leopard. Another cup, Rose. Oh, thank you. I'm getting to like coffee. Oh, or is that another way of saying you don't care for my tea? Oh, no. No? <laughs> uh, tea or coffee, when you when you finish that, I think you'd be smart to stretch out for a while, have yourself a nap. I mean, you've, you've had kind of a rough day. Yeah. Mm, tiring, anyhow. Well, at least you're rid of that coat once and for all. Now, you don't have to worry about that anymore. But you don't, dear. I don't. I, I, well, I just don't know. I'm... I'm not so sure. What do you mean? I have sort of... Oh, I, I don't know. A feeling that what happened at the museum today isn't the end of all this. For me, I mean. Oh, now, now, it's nothing more than nerves, my dear. It's just nerves. Perhaps, but I don't think so. Maybe it's the mystery of the thing. Not knowing why someone wanted that coat badly enough to kill for it. Murder for it. Looks like we'll never know now. Well, look, it's it's over now, and, and we can forget it, as Mother says. And Now, if you ladies will excuse me... Well, where are you going? To the office. Oh, but this late in the afternoon, it's after four. <laughs> and the brief I wanted to finish up at three is still waiting to be finished. Now, Hank, you work too hard. Couldn't it wait until tomorrow? Don't forget, there's the theater tonight. I'll be back at 6.30, the latest, so don't... I'll get it. Hello? That you, Mr. North? Yes. Lieutenant Maxwell? Yeah, I tried you at your office. They said I might find you at home. Uh, are you going to be there another hour or so? Well, uh, if it's important... Uh... I think it is. I've got the answer. Anyhow, I think I've got the answer to our little mystery. I want to come over and check it out. Yeah, well, sure, but what is the answer? One thing, Mr. North, we got a report from the Paris branch of Interpol on the Simone Laveau woman. Yeah, what about her? She was a foreign agent, one of the higher-ups in the spy ring. A spy ring? Spy ring? Yeah, now, uh, the way I figure it, she, uh... Oh, wait just a minute. Yeah, what is it, Eddie? Lieutenant Maxwell says Simone Laveau was a foreign agent, part of a spy ring. Oh, good heavens. Hello? Hello, Mr. North. Yes, you, Lieutenant. Listen, uh, something's just come up here. I gotta hang up. But I'll be at your place in, over uh, say, half an hour. Wait a minute. Uh, what's the answer to the mystery? I'll see you in half an hour. Lieutenant, don't leave us hanging like... Well, I'll be. <laughs> well, what was that all that about, Hank? Well, Maxwell says he has the answer to the mystery, or he thinks he has. He'll be over here in half an hour to check it out. What is the answer? He didn't tell me. He got called away on something. He had to hang up. <laughs> well... Who are you calling? The office. That brief will have to wait uh -huh. until tomorrow now. Where is he? Well, give him time, Mother. Give him time. But, but it's nearly six o'clock. He should have been here at least an hour ago. And we are going to the theater tonight, remember? Yeah, well, we may have to skip that. I'm so sorry, Aunt <sighs> Ruth. Oh, that's all right, my dear. It's not your fault. Well, somehow I feel it is. Rose, how could it possibly be your fault? Well, I'm the one who bought that silly coat at Harrods. And if I hadn't bought it, none of this oh, would have not. happened. Not to you, perhaps, but certainly to someone else. If someone did buy it. Now, for all we know, if you hadn't bought it... It could still be hanging on the rack in London. Yes, well, I wish it were. It isn't nerves, Aunt Ruth. It's, it's knowing that because of that coat, two people were murdered. Hank and I came close to death in oh. that car crash, and... Uh, well, well it, it's just too much. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Uh-oh. Ah, this must be Lieutenant Maxwell. Okay, okay, I'm coming. Lieutenant. Uh, your... Lieutenant! Yeah, an ambulance. Hank, what... Oh, my heavens, Hank, be quick. He's collapsing. Yeah, I've got him. Mother, call an ambulance. Yeah, an ambulance. Hank, is he hurt badly? Uh, my back. My life. All right, let me get him onto the couch. Uh, okay, look, get his coat on. Right. And, and his shirt. No, too late. The name is North. Finish. Oh, that's North. what you think. That's right. Uh, Rose, uh, the medicine cabinet in the bathroom. Yes, Bandages. Please. Iodine. Yes, all right. No. Listen, look, you better not talk. Just let me get these things off you, so I... The ambulance oh. is on the way. Oh. Oh, my dear. Lord, I've never seen so much... Listen. Oh. Yes, yes, Lieutenant. 
guy that did this. How did he do it? Not much time. She... She... Rose? Life in danger. Rose's life? In danger? Yes. She... Uh, Man's in agony. Here's some bandages uh, and some iodine. And Lieutenant. I did this. Must found out. I know. I know the answer to the cult. Listen now. Go on. Only one that knows me. My office bugged. Got to be. Tell them. Headquarters. Tell them. Bug. Sure, sure. Count on it. What is the answer, Lieutenant? The coat. Not. Not. Not? What do you mean, not? Not what? Lieutenant! Oh. Is, is he. Yes. Oh. Oh, poor man. Another death. Will we never see the end of this? Why are you looking at me like that? Hank, on roof. What is it? Tell me. He said, your life's in danger now. Mine? Yes, dear. But it can't be. How can it be? I, I haven't got the coat anymore. No, but... But what? They've got the coat. They've got what they were after. Why would they kill me? I don't know. But I better find out, honey. I damn well better find out. He'd certainly better do just that, or Rose Corbin, the very attractive young woman Hank North has fallen in love with, may not live much longer. But how can he find out the answer to this baffling mystery? Where does one start? What does one do? Where would you start? What would you do? I'll be back shortly for Act Three. Well, now, let's see where we are. Rose Corbin arrived in the United States from London, England, wearing an imitation leopard skin coat. On her arrival, a woman named Simone Laveau tried to buy the coat and when Rose refused to sell, tried to take it away from her. Later, Simone Laveau was murdered aboard the plane, taking her to Paris. Since then, the coat seems to have triggered two more murders. That of a checkroom attendant at the Museum of Art, at which time the murderer made off with the coat, and, as we heard only minutes ago, that of Lieutenant Maxwell of the police. All right, Rose, let's go over it and over it. Hank, we've gone over it and over I it. I know, but Maxwell said your life is in danger now, and Rose, if anything happened to you... Well, it isn't going to, not if I can help it. You bought the coat in Harrods the day before you took off to visit us here. Yes. And no one accosted you at Heathrow before you boarded the plane, or on the plane. Nobody even mentioned the coat. No, no one. But the minute you got off the plane at Kennedy International, this uh, Simone Laveau... Well, not the minute I got off the plane. First, I went to the florist to buy the flower... The rose I said I'd wear so you'd recognize me. Yeah, but just after that... She came up to me and asked to buy the coat and got very upset when I said I wouldn't sell it. I mean, practically began to tear it off me. I just don't get it. We know there was nothing hidden in the coat. No invisible message, no... Nothing. But we do know that Simone Laveau was a foreign agent. Now, there's just got to be some connection between the coat and her being a foreign agent. There's got to be. Hank, dear... Why don't we forget it till after we've had dinner? We're all so tired and upset. Yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. Go and get ready and um, we'll take off for Antonelli's, huh? I won't be long. All right. What? Who are you? What are you doing there? Rose, what is it? Hank! Hank! What's the matter? What? There's a man here in my room. He's just fled there. He's gone out the window. It's too dark to see. He's probably down the fire escape by now. What was he doing? Well, see for yourself. I mean, look at the mess he made of my dressing table. He was going through the drawers. Your jewel case. Well, there's junk jewelry, most of it. Oh, this is all we need right now. A sneak thief on top of everything else. 
Check your things. Right. See what he got away with, if anything. Look, I'll call the police. <laughs> And to what, Mr. North, do I owe this royal treatment? Royal treatment? Well, the call from your secretary saying to meet you at five o'clock at this swank watering hole. And, and then the arrival by messenger of this absolutely lovely little nosegay with instructions to wear it. <laughs> well, you leave tomorrow for England and there's something I want to say to you. Something important. Uh, that's why I wanted to meet you here alone and without mother this time and... Well, as for the little nosegay, it's just a little something to make the occasion. <laughs> well, here I am, wearing my most attractive suit and the nosegay. So what do you want to say? Uh, good afternoon. May I take your order? Uh, martini, Rose? Rose? What? Martini? Oh, uh, yes. Uh, two martinis, waiter. Uh, very dry. Yes, sir. Would madame then like me to take your jacket? Take my jacket? It's a bit warm in here this afternoon, and no, I thought... No, thank you. I'm quite comfortable. Certainly, madame. Two martinis. Well, now, Rose, what I wanted to say... Something wrong? No, no. I, I was just wondering if I'd seen that waiter somewhere before. Well, not likely. Well, now, um... Yes. Well, now what? Rose, we've uh, only known each other for a few weeks, but in that short time, I... I've fallen in love with you, and I want you to marry me. Will you? Of course. Of course? <laughs> Just like that? What did you expect me to say? Oh, sir, this is so sudden. <laughs> <laughs> no, but... I'm in love with you, too, Hank. Head over heels. Oh, Rose. Well, I guess it's time then for me to give you this. Oh, Hank. Oh, it's gorgeous. Oh, darling, that diamond must have cost a fortune. Well, you're worth a fortune. Hold out your hand. There. Oh, thank you, dearest. Thank you so much. Hmm. Well, if that's only a sample, I've underrated you. You're worth a queen's ransom. We are served to martinis. Ah, thank you. One for madame. Oh, oh. oh madame, I'm oh, sorry. You spilled it all over my jacket. Oh, forgive me, madame, forgive me. One of those things, he just slipped from my fingers, oh. but... Allow me, I will take care of everything. Let me have the jacket, uh, madame, and I will dry it in no, the kitchen. It's all right, I can wipe it with my napkin. Uh, no, madame, it, it's my fault. You must allow Please, me. Please, will to... you take your hands off me? I said it's, I... Uh, I... But I insist, all right, madame. Yeah, will you stop? I only wish... Well, the lady doesn't wish. Now, just forget it and, and bring another martini. Uh, yes, sir. Very good, sir. Oh, I'm awfully sorry this happened, darling. Are you sure you... Rose, what... That... That waiter. What about him? I remember now. Why does he want this coat? This jacket? What? First he wanted me to take it off, pretending it was hot in here. And, and spilling that drink just now was no accident. He did it deliberately. Rose, I don't understand. Hank, he is the man who caused that accident on our way from the airport. The man who tried to rip the leopard skin coat off me. Oh, Hank, what is this all about? <laughs> Oh, that's your flight they just called. Now have a good trip home, Rose. And we'll be looking forward to seeing you again in a week or ten days, dear. Quicker than that, Aunt Ruth. If I can wind up my affairs in London sooner. Oh, don't look so down in her mouth, darling. No, I don't like even letting you out of my sight, Rose, especially after last night. That waiter... It'll be all right, darling. Don't worry. Oh, and thank you for the rose. Well, that's our flower, like, uh, you know, our song. <laughs> you arrive wearing a rose, you depart wearing one. Goodbye, sweetheart. Dearest. Goodbye, Aunt Ruth. <laughs> Not goodbye, Rose. Au revoir. <laughs> now, don't worry about the wedding now. I'll arrange everything. Oh, you're a dear. I'll see you in a week. Ten days at most. At most. Now, shall we go out and watch the takeoff, Hank? Son, could that be it? Could it? 
Could what be what, Hank? What, what are you talking about? The coat she was wearing when she arrived. The jacket she was wearing last night. Good Lord! The jacket she's wearing now! Could it be that? Hank, what in the world are you... I've been thinking, I've been thinking. What did Lieutenant Maxwell mean when he said, just before he died, said, the coat not. Not. Now I know it wasn't the coat at all. It wasn't the jacket. If I'm right, they... They are after... What? Hank! After what? The flower pinned to Rose's lapel, Mother. Not the coat. Not the jacket. The flower. Well, airborne at last and headed for the old England, young lady. Hmm? Oh, yes. And since we're seated next to each other, let me introduce myself. Emil Tempo. Rose Corbin. Have you been visiting uh, in the States long? Not really. A few weeks. I'm going to... Uh, how did you know that? Well, how did I know? Well, that I was visiting in the States. I could be living there. I could be an American citizen for all you know. I, uh, uh, I assumed uh, uh, your accent... Who are you? Behind those dark glasses? <laughs> You're a very perceptive young woman, Miss Corbin. No. Don't. Not a move. Or I'll give you what I gave Simone Laveau. That's it. No quick moves, no panic. Good. Just relax now. Enjoy the trip. I will be at Heathrow Airport before you know it. Enjoy the trip. I would if I were you. It's the last trip you're ever going to make. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well? We're to go to the operations office at once. He said he'd have a government agent there by then. Come on. Why won't you tell me? There is no need for you to know. Since you're going to kill me when we get to Heathrow. No, not at Heathrow. I'll take you to my place in London, in Soho. And really... I'm sorry about the need to kill you, but I must. Why? Why must you? Because you know my face, and in my business, that's a serious liability uh, for the victim. But uh, be of good cheer. The more I look at you, the more I'm inclined to let you live for uh, some little time. I don't understand. You're a very desirable woman, Miss Corbett. Very desirable. Yes, Hank, what... what the government I... men said to wait here. Yes, but... Wait. They're going to radio the pilot. Oh. I gave them as clear a description of the man, uh, the guy who tried to get the coat from Rose in that accident on the bridge and who palmed himself off as a waiter last night. And then what? Well, he'll check the plane. Uh, you know, the way the captain comes through the plane now and then, chats with the passengers. Yes, and then... And then well, he'll he... check to see if this guy's on the plane. And uh, if he is... Yes, and, and if he is, what? We'll take it from there, he said. The government man. We'll take it from there. <laughs> Did you enjoy the movie? Uh, are you joking? No, uh, just uh, making small talk. If you must talk, why not tell me what it is you want? Why did you cause that accident on the Triborough Bridge and try to get the jacket I had on last night? What is it you're after? Patience, Miss Corbin. We'll be landing at the Heathrow in half an hour. Another hour or so, we'll be at my place in Soho. And perhaps an hour or so after that, I'll tell you. And uh, perhaps not. <laughs> Sure Mother, they... there are at least a dozen plain clothes police and government men down there disguised as airport attendants. The minute they disembark, there. Oh. They've rolled the landing platform in place. 
The door is opening. Yes, well, Matt Nan, wh whoever he is, discovers that this isn't he. Well, don't worry. Everything has been arranged. Oh. There they are. Rose and the man. There's the captain right behind them. Oh. And they're walking right into the arms of... Oh, fool! He put up a fight! It was as simple as that, Rose. I mean, the captain turned the plane around and circled Kennedy International for a few hours, uh, pretending you were flying to Heathrow. He fooled me, but not him. Halfway down the steps of that landing platform, he realized... And he foolishly he... tried to shoot things out. Oh, I know, I suppose I ought to feel sorry for him, but I just... It's understandable. Oh, it's, it's all just unbelievable. When I think that because I said I'd wear a rose and bought one at the airport when I arrived... Well, the attendant at the florist shop, an agent who'd been planted there, would never have mistaken you for Simone Livreau and pinned that rose to your lapel with... Well, I guess you could call it the fatal pin. Now, you know, I'm still not sure I've got this straight, dear. Now, let me see. She, on her way to Paris, was to go into the florist shop wearing a leopard skin coat and ask for a rose, right? Now, that was the agent's cue to use the, um, what you called the fatal pin? Uh, exactly. Uh, see, Emil Tenko knew he was under surveillance, and so he had a problem. I mean, how to get that top-secret information out of the country. So he had it engraved on the head of a pin. You know, Aunt Ruth, the way they engraved the Lord's Prayer on a pinhead. Mm. The trouble began when the agent thought that I was Simone Laveau on her way to Paris, wearing an almost identical leopard skin coat to mine. Yeah, and naturally, when Rose threw the rose away after it wilted, she kept the pin and used it again last night, the pin on the nosegay I gave her. Well, it's all over, and thank heaven it is. Rose, how about some dinner? I'm starving. But before we go, I am going to change out of this suit into a dress. Oh, and Hank, dear... Yes, sweetheart. No flowers, please. Not for a long, long time. No flowers, please. And so, as you see, like all good, seemingly insoluble mysteries, the solution to roses are for funerals was very simple indeed. In fact, I even gave you a clue in the title... What could be fairer than that? I'll be back shortly. Mysteries, it seems to me, are like a magic show. Like the magician, the author shows you everything, but directs your attention elsewhere. Perhaps I should say misdirects it. So be on your guard next time. Oh, yes, there will be a next time. And although I'll always play 100% fair with you, I warn you now, I'll do all I can to mislead you. Can you blame me? Our cast included Carol Shelley, Tony Roberts, Mildred Clinton, and Dan Ocko. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Gretchen, what's come over you? You seem so different, so... Yes? Well, you always struck me as a... Well, well, I'll say it. A, a very quiet little person. And now you... You glow all over. I feel there's a glow inside me. Ah, Gretchen, it's beautiful. But I see now it's a... It's a, an awful beauty. It, it's a frightening beauty. Fear and terror. It's all part of beauty. Those crimson flowers, that, that red. It's like the red of blood. These flowers, they look as if they're being nourished with blood. They are, Porter. They are. How did you know? Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by imported Vigna Rosé wine. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
am E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense, to the fear you can hear. Our tale is a blood-freezing story inspired by a nursery rhyme, a sweet, simple song. Ring a ring of roses, a pocket full of poses. Achoo, achoo, we all fall down. It sounds young and innocent, doesn't it? But it is very old and very sinister. For the ring a ring of roses were the splotches that first appeared on the faces of those afflicted during the Black Plague. The pocket full of poses were the herbs that were carried hopefully to ward off the fatal disease. The sneezing sounds, achoo, achoo, were the sounds of the final spasms. And we all fall down was, well, you can guess. Our mystery drama, A Ring of Roses, was written especially for the Radio Mystery Theater by S.J. Wilson and stars Glynis O'Connor. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Science has brought most plagues under control, but not so those other epidemics of the past those that plague us with their unseen, unknown, and unexpected terrors. And such is the tale of terror you are about to hear. Draw close to the guttering candle, for you will receive no warmth from a ring of roses. You know, George, I've heard about this place so often from Helena. I'm just dying to see her home. And I'm anxious to meet your friend, Helena. Oh, I'm sure you'll like her. But will she like me? Taking her best friend away from her. Come on, George. <laughs> you know you're irresistible. <laughs> Why do you think I'm going to marry you? Well, for one thing, my beautiful, exquisite, enormous pots of money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, George, wait. Uh, uh, Look, stop. Laurie, get your hands off the wheel. What do you think you're trying to... But we passed it. It's the sign to the house. Back there. Now, Laurie. Laurie, I never want you to do that again. I'm not going to let missing a sign risk your getting hurt. You understand? I'm sorry. I shouldn't have grabbed the wheel that way. All right, forget it. But please, never again, ever. And that is supposed to be the sign... Helena warned that we might miss it. Well, why would anyone use a rose-colored stone in a brass oval with no name or any identification on it for a house sign? Well, their name is Roston. And Helena said that generations back when their family first moved to America, it was rose stone. And so they put up a rose stone. <laughs> well, if they want people to get that meaning from it, they either enjoy guessing games or, more likely, just want to keep themselves very, very private. Yes. Yes what? As you said, they, they are very private. Well, I got that impression before we got here. And I also have the feeling that they're not very friendly either. Oh, how can you say that? When Helena's mother especially invited us over because she personally wanted to give us our engagement gift. Yes, and that's pretty peculiar, too. How? How many parties, I mean showers, did your girlfriends give you? Four, right? No, three. The last one was a dinner. All right. And Helena was invited to every one, but she... I know, George. She didn't turn up for any of them. You know, Laurie, I've never seen you so wound up. What's spinning around in that pretty head of yours? Well, I, I don't know, but... Well... I am on edge. About what? I I guess about meeting Helena's mother. You see, she she's so strange. She seems so powerful and so terribly uncompromising. I was trying to change things for Helena, and, and then I let her down by becoming engaged to you. Well, now, don't tell me you weren't going to marry for poor Helena's sake. 
Well, at least not until she married first. We were going to share an apartment together in the city. You know what I'm going to do, Laurie? I am going to turn this car right around and head back to the city. This whole trip is more foolish than funny. Oh, no, George. Please don't. Hey, what's that? You hear something like, like, like singing? Let me open the window. It's a woman singing that old nursery rhyme. A two. We all fall down. But what's that snapping ring, sound? Ring, it sounds it's like a piece of leather. It sounds like a whip. George, what are you doing? I'm getting out. Something's happening here that I don't, don't like. Don't open the door. Please don't. We'll go back if you want to. I'll be right back. Keep the window shut and the door's locked. No, don't leave me, George. I'm coming with you. Wait. Okay, but stay close to me. Ring a ring of roses. Oh, it seems to be coming from behind those hedges. You know, it could be just kids playing games. If that voice is coming from a kid, he's using a bullhorn. Let's stop here. We might see through the hedge. Please be careful. Holy Toledo. Look at that. Let me see. That man. The old man with the beard. He's trying to catch the girl with his whip. Well, she's teasing him. She's making fun of him. If he lands that wagon whip on her, he'll split her face open. Look at their clothes, George. They're dressed like settlers. Back in the early 1800s. Yeah. You know, they could be rehearsing a play. If they are, he's lost his mind and his part. That man's going wild with that whip. But she's provoking him. Why doesn't she stop? Hey! Hey, you there! What are you two doing? Oh, George, you shouldn't have done that. And who is it who is ordering me and questioning me? I am. Over here. That's a terrible thing you're doing. Oh, George, please don't go in there. They know we're here. We must meet them. That's a dangerous whip you're using. That young woman can be killed by it. I see by your clothes you are a stranger. And I can also see that you are a kind human who wishes no harm to come to another. But this, this wench is my daughter. And what I am doing is the true way to gain the obedience of a child who will stray. But what in heaven could she have done to deserve being whipped? I did no harm to no person or to him. I have broken no law of God or man. Strumpet, hold your witch's tongue. Believe me, young woman, when I tell you that she has the demon in her, playing and wenching with the young master who owns this land. While I'm out here working at clearing their forest lands, she's up there in the great house with her enticements and tricks and enchantments. And if it has already come to this, that he has given her a gift for favors promised or already bestowed, the gift of a ring. An already cursed ring. He gave it to me fair and with the holy vow that he will marry me in the month of the next full moon. Marry you, Willie. You can have fair to read and write. You who are lower than his mother's kitchen scullion. You give me that ring. I won't. I swear by the name and the soul of my sainted mother that you will never get this ring. And until I do, though it mean your own death, you get the whip. Stop it! Oh. Don't! Why can't you be a little more reasonable? She may be telling you the truth. I am. I swear it on my dead mother's Bible, I am. Well, then, if you are, why don't you give him the ring and let your young man personally tell your father of his plan? No! No, he'll do no thing like that. He'll bury the ring in some secret spot and drag me away before the fall of night. For he doesn't want me to marry to no one but to stay with him and clean and cook and wash for the rest of his devil life. As you can see, she's beyond talking of matters with sense and decency. She's been taken up with her planning and scheming to get away from me for the purpose of harlot's gain. And she hardly of marrying him. I'll kill you. Uh, George! Uh, she has an uh, axe! Uh, an axe! Uh, She's going stop, to kill him! Stop! For God's sake, stop! Ah! Oh, oh, George, I can't look! She's dead! She killed her own father! Uh, what? 
Where is she? What happened to her? There she is. She's running away. Hey! Hey, come back! Come back! You can't get away! If you will never get away, the ring will circle you. George! George, don't try to catch her. She's like the wind. I'll never get my hands on her. She's almost in the forest. Come back! Come back! We're not going to hurt you! It's you who are going to be hurt! She's, she's disappeared! <sighs> Even before she got to the forest. But, George, look what I found. It's the ring. She dropped the ring. Let me see it. You know what it's like? It's just like the road sign. It, it's the same shape. The same color stone. It's smaller, but it is just like the road sign. Rose colors. George... George, we've got to get help. The police, you someone... Said where? where? Of course, the house. We've got to get to Helena's house. This ring so rosy, this ring so red, does it belong to the living or the dead? We'll return shortly with Act Two. alone. I don't want to disturb your mother. My dear, you're not disturbing me in the slightest. This room has no secrets. Its acoustics are incredible. I'm Helena's mother. Hello, Mrs. Roston. We've just had a very, a very unusual experience. Laurie's pretty badly shaken by it. Yes, so I see. Helena, why don't you take Laurie to your room, let her refresh herself? Perhaps Mr. Williamson will tell me something more about what's happened? I think the police should be notified at once. The police? Here? Did you have an accident? Well, not exactly, but we happened to see something that can only be described as uh, gruesome, I guess. And the police should be notified. Mother, do you think... Helen, dearest, this is not the time for speculation. I shall be glad to have the deputy's office call... But can you give me some indication of what they're to be told? We don't like bothering our officers unnecessarily. They have enough to do as it is. But someone's just been murdered. Oh, no, not again. What? Now, Helena, restrain yourself, dearest. Laura, you say someone's been murdered? Who? Well, we don't know who he is, but he was trying to whip a young woman. And, Mr. Williamson, she took an axe and killed him. You know. How could you? I was praying that it wouldn't happen to you. Oh, poor Lori. Now, why don't you young people make yourselves comfortable? A glass of sherry might calm you. But, Mother, you told me that it would never happen again. That thing... Helena, I said I had taken every precaution not to have it happen. But who am I to promise I will control the uncontrollable? Are you saying that this has happened before? Lori... Maybe Mrs. Roston wants to explain. Oh, well, not really, but I feel I'm obliged to. However, it is difficult. How does one explain the inexplicable? I think they're ghosts. There are no ghosts, Helena. Dr. Medvick, the last scientist I consulted, said it was undoubtedly an instance of photoly sensory projection. Helena pooh-poohs it. But uh, has either of you ever heard of that discipline? Oh, vaguely. It once came up in a course on parapsychology that I had at school. No one has ever proved PSP, Mother. Well, they've never proved ESP either, but a lot of serious scientists work with it. But, but George, what does that photo whatever mean? <laughs> it's quite complicated. Photolysis is the means by which light can affect the arrangement of chlorophyll grains in leaves. Chlorophyll grains... Leaves? There's a man not more than a mile from here who's been murdered. Now, calm yourself, my child. There is no such man and no such daughter. This has happened before. I've seen it. Helena has. A very few close friends have. Unfortunately, you have too. Uh, Mr. Williamson, 
Do you think you'd still like to try an explanation of PSP? <laughs> well, it's spooky in a way. By that I mean the, the scientific explanation of it. You see, we're all supposed to give off certain light and heat waves. And what is it happens in the case of individuals who are emotionally stimulated, uh, let us say, people in love? Well, the theory has it that people in a very intense emotional state give off more highly concentrated waves. Well, I just don't understand what chlorophyll and, and leaves and, and light waves have to do with a man being murdered. You see, it's tied up with photosynthesis. And scientists aren't sure how that process really works. But with the unusual intensity of light, the cells of chlorophyll rearrange themselves and are forced to give off some of the excess carbohydrates in which there is an unusual amount of stored energy. I'm not following this at all. My dear, Helena speaks of you as having the patience of a saint. <laughs> so, if you'd like me to telephone the deputies, I suggest you give your fiancé a chance to finish. There isn't much more, Laurie. Just at the openings in the leaves, they're called stomates, tend to react like projectors. And through the magnification of additional oxygen are supposed to be able to relay an episode they once absorbed when they were in the receptive state, like, uh, well, like film. Are, are you talking about something, something like motion picture film? Yes, Laurie, but it means something like a projector with a memory. A memory of blood in this case. Well, it happens that chlorophyll is very much like hemoglobia except that it contains magnesium instead of the iron found in blood. Are you saying that what we saw was a motion picture? Nothing more? Well, essentially, that's it. But when and where the original was recorded, we have no idea. Well, but there's a building. There's a cabin out there. And there's a man's body bleeding. Why don't you go and see for yourself if you don't believe us? No, Laurie, there's nothing there. Helena, you too? Uh, yes, as Mother said, I've seen it. Others have too. Around here, they call it the Enchanted Forest. But if you go out there again, you won't find a cabin or a man. Nothing. The police know all about it. They'll come and you'll just feel foolish. I... I don't know what to think. It all seemed so real. Well, now, why don't we come back to the present and the truly real? Because I have the real pleasure of giving you our gift to celebrate your engagement. It's a complete surprise. Even I don't know what it is. Laurie, dear, it isn't that what we're giving you is expensive or valuable. But it is dear to us. We hope it will be your first family heirloom. Here it is. No pretty wrapping, but it seems too lovely a box to cover with silly paper. Mother, I've never seen that box before. Well, now, isn't it nice that I can still have some surprises for you? That's a great-looking box, Mrs. Ralston. Those, uh, those are roses painted on ivory, aren't they? Oh, it's so beautiful. I feel as if I'm depriving you of something very special if, if I accepted it. Oh, no. Please, take it. It's, it's little enough, and you know what I think that box would be perfect for? It already has its purpose, dear. What I was going to say was that it would be the perfect place to keep a lock of your first baby's hair, wouldn't it? And I'm afraid it's going to stay empty for some time. Oh, George, we don't know that. Not yet. We will have to find you another container for that when the time comes. This box already has its occupant. You mean there's something inside? Well, look and see. Well, go ahead, Laurie. <laughs> My heart's beating so loudly. <laughs> She's been like that all day, so excited. Darling, do you want me to open it? No, no, I'm all right. <sighs> Just let me take a deep breath. Oh, no. Hey, that's... That's the same... Laurie? What, oh. What's wrong? Mother? Oh, it's his music! Give me the box, Laurie. And inside! Inside! Oh, the ring! Oh! oh. oh. I got her. Put her on the couch. Yes. Laurie? Laurie? Mother, do something. Don't just stand there. 
Eleanor, control yourself and get some water. Oh, Laurie, my poor Laurie. Wake up. Laurie, come out of it, honey. Darling? She's trying to open her eyes. Slowly, Laurie. It's me, George. Oh, who? What, what happened? You just passed out for a moment. Here, give her this water. Here, honey. Sip this slowly. I don't need it. But did I really see it? See what? The ring. Yes. Yes, I've got it. What What ring? This ring. The same one. With a rose-colored stone. Mother, how dare you? That's mine. You know what that ring means to me. Oh, please take that thing away. I don't want to look at it. Don't worry. You won't have to. Here, Mrs. Ralston, take it back. And I hope it isn't a sample of your sense of humor. Just one moment, Mr. Williamson. I don't particularly appreciate your tone or your attitude. What do you mean by my sense of humor? If you and your daughter know all about that axe-murdering scene that we saw earlier, then you must have known about the ring. What about it? It's mine. That ring. It's just like that road sign you have on the highway. Yes, the sign was copied from the design of the ring. It's been our family hallmark, so to speak, for generations. Is that why the girl who killed her father did it? Because of that ring? What do you mean? She had it. She she teased him with it while, while she sang that song. That same nursery rhyme in the box. Oh, oh no. Uh, that couldn't be... That's my ring. She couldn't have had it. Are you too sure you saw this ring? Well, that girl in the field. She dropped it when she ran away. Then where is it now? Well, George, you had it. What? You sure? I I thought you put it into your purse. Well, I'll look. Well, it isn't in any of my pockets. No, and it's not here in my purse. How could it be? There is only one ring, this ring. It's been in the Roston family for generations. It was brought here by a Roston early in the 18th century. And it has always belonged to the oldest child in each family. In which case it would be your daughter's, since you are a Roston by marriage. Yes, that would be so if it were true. Uh, You're not going to tell them. Well, why not? It's time that silly cloud you've been hiding behind was blown away. Don't, Mother, please, I beg you, don't. Nonsense. I am a Roston. That ring belongs to me. Helena's father died in the Southeast Asian War. Shot down even before he knew I was going to have a child. Mother, I hate you for this. I hate you. Helena, don't say that to your own mother. Why not? She's hated me ever since she learned that her father and I had never married. Imagine that in this day. A girl making such a fuss about legitimacy. Stop it, Mother, please. We don't have to hear any more, Mrs. Oh, Austin. yes, yes, you do. George, can't we get out of here quickly? You can go whenever you like, Miss Thornton. But out of your friendship for Helena, you must take that ring with you. No, I couldn't. I won't let her give it to me. Helena, what are you doing? The ring, she tore it out of my hand. I've got it and no one will ever get it from me. Let her go. She'll be back. And with the ring, she knows it's wrong for her to have taken it. Eventually, the ring must come to you, Laurie. We don't want it. But it will come to you. It can do you no harm. It's a silly superstition, but only Rostens is supposed to be vulnerable to the ring. And, Laurie, if you are Helena's friend, as you say you are, you will take it. But she wants it. She insists that it stay hers. Only as an excuse. But what sort of an excuse could the ring give her? The excuse not to marry. And why not? She considers herself fated, ill-starred, if you will. You see, at one time, the superstition arose that if the firstborn was female, the ring would prevent her from marrying. It's high time that ring is out of Roston hands. Why don't you just throw it away? What, with Helena carrying on as if possessed? Well, we just do not want it. I'm sorry, but we must get back to the city. Uh, Yes, it's a long drive, and we'd like to make it before dark. I regret this has turned out to be so unpleasant, but then perhaps it couldn't have been avoided. 
Perhaps. But it's over now. George, let's go. Oh, I can't get away fast enough. I don't know what the speed limit is here, but whatever it is, we'll break it. Helena, I order you to come out of your room at once. At once. Mother, don't hurt her. She is my only friend. The only friend I have in the whole world. Run from the ring. Run for your life. But without a ring, what's a husband or wife? We'll return shortly with Act Three. Let us try and penetrate the shrouding darkness of the final act of A Ring of Roses. Laurie and George have been plunged into a strange, unreal experience. As the twilight lowers over the countryside, they are fleeing from the Rostons, the malevolent nursery rhyme, the flashing axe, the avenging curse, the fatal ring. What can flight outrace those forces of evil? That woman at Mrs. Rostin, she's monstrous. Oh, I'm so sorry for Helena. Yeah, well, I didn't see any halos around her head either. Yeah, but just imagine having to live with that mother. Why does she have to tell Helena that she and her father never married? Do you believe it? Well, why would she lie about something that important? Maybe out of just plain malice. Or or what? It just occurred to me. Couldn't she have invented that story about the curse the ring puts on firstborn Roston girls? Well, to what end? Simple. It'd be a guarantee that she'd never be alone. That she could hold on to her daughter for life. Like the woodcutter. Oh, don't remind me of him. Anyway, I can't see how the ring and whatever it's supposed to do fits. Well, if she made up the business about fate keeping her from marrying Helena's father, now wouldn't that be a kind of evidence, proof for Helena that the curse was real? Well, then why would she give us the ring? Well, I'm only guessing, but couldn't it have been Mrs. Roston's way of telling her daughter that she wouldn't marry even if the ring was off the premises, so to speak? But, George, whatever we think of Mrs. Roston, she's still a mother. And what mother would sentence her daughter to a lifetime of misery? Huh? Look, I'm sorry I got you into this mess. I didn't dream it would be that horrible. Well, you had no way of knowing. Well, looking back, I should have. Helena, always so strange, so withdrawn, so mysterious about herself, her home, and, and her mother. It should have been a warning. Honey, let's find a happier subject. Such as? Well, let's see. Uh, okay, it's not original, but it'll do. For instance, if and when we have our first baby, would you want a boy or a girl? Oh, don't be corny. Why not? Corn is fine as long as it's... George! A... George, isn't there someone in the road? Where? Well, look, straight ahead. Oh, yeah, that's a woman. Uh... Well, we're not stopping for man or beast or any mixture of the two. Here, that should get her off the road. Because if it doesn't, then she may be another bit of PSP and we can drive right through her. Darling, slow down. She's waving at us. George, slow down! No way. If that's a living body and it wants to stay that way, she'll get off the road. Oh, please. She isn't moving from the middle of the road. Damn her teeth, whoever she is. George, George, you're going to hit her. Uh, Laurie, you all right? Yeah, I think so. That stupid woman. It's Helena. Yeah. Well, just wave goodbye and we'll get going. Lori, Lori, please, I must speak to you. Tell her you'll phone her on Halloween. Hey, wait, Lori, don't lower the window. Well, she's in trouble. Better her than you. There can't be any danger in finding out what she wants. Haven't you been through enough? Helena, we're in a hurry. Telephone Lori tomorrow. No, don't go, please. Let me explain. George, wait I a, don't have the heart wait a minute. to... Is, are you sure that's Helena? Well, of course. Her face, it, 
It looks so strange. Well, what's strange about her face? Look at her eyes. They're, they're washed out. They're sunken as if... As if she's taken some kind of drug. That's probably because she's been crying. I'm lowering the window. And you're also raising my temper. Well, what do you want me to do? Just wave goodbye and we'll get going. Oh, she's gone to the front of the car now, George. Oh, she does look dreadful. Why not? She is dreadful. I've got to find out what she wants. Just one minute. Let me talk to her for just only one minute. Okay. Sixty seconds. But don't lower the window more than an inch. Helena? Helena, over here. Now, what is it? Oh, thank you, Laurie. If you only knew how miserable I am about what happened today. It was all my fault. You don't have to apologize. It wasn't anybody's Uh, fault. Mother had only the best intentions in giving you the ring. Sure she did. Nothing like unloading something on a couple of strangers that isn't yours to give away. But the ring does belong to her mother. Only to be given to her child, which excludes you. Well, that's true, but you see, after me, there won't be any Rostons. But you will marry Helena. Just wait and see. <gasps> I doubt it. And even if I did, my children won't be Rostons. Helena, this has been the weirdest day in my life. Now, frankly, the sooner we get away from here, the better off we'll feel. Just one more thing. Prove to me that you are still my friend and... Please, take the ring. No, Helena. Thank you, but I couldn't. Absolutely not. Helena, why don't you just throw that ring away somewhere? I can't. I'm not allowed to. It has to be given to a Roston or... or to the person closest and dearest to me. But how could you expect me to take it? Every time I'd look at it, I would remember that terrible scene in the woods. I swear, the ring has nothing to do with what happened out there. It never has before. This is the first time. And it'll be the last for us. Okay, Helena, stand away from the car. I'm backing up. Laurie, if you don't take the ring, I'll die. I know I'll die. You won't die, Helena. Why should you? Because it will mean that I've lost my only friend and that I'll have no one to turn to and I'll be stuck here in this prison with my mother. And she'll never let me go. Never. So long, Helena. If I return to the house with the ring, my mother will do something terrible. If you don't take the ring, I'll throw myself in front of the car. I don't care anymore. I don't care. (laughs) Helena, give me the ring. Oh, you mean you will take it? Oh, Laurie, you've made me so happy. I'm indebted to you forever. Forever. You're angry with me, George, aren't you? No. I'll probably never see her again. And if it meant that much to her... What probably meant even more to her was that she could twist and bend you in any way she wanted. Well, in a way, it was her last hope of getting out of that house. That's why I finally took the ring. Actually, what harm could it do? I don't know, Laurie, except that anything connected with the Rostons seems dangerous. That's because the Rostons are difficult to understand or explain. Well, that may be. But while we might never get to the bottom of that axe job in the woods, there must be a key somewhere to the Rostons. After all, they're not ghosts or optical illusions. They're people, living, breathing humans. Still, for all we know about them, they're just as haunted as that phantom woodcutter and his crazy daughter. Let's stop talking about them. I will. If you do me an important favor. If I can. You can. Throw that ring away. You mean now? Right this second. Open the window and throw it out. But why? Honey, I consider it a special favor to me if you got rid of that ring. Well, I have no intention of keeping it. But I I don't want to just throw it away. What do you want to do with it? Give it away. To whom? I haven't thought yet. Try thinking about it right now. You sound as if you're ordering me to do it. Actually, I'm begging you, Laurie, begging you to get rid of the damn ring. I said I would. But when? When I find someone to give it to. Someone who would appreciate it. It just doesn't make sense to just throw away something that's probably valuable for just anyone to find or... To have it crushed under a car. Uh, 
Say, I know what I could do with it. Drop it, Laurie. It's only going to get us into an argument. No, I'm serious, honestly. I just thought of where this ring could do the most good. Fine, you do what you want with it, but let's not talk about it. Oh, you'll agree. I bet you will. Oh, honey, do you realize that since we've known each other, we've never had so many disagreements? But I'm not disagreeing with you. Good, then let's change the subject. Or better still, let's let's let everything take a rest. If that's what you want, fine. Laurie, what are you doing? Nothing. Laurie, what are you doing with that ring? Nothing, I said. Besides, you don't want to talk about it. Why are you wearing it? I was playing with it. I just wanted to see if it fit. Will you please take it off? What are you getting so excited about? That ring. If you can't throw it away, at least put it away. You're getting awfully bossy, Joe. You're doing it only to get a rise out of me. You can forget about it. Because I'm going to give it to that thrift shop around the corner from where I live. Great idea. Now please take it off. All right. Anything for some peace. <sighs> hey, that's funny. What is? <sighs> the ring's stuck. I, I'll get it off. You shouldn't have put it on if it was too small. But it wasn't. In fact, it felt too big. Isn't that strange? I I can't even twist it. Get the flashlight out of the glove compartment. Now turn it on and hold your finger under the light. There, can you see it? Your finger doesn't look swollen. No. It isn't swollen. But the ring won't budge. George? George, do you hear something? Hear what? That voice. The singing. Don't you hear it? No, I don't. Wait. Yes, I do. It's that song. Where's it coming from? I don't know. It seems to be surrounding us. I'll turn the bright lights on. You keep trying to get that ring off. Um, I am trying, but it's as if it's cemented to my finger. And that singing. It's the same as the girls in the forest. Get rid of the flash and give me your hand. What for? Maybe I can get it off. Well, you can't. You're trying. There's no traffic, Laurie. I can manage the wheel with one hand. Why don't we wait till we get to a gas station? Then I can get it off with a little soap. Come on, give me your hand. All right. No, wait. I can't. Why not? Oh, I just can't, George. Lori, you're about to drive me out of my head. Why can't you give me your hand? Because, because I remembered something. What, for heaven's sake, what, Lori? Well, what Helena said back there when, when she wanted me to take the ring. She said a lot of hysterical things. That if she couldn't give the ring to a Rostin, it would have to be to a person nearest and dearest to her. Oh, Helena's all whacked up. Now give me your hand, Lori. But what if it's true? Oh, that voice, that terrible voice. Why doesn't it stop? Lori, please give me your hand. No, because if you can get it off, then you'll be stuck with it. Who cares? I don't want anything to happen to you. Not for anything. <gasps> George, George, look straight ahead. Oh, It's no. them, the two of them, the old man and the girl. He's got an axe. I'm stopping the car. No, don't. Go around them. Throw them. Throw them down. Kill them. Do anything, the brakes George. aren't working. George, we're practically on top of Lauren, them. for the last time, give me your hand. The ring can't harm us. No! <laughs> Laurie, are you all right? It was a tree we hit. Only, only a tree, Laurie. You hear me? It's only a tree. <sighs> Laurie, the ring. The ring. What did you do? It's not on your finger. Your finger. It... Good 
Lord. She's dead. So you gave Laurie the ring, Helena. Yes, Mother. As you told me to. Now give me the box. And we'll see if the ring has worked wonders once more. Here is the box. The one with the roses. Open it. Yes, Mother. But the music. Why isn't the music playing? It's a good sign that it's not playing. It's the sign that the ring has done its work. Your friend Laurie will not marry ever. Not ever. But the ring, Mother. Where is the ring? You'll find it in the woods. In the clearing. In the same place where I killed your great-grandfather 143 years ago. Go and bring back the ring. It will keep us alive forever. Forever. Forever, you ghosts. Forever, you sing. But your death is as forever as your grim, rosy ring. I'll be back shortly. Let us end our tale of ring a ring of roses. For as we also know, roses are red, roses are blue. But the rose of death is meant for who? Our cast included Glynis O'Connor, George Petrie, Sidney Walker, Elspeth Eric, Holland Taylor, and Carol Hilliard. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Car care expert Linda Clark joins us next hour and on. It's half past eight. Saturday Night Theatre. Abteilung! Halt! Wir hatten euch gewarnt. Jeder Widerstand ist rechtswidrig. Wir werden euch jetzt mal zeigen, was Vergeltungsmaßnahmen sind. Maintenant, vous comprenez. Ihr seid verantwortlich. Ihr alle seid verantwortlich. Feldfebel. Jetzt. The Rose Garden by Nick McCarty, with Nigel Anthony as Tony Parker and Arnold Peters as Alan Bryant. The Rose Garden. Well, I ran out of sausages, Tony. I'll live. What did you eat this morning? You know what I ate this morning. Yes, a glass of scotch. Well, it's not every day you get a letter from your wife saying divorce is okay by her. GMT for you, Jill. Scotch for you, Tony. No sausages, they've run out. Yes, I know, thanks. Cheers. Well, cheers. Here's to a happy divorce, Tony. Drink up. Cheers. Mm. Uh, what are you planning to do, Tony, now? Uh, I don't know. Work's thin. Can't seem to place the features I used to. Uh, looking for uh, something uh, juicy? Not what you mean by that, George, no. <laughs> I could use a good story, something strong. 
Jacko Peters on the Star told me he'd be interested. It's, uh, it's just finding the right one. And if you don't? Now, you know what my bank balance looks like, love. A disaster area. Hmm. <sighs> you, uh, are serious about wanting a story? Very, yes. Why? Oh, I've got something might interest you, old lad. Yeah? I was down at the Escapers Club the other oh, night. Oh, no, hold on, George. Not another war story. We've had enough of them, surely to God. How old are you? Now, don't give me that old line, George. I was in it, and you have a lot to be grateful for. You young men don't know what it's all about. Hear one story, you've heard them all. Oh, Tony, love. That sounds a bit chilly from you. That's true. The fact of life. You want to hear it? Could we stop you? We were talking the way you do. Anyway, I'd been shot down on a raid. Whole fusillade shot off and me winding the gun turret to the back. Winding like mad to make a big enough gap to get me and my trusty shoot through. Damned uncomfortable feeling, I can tell you. We were miles off course by this time. The rest had had it. Anyway, down I float, sweet as a bird. Pitch up at a farmhouse. And off we go on a cross country, down one of those escape lines you lads are so fond of writing about. Speak for yourself, George. I'll ignore that. Well, one of the villages I went through is in the south. Nice place. A small town, really. Anyway, and this is the point. Oh, good. A chap I knew still lives there. Was a member of the Marquis group in the area. So? He's English. He stayed on. Is that so unusual? I mean, oh, it plenty. happens, yes. Now, what's his name? Ah, you're interested, see? <laughs> we didn't exactly swap names in those days, old son. Security. Mm. The RAF Escapers Club might help you, if it interests you. No, uh, it's a so what story, George. There's nothing there. No? I wouldn't buy it, no. Six months ago... An English journalist was found in his burned-out car in the south of France. Remember? Yes. Yes. He was working for an agency. Well, he was found in the same village. The village where the Marquis was strong. The village I came through. The village in which this Englishman still lives. Well? Well, what? Suppose he was on to something. Something somebody else didn't want brought out in the open. It would make a story, wouldn't it? Well, perhaps. And you speak the lingo, old boy, don't you? You could ferret about a bit. Anyway, the change would do you good, even if there was nothing in it. Yeah. Maybe it would. Now, thanks, George. I'll think about it. Bert! Bert! Oh, you'll have to stop smoking those, Bert. <laughs> I've got a happy pleasure, Tony. Oh. And you find what you wanted. Yeah, uh, this para here, uh, I'd like a copy. Plus any follow-up in the next few days' editions. Can you fix that, mate? Alfred Porter. A British journalist found in his car in the forest near... Well, it's nearly a year ago, Tony. Yeah, but can you do it? By 11. I've got an appointment with God, then. OK? OK. <laughs> Oh, it's you. Oh, no, there's no need to look so disapproving. I've got an appointment. I know. I nearly took the morning off. Oh, you're a charming woman. Did anyone tell you? Is he in? Well, he's expecting you. Mm. My coffee black with cream, OK? Oh. It's a chance, Jacko. It's what I'm good at. Digging up facts, putting them together, making sense. You know that. But he's been dead six months, Tony. Uh, More. And the police reports say accident. Car caught, a foot trapped. Well, doesn't look much. Yes, but what was he looking for? Did you find that out? Well, yes, I did. Well? You're right. He'd had a whisper about something during the war. Ah. I don't know what. Oh, it could have been a genuine accident, Tony. Yes, but it just might not have been. Am I on? You need the job, Tony? Well, I want to go away from here, yes. Personal reasons? The usual reason? Uh, you could say that, yes. <laughs> you never learn, do you? All right, you're on. You get the story down there and I'll certainly print. It's always niggled me, that. 
Don't like the idea of someone suppressing information. And someone apparently might be. So, on your way. He commissioned it? Yes. So, a fat fee? Uh, something. Expenses cut to the bone. <laughs> That's not why you won't let me come with you. No. Why not? You want to know? You really want to know? Yes. How long have you been living here? Five months. Oh, you counted. Right, well, hear this. My wife's willing to get a divorce. I'm free now, or I'm going to be. No liabilities. I like the feeling. Do you get the idea? You mean... I mean, I'm sick of permanence. I'm sucked dry. Loyalty, allegiances, get in the way. Including me? If you like. Do you think I'm going to sit around waiting for you to come back? Knitting? I don't care. Sorry, but I don't care. Oh, go to hell! Name's Parker. I have a reservation. Ah, yes, Monsieur Parker. Uh, room number 23. <laughs> Don't have many guests at the moment, Monsieur. It's the wrong season for us. Uh, well, you'll be glad I've come, then. Pardon? Oh, yes. <laughs> I'll uh, send someone for your things. No, no, I'll manage. Um, I wonder if you could help me, though. Naturally. There's an Englishman who lives around here, has lived here since the war. English, Monsieur? Yes, English. Oh, Hey, sorry, monsieur. You don't know him? I don't know him, no, I'm sorry. I can't help you. Good afternoon. Afternoon. Yes, monsieur. I was looking for monsieur Bouchard. Yes? I had some business with him. I see. Well, can you tell me where I can find him? It depends, monsieur. Well, does it indeed? On what your business might be. Well, I'm a journalist. From England. Your name? Your paper? Parker. Tony Parker. Freelance. And how can Monsieur Bouchard help you? Well, I'll tell him that, shall I? As you wish. Please come into the office. It's a little noisy here, I'm afraid. Please sit down. Monsieur Bouchard? <laughs> Please forgive me. So many people come, ask questions, want to look around, bore me with their stories, you know. I see. Only a small business here, local paper, once a week. Nothing much in the way of staff, as you can see. Uh, They're attracted, for some reason, to the bright lights of Nice, or even Paris. The young. Well, uh, what can I do for you? Well, I don't know exactly. Mm -hmm. I have the beginnings of a story. A friend of mine, well, an acquaintance, rather, was... Through here during the war, his plane was shot down. He told me he was helped by the Marquis. Well, that's not so unusual, Mr. Parker. You want to contact the old Marquis group? Well, not exactly. Could you help me if I did? Unfortunately, I was in North Africa at the time. My father had the paper. What could he remember? Uh, he's been dead many years. Shot. Oh, sorry. I don't wish to tell you your job, monsieur, but surely these stories are a commonplace of war? Perhaps they are, but uh, it, it's not that story that interests me so much as the Englishman who is still here, the Englishman who was in the group. An Englishman? I don't think so. Yes, I checked. The Escapers Club records do show a man called Bryant as having operated in this area for some time. He was last heard of here. And they said he was still here? In this village? Well, not exactly. They'd lost touch, but they were sure he'd stayed on here after the war. Monsieur... <laughs> yeah. The war ended 30 years ago. Yes, I know. So, the name Bryant means nothing to you? Oh, I'm afraid not. Mm. I see. Well, there is another angle. Alfred Porter. I'm sorry? Alfred Porter. He was an English journalist. Uh, died here. His car was burned out, remember? Ah, yes, of course. But that was last year. I mean, surely an accident of that sort has no news value now. It wouldn't have to me. No, perhaps not. I just thought he might have come to see you, told, he, told you what he was on to, asked for your help, like I did. No, monsieur, no, he didn't. No. 
Well, we reported the accident, of course, but I didn't meet Porter. I have no idea why he was here. Well, apparently he was interested in something that happened here during the war. Something to do with the Marquis, perhaps. I don't know exactly what. Funny he didn't ask your advice. Yes, I agree it is, Trent, but he didn't. No, I'm sorry, monsieur. I'm not being much help to you, am I? No, I know nothing of this man, um, Brian, uh, nor of the journalist. Oh, well, I'll ask around. Rather a lot hangs on this one. Still, thanks for your time. I'm sorry I couldn't tell you more. Perhaps if you'd care to eat with me one evening, we could talk again. I generally take dinner at the Café de Chat in the um, Place de la Paille. Your hotel is on the corner. Yes, I think I know what you mean. Uh, how the hell do you know where I'm staying? Oh, <laughs> I'm a newspaper man too, monsieur, and this is a very small town. Yes, it is. And yet you didn't meet Alf Porter. Alas, no. But perhaps I can be of some help after all. The... The policeman in charge of the accident investigation, I seem to remember, was Monsieur Lebrun, Inspector Lebrun. I'm sure he would talk to you. Would he? Oh, well, that's something. Thanks. Bye for now, then. I'll be in terms with you. Hello? This is um, Monsieur Bouchard. I wish to speak to Inspector Lebrun. Yes, it is urgent. Good of you to spare me the time, Inspector. My pleasure, Monsieur. Hmm. Alfred Porter. A thin file, as you see, Monsieur. It was a miserable business, a most unpleasant way to die. Yeah. Yes. Oh, interesting only for our medical people. Forensics. I've been drinking heavily. They knew that much from the contents of the stomach. I won't go into the medical details. They're not for anyone except the connoisseurs of violence. It was undoubtedly an accident. The car was found below the road, over the edge against a tree. The petrol tank in the front took the first impact. Boom. You understand? Yeah, sure. You know why I was here? I don't think I remember. He was here in his professional capacity. Oh, yes. Yes, he was. Well, I can't help you. Sorry. The findings of the investigation are clear enough. There's nothing else for me to tell you. I see. Uh, monsieur, I understand you're also asking questions about certain other people. The Marquis, yes. It's not a very good idea... During the occupation, many things happened here. I don't tell you not to ask, of course. But it isn't so wise sometimes to turn over old stones, you know. And Mr. Bryant? Has a right to peace and quiet. Oh, he exists then, does he? It would be very much better if you accepted that some things are not going to be open to you and that you went home to London. Are you going to make me? You see, you misinterpret me so easily, and you speak French so well. We are having a friendly meeting. That's all, I hope. Right. Thanks for your time. Good day. <clears throat> Can I help you, Monsieur Parker? You know my name, Father. A stranger in our small community soon becomes notorious. Gossip, my son, gossip. Oh, I see. And I was looking for something. Among the graves? What can you find to interest an Englishman amongst them? A name, perhaps. A friend, a relative? Well, I did notice one thing. Something surprising, in a way. Yes? On the far side of the churchyard, a number of headstones with the same date. June 1944. Sixty of them. Yes. It seemed curious. Have you seen our church, Mr. Parker? Are you a Catholic? No, I'm a writer. Is that a faith or perhaps a threat? Mm -hmm. Neither. You will see that it's very old in part. Uh, did you find the person you were looking for outside? Bryant. Alan Bryant. Why did you think he was dead? No. Uh, it was a possibility, that's all. Why? Uh, I've spent two days being told he doesn't exist. I thought perhaps he didn't. I see. 
We are very quiet here, unused to bustling city ways. Those who would find those ways go to Paris or Nice and leave us in our backwater. We are all happy. Yes. And at peace. Yes. Are you suggesting that I should go away? The policeman suggested it might be wiser. Please, look at the screen. It's a particularly interesting piece. Hmm? Carved by one man, a local man. The only example of his work except the, the pulpit here. Oh, unique. We're lucky to have them. Look, if I ask you a question, will you answer it directly? We will have to see, my son. Is Mr. Bryant living here? Near here? Why do you ask? Curiosity? Perhaps. Killed the cat. Did it kill Alf Porter as well, Father? Monsieur, let me explain something. If you ask for any man here, people would deny he existed. Why? What are they hiding? Nothing, perhaps, but the man you ask for might have. It is up to him to say he will see a stranger. You might be unwelcome. Perhaps you're a policeman or a taxman. <laughs> Who can tell? Will you tell me where Bryant is? You will have to wait with patience, I'm afraid. Thank you for your time, Father. It's an interesting church, I believe. Mr. Parker, people here went through many things. Almost no one was spared some loss, some involvement. You? I was here, yes. You must understand that perhaps we have simple reasons for our secrets. I will pray for you. Check. Yes. Yes. Ah. Mate. <laughs> well, uh, I congratulate you. You played well. Your mind wasn't on the game, Alan, was it? Not entirely. Is that unsporting of me? Not at all, not at all. This young man is a tenacious one. You know, Bush, uh, I'm almost inclined to see him. No. Um, would you like me to ask Lebrun to bring some official pressure? Any regularity with the papers, something of that sort? Uh, it's so much trouble. Perhaps he will go away. Let it be. Mademoiselle! Mademoiselle! Monsieur! No talking in the library, please. I thought I asked you for all the newspaper files for June 1944. I gave them to you, monsieur. Some of them. There are some days missing. See? For the 16th, 17th, 18th and 21st. Nothing. Where are they? I don't know. Well, then you can check. Please. And while you do that, find me the papers for September last year. All of them. Very well. It's a mystery, monsieur. I'm sorry. We have none of those early papers anywhere. And those for last September have gone to be rebound. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, it's getting too dark to see the hoop seller. Shall we join your father? Is he still talking to Bouchard? I don't like that man, Mama. I'm sorry you feel so strongly, darling. I'm sorry, Mama. I'm on edge. The weather, perhaps? Your grandmother could always foretell a storm. <laughs> no, it's true. Poor mother. She put a garden fork through her foot as a child in England. Whenever there was to be rain, it ached. <laughs> her penitential pain, she used to call it. What's the matter with me, Mama? Matter? Oh, don't be a silly goose. Pour me a drink. I'm bored. Bored stiff. Yes, dear. I am. I want to go away, Mama. Yes, dear. I'm 22. I've lived here all my life. No one comes to see us, not really. Old men come, Bouchard, the priest. Other people are discouraged if they come. You don't want them. He doesn't either. But who am I supposed to make friends with, talk to, discuss things with? Who? You've said it before, Ella. You've made up your mind to go before. Nothing ever happens here. 
I want to see him, Bouchard. It's stupid, Alan. No, I want to see him. I don't want it happening again. I want to see him. It's going to do no harm. We all learned discretion a long time ago in a hard school, didn't we? You think you can persuade him? Mm -hmm. Perhaps. It's worth a small effort on my part, isn't it? Perhaps. We see too little of you. Now we are old men, not company for such ladies. Oh. Ella, drive carefully. Boucher, thank you for the game. I'll beat you next time. I'll work hard and make you work harder. And your mind will be on it while mine will be thinking about the dinner Mary is making for us. <laughs> My dear, many, many thanks for an exquisite oh, meal. Pleasure. That veal, I am speechless. <laughs> You're a lucky man, Alan, to live here surrounded by roses, two fine women, and such food. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, Boucher. Uh, Good night. Um, you, uh, will excuse me if I um, seem impertinent, Ella, but you seemed a little distrait this evening. Perhaps. I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to... I'm an old friend, and I thought... Of my father's. I don't have friends. We're too cut off, remote. Do you know why that should be? I'm not his confessor, my dear. How old are you? You know very well how old I am. And you find it hard to live with him. He is hard to be close to. He always has been. He talks. Sometimes. To me. But he and Mama, they are remote, shut off. No matter. You may leave me here. I'll walk now. Oh, if you're sure. Uh, my leg will stand that much exercise, I think. You don't like me, do you? Whenever you have been, my father retreats, pulls down the shutters. Your father has seen a great deal, experienced a great deal, been responsible for many things. He feels responsible for many more. Nothing in the open. By choice. His? Yours? Whose? It's impossible to live. I feel so cramped, stifled by it. I walked to the end of the drive this morning for the post. Nothing moved. The air was heavy, threatening almost. There wasn't a bird nor a blade of grass moving. The flat silver leaves of the olives, like armour. The trees crushed, twisted by age. Oh, I'm so bored with it. <laughs> Isn't it silly? I want to break out of it. Then do so. You are of age. Go to Paris, calm, where the young all seem to go. London. I've been nowhere, know nothing about anything. No. Well, <clears throat> good night. Monsieur Bouchard? Joseph? Um, father? <laughs> you still find it hard? Yes, yes, I do. How is he? He's restless, concerned about Ella. She is straining at the leash, wants to spread her wings. Well? I don't know. Get some intolerable burden. Not so much for me. For Alan, it becomes harder. Yes, he's eaten up by it. He wants to see the young man, the journalist. Impossible. I'm not sure. Impossible. Alan's very wrought up, strung like so much piano wire. He needs to unloose some of it. And the girl? Will know nothing, naturally. She's a beautiful girl. You remember these things, then? I may be a priest, Pierre, but I am also a man. Of course I see these things. It's a miracle. That's certain. What is? Joseph the priest. <laughs> a miracle. <laughs> I mean, aren't you um, sometimes jealous? Envious? Sometimes, of course. You think I sometimes don't regret? It's done. Over. A vow taken. We all pay our price, my son. So you've seen the young men, and you don't want them to meet? No. I think, in a way, Alan is... You see, Ella is his only concern. She meets no one. Up there in the house, the atmosphere is destructive. They feed on each other. He wants her to go. 
Or perhaps that young man. Ah, I see. Yes, yes. Bait. So? It's ironic, that's all. Yes. Isn't it? He is loyal. Why should he have stayed? Ah, my son, that's a question to ask a priest. Loyalty is a ticklish virtue. For you? Now? I am loyal to my cloth, to my beliefs, as you are. Ah, yes. I'm sorry only that you do not believe what I believe. Oh, you would do well to be glad, Father, or you'd find yourself hearing a confession absolving a sin that you'd find hard to absolve. Yes. I knew you before, Joseph, didn't I? Hmm? A young ram, a drinker. I know women in this place who come to confession for other reasons than those imposed upon them by their faith in God. The sins of a young man? You told that against me? Oh, I am a man. I was once a young man. Things change. Yeah. Uh, all right, then I will arrange for Alan and this writer to meet. I will talk with Alan later. Say a prayer for me, Father. Ah, you see. You hedge your belief between God and Marx. Isn't it always the same? Perhaps you should say a prayer for Alan. Good night. If he talks, he must only talk so much. I don't want him with that man. In confession, I can shut his mouth. But to shout from the rooftops to some scribbler, no. Parker's suspicious about the journalist who died before. Lebra told me they went through the file. Then he shall not speak to Alan. Let it rest there. It's for the best. God be with you. Daddy? Daddy? Hmm? It's so hot, even the frogs are quiet. <laughs> you took him home? He walked from the square to Father Joseph's house. He wants to walk, he said. I see. It'll rain very soon. Thank God. It'll be good for the roses. That's something. You want to go away, Ella? I think I do. To what? The bright lights? I don't know. London, perhaps. Mama was talking to me this afternoon about Sternwood. Home. Home? Home for her is here. Her father brought her here. Her first husband was French. Well, she's been here almost the whole of her life. How did you get on with Bouchard? Oh. You know what I think about him. Oh, he takes an interest in you, Ella, your godfather. Oh, <laughs> that's an irony, isn't it? A Marxist fellow traveller bets in both camps. <laughs> Did he tell you there is a young man in town looking for me? A young man from London? No. He doesn't want me to see him. Why not? Do you really want to leave here, Ella? Yes. Yes, I, I think I... You need, what, a push? I think so, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm not very, you know... Yes, yes, I know. No, I want you to do something for me tomorrow, hmm? Now, good night, Ella. Night, Sleep darling. well. Don't worry. The rain will come soon. Bottle. I'm tired. Certainly, Monsieur. Uh, excuse me. Huh? Mr. Parker. I might be, yes. Um, I have to meet you. You met me, sir. Wouldn't you buy me a small drink? Well, I'm not in the mood, thanks all the same. Oh, no, no, no. I don't think you understand. I, I have something to tell you. Yes. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. Would you like some brandy? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> another glass, please. Monsieur. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be rude. It's just that everyone in this place knows my name. I've been here almost no time at all, and everyone from the newspaper man to the priest knows my name. My name is Ella, Mr. Parker. Tony. <laughs> um, why are you here, Tony? It's not the time for tourists. Oh, don't tell me you don't know that. Everyone else seems to. Oh, I'm not about so very much, you see. Have you had dinner? No. Then would you like to? 
The food here isn't bad. Thank you. Thank you. All right? Mm, thank you. Delicious. Ah, good. Now, sing for your supper. Tell me who, what, and why. I don't understand. You said you had something to tell me. What is it? Are you going to warn me off, too? You know what I'm doing here. Everybody else does. Who sent you? I only know that you're a writer. And that I'm digging into the past, the war, to be accurate, and incidentally into the death of a colleague of mine, a journalist called Alf Porter. He died here about nine months ago. That was an accident, wasn't it? Perhaps. Oh, and I'm looking for another man, an Englishman. He has a story that's connected, I think. His name? Well, it hardly matters. No one knows him, or they pretend not to know him. There's a sort of conspiracy of silence, a sort of protection that I don't understand. What is his name? Bryant, Alan Bryant. He's my father. Everyone has tried so hard to keep him hidden. He wanted me to see you, to find out uh, certain things. And what? Well, if you were a serious young man or a sensation monger, the other man was... Oh, no matter. Oh, you met him? No, never. My father did once. He forced himself into our house. Oh, it wasn't pleasant, you see. And he died? Yes. An accident. Mm. I've seen the reports. Inspector LeBron showed me the reports. It was not very nice reading. Oh, I'm very tired, Tony. I'll have to go home. Oh, of course. To report. Oh, please. It hasn't been like... like... Well, I've enjoyed my evening. Will I see you again? You'll have to find your way, Tony. I'll give you directions, if you dare. Dare? To meet my father. He's a sad man. Sad. Good of you to tell us, Le Brown. We have our uses, father. I think we have to agree, eh, Bouchard? Now, can we get to the business? He saw the girl. Harmless, beautiful. Mm, I accept your point. Why? Did Alan send her? Why? You see him more often than most of us, Bouchard. You're in the best position to answer that. And you, father? You hear him confess? Uh, no. No longer. Marie, yes, but uh, Alan has lapsed badly. The wife, is she under some strain, some problem? Does she mention him? The, the confessional, my son. To hell with the confessional. And there's more at stake here than a single man's soul. Come along. I'm sorry. All right. So we are left to wonder just what he's going to say to that writer. Yes. He did a very great deal for us all here. We must be careful. As he must. Inspector, my son. Remember that. Will you talk to him, Bouchard, at the right time? Hello? Hello? Anyone around? Hello. Oh. <laughs> Hello. I not see you there. Sunbathing? Reading. You found us, then? Well, I'm here. <laughs> yes. Would you like to come and sit in the sun? I could give you a drink. Oh, no, that's more like it. Fresh orange juice. Oh. Oh, it's too hot for anything else, honestly. Well, I believe you. Thanks. Ah. <sighs> Oh, it's a fantastic drive here. Glorious. Is it? Mm. I hardly notice anything, I'm afraid. Ah, oh, the mountains and the, the fields and fields of roses. It really is very beautiful. And artichokes. Artichokes? Yeah, I've never seen such preposterous things. Growing wild. Well, almost wild. <laughs> I suppose one grows used to them, too. Oh, what a shame. I Perhaps wonder if you... <laughs> Sorry, go on, please. No, I was wondering if you'd like to see the roses, our roses, my father's roses. Oh, you cultivate them? He does, yes. For the market in Nice and a few for the perfumery. Not many. And sometimes tourists come and buy. We don't encourage them. No, I'm sure. Shall we go? Ah, uh, you're very lucky. Why? To live here. You don't. Or perhaps you'd change your mind. It's peaceful. Beautiful. Look. Look down the valley across all those flowers down to the sea. Now, what more could anyone want? You don't live here, do you?
do you? Doves. They're very pretty. Yes. And that room is where the work is done. Batching up the flowers, cutting them, freezing them sometimes. The trouble with the work is that nature doesn't wait, you see. So you're forced to work when the roses are ready. Do you work too? Mm -hmm. There used to be more than just the family here. Oh, I see. It was a long time ago now, before the war. Your parents have been here since before the war? My mother has. She was married to a local man before. Uh, he was killed. And then, after the war, the workers didn't want to come back. There was work in the hotel or down on the coast. We paid more. So we all work now, when we have to. Why did your father come back? I don't understand. Well, here, after the war. He didn't come back. He never left. All the time? We don't talk much about it. He doesn't like to talk about that time. Why? I don't know why. Have you asked him? No. It's best not to. Why? You do stop asking questions sometimes, I suppose. Well, I'm intrigued. <laughs> Does he find questions disturbing? Perhaps. Perhaps you should ask him. Ooh, will I have the opportunity? At dinner, yes. Dinner? Ah, I'm invited. Yes, of course. We made up a room for you. I beg your pardon? We made up a room for you. Oh, I have a perfectly good hotel oh, in town. No, no, you don't understand. You're not to stay there. I've got a room. It was cancelled this morning. By who? My father. A cigar, Mr. Parker. Thank you. We'll smoke outside, I think. It's a pleasant evening. Uh, do you play chess? Ah, uh, no, I'm sorry. Ah, oh, you would have made a change to play against someone new. You were going to teach me, Ella. Indeed I was, Ella. I will, sometime. Ella, come along. I want to talk. Oh, later, my dear girl. We'll take our cigars first, hmm? Oh. Ah. Pleasant evening, Mr. Parker. We do well enough here, on our own. You prefer that, Mr. Bryant, to be on your own? Ah, young man, I may prefer a lot of things. For you, perhaps, they would appear a bore. Oh, help yourself to a drink. It's uh, local made. Oh, thank you. A little fiery, I find, but a good drink for all that. I've uh, a question to ask you. Why do I hide away? Oh, no, not that. Ah, huh? you surprise me. Why other people protect you? Ah, yes. And why a man vanished in a car? A journalist like me. Looking for a story? You can see the sea from here, did you know? You'll see it in the morning. Ella takes breakfast here each morning. You could join her. What are you really looking for here? You see a story, a background, what? I want to know the truth. <laughs> you must forgive me, Tony. Uh, may I call you, Tony? You are a very young man, and you are English. You can have no idea of what it was like here. You come here, wide-eyed and apparently innocent, to turn over stones? To find you. To find out about Alfred Porter. To turn over stones. And what would you find under those stones, Tony? Do you have any idea? I will find out, perhaps, why you stayed, why people will protect you. The priest, Bouchard Leblanc. I might even find out why there are gaps in the records of a newspaper in the library for a certain period. Are there? What does it suggest to you, Tony? You think we are connected, the gap in the newspaper and me? Well, are you? There are stones best left unturned. But then why allow me to come here, make me stay? You cancelled my room in the hotel. Well, I assumed you'd prefer to stay here with English people. Ella thought you might like to stay. I see. You wanted to leave England? Oh, I suppose, in a way, yes. May I ask why? No reasons, purely personal reasons. Yeah, I've just divorced my wife, or rather, she sensibly for once in her life divorced me. And I needed the money. Money? For the story. Ah. For the feature I'm commissioned to do about this place, the other journalist. 
Whatever happened here? If anything did. Uh, you like the brandy? Yes. <laughs> Always there is the woman. <laughs> Funny. Not at the time. Hmm? No, we married young. It hadn't worked. It seemed best to go separate ways. And then up popped another, getting her claws in. You understand the situation, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. So you come here to chase moonbeams? I don't follow. A man tells you I'm here. A man, incidentally, I've never heard of. He tells you I am here. You would like to escape. <laughs> Is that too strong a word? <laughs> no. You're as good an excuse as any. But now... I'm intrigued. Why hide? What happened between the 16th and the 21st of June, 1944? Mm, you have been busy. And why cancel my room without asking? Uh, shall we say, because you intrigued us, hmm? and because you are dabbling in the past, in stories, in imaginings. As the other journalist was doing? I... Uh, hmm, perhaps. These stories are not your concern. I'd rather judge that for myself. Yes. By the way, Ella... Yes? She is very young. She's also very restless, attractive. I'm aware of that. She's not very well versed in the world. I think perhaps you understand my drift. I have a general idea. I don't want her to be damaged. She needs to leave here. It's a little... Oh, how can I put it? Claustrophobic for a young girl. The roses, my music, winemaking, the place always the same. Her mother... I won't inflict these things on you. I, I'm sorry. What would you like to do tomorrow? Well, I have no idea. Drive back to the hotel. Think. Drive back? Oh, I'm afraid our car is out of action at the moment. No, I'll take mine. The people at the hotel sent your things up, didn't you know? You've got a bloody nerve. Well, they sent someone from the hire firm, took the car back. <laughs> Seemed a waste of money if you weren't going to use the vehicle. Look, what are you doing? Suggesting you stay for a time. Do I have any choice? No, you don't. I'd like to see what you're made of, perhaps. It'd be foolish to walk back down. People here, as you have observed, protect me. So, make the most of your opportunity. Enjoy the peace and quiet, the fresh air. More brandy? Didn't you sleep well, Tony? What? You're very bad tempered. I'm not bad tempered. But well, don't you like it here? Yesterday you were saying how much you envied us. Peace, quiet, lovely flowers, beautiful views. You can see the sea from here. Did you notice? Oh. Why in heaven's name keep me here? Because I told him I was bored. And he does everything you want? Not exactly. Well, if you're bored, leave. Oh, I'd be a fish out of water. You'd manage. I have these times when I'm bored, depressed. Mama tells me they will always pass, so... You, you live here doing nothing, protected like some princess. Protected by lies, they tell in the town. The lies here. Lies? Evasions, perhaps. No one asks him for his reasons, for the truth about what happened here in the past. If you want to know, ask him. Yes, I will. Long stems, you see. Specially pruned, of course. A matter of experience and care. Yes, I see. The market isn't interested in short stem varieties, nor in exotic colours. Classic blooms are the vogue just now, I'm delighted to say. I see. You uh, arranged that she should come to the hotel to see me? Ella, why not? Bait? You wanted to come? You're here. You can see we're just an ordinary family living quietly in the sun. A remittance man, I think Mr Morm would have said. Do you think about the effect it has on Ella, this life? It would surprise you, I suppose, to know that I share your apparent concern. I can't make her go. She has to make up her own mind, you see. I think I do. You stayed here. Why? 
I married, so I stayed. That priest, uh, dear, what's his name? Father Joseph. Mm. What about him? Well, he said something about turning stones and not knowing what one would find. Suggested even that what one did find might not be acceptable. <laughs> As I did. Everyone, it seems, tells lies, falsifies records, evades questions. Perhaps, Tony, the secret, if there is one, is not for anyone to share. Hmm? Yet you arranged for me to stay. Hmm. I'm intrigued by you, perhaps. And you're not going to tell me anything more? I was shot down in the middle of the war. I was a gunner. I was useful to them, the Marquis. They wanted a gunnery instructor. I stayed. You could have got out? I had no reason to get out. I had no people to go back to in England. I was doing a job here. Dangerous? <laughs> Very, I suppose. How were you recruited? Here, in this house. I was hidden in the dovecot for six weeks. A man came to the dovecot one night, an Englishman apparently, John or something, uh, I never knew. Don't suppose he told me. He checked that I was a gunner. He knew a lot about me by then. Necessary in case I was a German plant. Then he offered me the alternative of going via the Pyrenees on the coward's run, as he called it. Coward's run? Oh, my God. Or staying. Handing over my identity tags, getting rid of the uniform. The Marquis needed instructors. <laughs> they had no idea of safety rules, no idea of what to do with the weapons that were being dropped in. So, I joined. He took the identity discs, buried them, I think. I see. <laughs> You know, the pity of it is that one grows used even to the smell of roses. You've, uh, you've been talking to Alan? He's been talking to me, yes. He has a fair regard for you, then. He rarely talks to anyone these days. By choice? Yes. Well, that's sad. Well, I think that depends very much on what you have to talk about, don't you? Does it? I don't know. Once before the war, my first husband and I went to Crete. Oh, please, do sit down if you want to. Thanks. Good. Anyway, we went to Crete and we stayed in a small village. We had the money to stay as we wished and we wished for some peace and quiet. One morning I woke up to hear a great screaming and shouting outside. A woman sat on the step of her house with a black shawl draped over her head. And she was weeping. And all around her, women were wailing. In the dust, the chickens ran in circles and children were standing astonished. It, well, it, it was an extraordinary scene. And then we learned that her husband had been killed in the mountains, hunting. I see. Oh, wait. You're in too much of a hurry to assume an end. I'm sorry. Well... That night we went into a bar and there were some Athenians there and they were dancing and singing. And at all the tables, the men of the village sat drinking water. Hmm? They were mourning their friend. Oh. My husband, my first husband, John Luke, asked our man from the village why they didn't stop the Athenians and tell them that the village was mourning. The man was astonished and he said... If you'd had a bad day in the fields and the barley wouldn't grow well and you came home and found your wife had new baked bread on the table and that she'd had a good day, would you tell her of your unhappiness and make her unhappy too? Now, do you see? Mm. Must have been difficult here during the war. Oh, if one kept quiet, didn't draw attention... My husband was a member of the local council, quite an important man here, a magistrate and so on, so I, I was untroubled. And your present husband? People regard Alan as, as a sort of mascot, I think. A hero, in a way. It's remarkable, isn't it, that a man such as Alan should have been what he was. It was immeasurably brave to stay as he did. You realise that? Is that why he's protected and hidden? There were other people, surely, as concerned, who lived normal lives openly. There are other reasons. Yes. Ella? Knows nothing. I see. 
Ella is very precious to us, Mr. Parker. To her father, to me. I had a son, you see, by Jean-Luc. He died in the war. Isn't it unhealthy, though, for you to live in the past? We have our work. The roses. What about your daughter? Lives with us here now. Not in our past. Visitors? I don't expect so. I heard a car door slamming. Oh, something from the town, perhaps. Some new plant. At this turn? Perhaps. When I married, I remember how peaceful it was here. Jean-Luc was very different from Alan, of course. I'm not making comparisons. He, he was just different. I could laugh with him. Enjoy being live, I suppose. He was so warm. Kindness itself. We'd time for ourselves. And now? We'd a dozen swallows' nests on the south wall. At least a dozen. Yeah? I used to watch them. Flying, playing, teaching their young to fly. Flying away in the cool, but always returning. Always returning. You're afraid for Ella to go away. Why? There are two swallows' nests on the south wall. Empty. And then Alan came. Yes. All that is dead and buried. Ella may leave you now. With you? You'd persuade her? Perhaps. Oh, don't count on anything, Mr. Parker. Now listen, Father. Listen to me. You're concerned only for the group. You don't give a damn for me. Ah, it's so easy for you. Easy? Yes. You sink into anonymity behind the cloth. Every Sunday you raise the host, absolve us of our sins, and are absolved. Not true. You don't come anymore. You refuse to come to Mass. I think I know your reasons. I don't think so, Joseph. I have some experience in these matters, my son. Now, perhaps. But we're not here to talk of church, priestliness, the trappings of faith, are we? I knew you before. Know you for an ordinary man. Isn't a priest ordinary? Oh, you're playing with words. You want me to shut up, to continue as though I was still a member of the group, still bound to silence. Were you silent? You're being foolish, self-indulgent, Alan. I'm sorry for you. Don't be. I chose to see the journalist. I wanted to see him. Against Bouchard's advice, against mine. Ah, I'm a free agent. There is the matter of responsibility. To you? What what do you feel for me, Alan? I'm not thinking about you now. I'm, I'm sorry for you, truly. You're tired. Yes, I am. We agreed, the three of us agreed, yet you bring him here, talk to him, tell him stories. I have told him nothing that concerns you. It all concerns me, us, my son. Oh, uh, it was such a, such a time ago now. He's persistent. He'll dig up the whole story if you give an inch. You remember the interrogations, those questionings? No. You remember them, Joseph. Yes. He'll talk to Mary. He's already talked to Ella. They'll tell him. How can they? Mary knows only as much as anyone who was here. Ella knows nothing. And you. You're the weak link. In the old days, what would we have done with you? In the forest. You know very well. Don't threaten me. You forget what you are now, Joseph. You're under strain. I know that. We're all strained. And I am guilty. That's what I find intolerable. We are all guilty of something, Alan. I will pray for you. You play well, Tony. Oh, for the beginner. You've played before, I don't believe you. Oh, where I come from, croquet lawns aren't ten a penny, Anna. <laughs> where are you from? Well, originally, Birmingham. And then London. Well, London, I suppose, now. Suppose? Well, things change. I move about. Yeah, it is, I suppose, the only advantage of my work. I'm in and out of London. You have a house there? Well, you're joking. I have a flat. Small, self-contained, on the heath. It's 
pleasant enough. Yes, it must be. I tell you what, you shall see it when you come to London. Oh. Yeah, you come to dinner. I enjoy cooking. Do you mean that? Of course I mean that. Why, I, I thought... I, I mean, I assumed you'd have uh, a wife or something. Uh, your turn, I think. I had a wife, Ella. We parted. Unamicably, I may say. She was a bitch. Sorry. Well, it doesn't matter. So, the flat is not full of wife or mistress or anything, except books and unanswered letters. Bills, mostly. <laughs> well, that's nice. I haven't seen you laugh since I've known you. You're disturbing. You know that. Am I? I don't know very much. I, I'm not your sophisticated London anything. So I'm not very good at getting to know people and men. Uh, I'm shy, I suppose. Frightened. Of what, for heaven's sake? Doing anything. You should leave. Oh, but you see, Tony, the... My father... Well, what, what future do you see? What, what will happen here? I don't know. And what is he hiding from? Do you know that? Do you care? Yes. I care very much. If it was out in the open, spoken about, things might change somehow. So, bring it into the open. Oh, it's easy for you. You come here out of the blue, you see something you feel is wrong, it's, it's easy. But you have to try. It's like playing a new game. You have to go at it. Bull in the china shop. You don't get hurt in a game. You don't hurt other people. You mean your father and mother? Or who else? I don't know. That's the trouble. I think maybe Monsieur Bouchard knows. Was he here during the war? Yes. He told me he was in North Africa. Oh, he was here. I'm certain he was here. Well, does it matter if he's hurt? It matters if anyone is hurt, surely, Tony. You've lived too long in your castle, Ella. Time you woke up. Is it? Oh, I'm suffocated, you see, Tony. It'll pass. It always does, yes. When the heat breaks, when the rains come properly, yes. But this stifling, heavy... Did you know they had rainmakers in some countries? I read it somewhere. Professional rainmakers dancing to bring the rain. Perhaps we should do that. Well, the feather headdresses and bones in our noses. If necessary. <laughs> Someone arrived at the house last night late. No. No, we never have late visitors. I heard a car. Your mother said it might have been someone delivering something. Um, plants. I watched outside. He left about two. Father Joseph. Why? I'm not sure. Would he go back to England, your father? Why should he? If you were to leave, would he then? If, Tony. If it's a big barriers, aren't they? Will you come, Ella? With you? Well, why not? It's a chance. You could see what it's like outside. Yes, you could look. Perhaps. Perhaps I don't want to. Perhaps I'm scared. Is it so very much to go and see? Or is it ugly, cruel, noisy? Yes, it is. But more. If you're with... Oh, you have to make up your own mind. Funny, isn't it? How we pin so much hope on people we don't know. Like having faith in God. I'm not sure I can take that step into the dark now. Please. Think about it. You don't begin to understand, do you? I'm not ambitious. I like the quiet. Perhaps you'll despise me for that. Sometimes I have the desire to look no further than the olive trees at the end of our garden. Why don't you try? Come in. Ah, Ella. You working? Oh, nothing that can't wait. Accounts, bills. What is it? That young man? No. In a way, yes. Why did you make him stay, really? You like him? Yes, I do. Don't you? 
I hadn't thought about likes or dislikes with regard to him. At least he talks to me. No one talks here, really talks. Perhaps it's more comfortable that way. You all just sit and wait for things to happen. If you didn't have your music, this house would be like a grave. Do you know... Well, of course you know. Monsieur Lagrange. Mm. Now, he and his sister have lived in that small farmhouse for 30 years. Alone. Together. Now, since their mother died. Not a word have they passed since that time. I love this place, Ella. When I first came here, long ago... I knew this place would be important to me. After it was all over, I needed the quiet. I, I wasn't well. There'd been considerable strain. Do you understand me? I think I do, yes. Why won't you talk about it, Daddy? Let it out. Jean-Luc, your mother's first husband had been... He was dead. It was the most obvious thing in the world to look after Mary. I had a debt I owed. You married my mother for a debt? Here, nothing needs to be rushed. Time solves all problems. Time and silence and a few lies. Perhaps... You can't tell me that old Lagrange and his sister haven't spoken because they love each other. Perhaps they only hurt each other if they speak. Thirty years, with never a good morning, good day, sleep well. Nothing. Once the barrier is erected, now, who will pull it down? But you and Mama. Aren't... Ella. Ella. There are some things to be wary of. Mary and I live here have lived here with many things. Memories. Bitterness, too. We're not young. We're used to each other. Is that bad? Perhaps our responsibility, one to another, is silence. And the lies? Listen. A glass of good wine is excellent. A second glass is to savour, and a third to taste. It is the fourth glass that destroys the illusions, and the savour, and the taste. And the bottle is so empty that there is no going back. Maybe that's what happened to me and your mother. I have a dream, Daddy. A recurring dream, did you know? And I find you here, in your study, and you're weeping. In this room, alone. Now, Ella... Lulu, no, no, listen. And you're crying about all this. The roses, Mama, and... And I feel it is all a mistake. My dream always makes me want to leave. Hmm. I understand that, Ella. Tony thinks I should go away, too. Does he know you so well? What did he say? Nothing. Nothing at all. He listened to me, that's all. Father? Father? Ella, what a pleasure to see you. Uh, I'd like to talk to you, Father. Mm -hmm. About two things. I see. You wish to come into the church or stay here in the sunshine? Oh, here, please. Very well. If a girl wanted to go away from her parents and not come back for a long time, perhaps never, would that be a terrible sin, Father? Why should any girl do such a thing, Ella? If she had been asked, Father, perhaps she might. If she was driven, she might. Driven? How? Huh. If she knew that her father was unhappy, lonely, and that her mother and he were strangers. I see, my daughter. I, I do see. And where would this girl be going? She doesn't know. Not exactly. A step into the dark? Yes. What was the other question, my daughter? That is a question I asked for someone else. The writer? The journalist? Yes. What is the question? He wants to know why there are 60 gravestones with the same date on them over there. Has he? Well? He shouldn't have sent you. 
Tell him he must ask your father, and warn him he will have no answer. Oh. I I'm sorry. As for your first question, it is natural that a child should leave her parents. It is less natural if she doesn't have an idea where she might be going, but then times have changed. And if that young man is a friend to you, Ella, tell him seriously that he must stop turning stones. Or there might be a viper under one of them. He should go too. Take care, daughter. Now we can irrigate all the roses when they need it. Water can be a problem, you see, Tony. Yeah, I'm sure. I spoke to your daughter last night. So a pump, a length of pipe, and a very deep well. <laughs> problem solved. Did you come to any conclusions? That she should leave, perhaps. That she should take the jump. With you? For herself. Where did you hear about me, did you say? I told you, in a bar in Hampstead. A man was shooting a line about being shot down. Uh, the usual stories. You despise them, the storytellers? They usually remember a shimmering romantic haze. I wonder how much is truth, that's all. Yes. Uh, which pub in Hampstead? The Holly Bush, the Flask? Part of a youth gone somewhere. Shot down, in a way. I remember Suffolk. I was stationed there. There was a pub in the village. I, I don't remember the name of the pub or the village... The girl behind the bar collected badges, wings and cap badges. Oh, there was a beam full of them, and photos all over. They all wrote, to grace with love. Uh, her name, I suppose. Most of them didn't come back. Can't even remember their names now. You know, a man could be in your squadron and you'd know his face, and then they're gone so fast you only knew Tom or Dick or Harry. No more. Do you want to know what interested me? Not at all, no. You must accept, young man, that some men are not intrigued one jot in themselves, or what is intriguing or of interest in them to others. It may be rare in your circles, but it happens to be true. I'm sorry. Uh, you despise us, journalist. I don't care about you. You're the parasites sitting fat on the bodies of our experiences. Nothing more. Is that why one died? He died as a result of an accident. No, he died because he was ferreting about here. And if it were true, aren't you afraid? Just a little bit afraid of what might happen to you? No, not really. Then we are very much more similar than you realise, Tony. I want Ella to go away from here. I will tell you a story. But I cannot promise that you will want to use it, or that you will even be allowed to tell it. I suppose it was six months after I joined the group that a girl was sent to me, Elizabeth. She was in Gestapo headquarters, a secretary. We were causing trouble in our sector, and they'd sent some SS troops, hard men. She was our contact. What had you been doing? Oh, the usual, blowing bridges, trucks, roads. Nothing extraordinary. And Jean-Luc, uh, was he connected? In a way, not overtly. A respectable citizen, well-liked. He even gave a dinner for the German officers on occasion. I see. The girl, Elizabeth, was very gay. She had blonde hair and dark brown eyes, and she was full of laughter. One day she was betrayed, and they raped her to death. Oh, oh yes. They threw her out of their headquarters into the gutter, naked. She lay until night came, because none of the people who knew her dared reclaim her body. My God. I didn't dare go. I walked past her in the night, saw her, couldn't touch her. Her white body broken, the hair lying, still alive in a way, in the gutter. And no one picked her up until late that night in the dark when the moon was gone. Then we learned that the officer in charge, a general he was, was to go through the forest to a village in the north. Who told you? Jean-Luc. Who else? A respectable man, well-liked. He told us. We planned our ambush for the general carefully. I insisted that we did it. Pierre, our leader, was against it. We overruled him. Three men on each side of the road in a drainage ditch, each with two grenades. Three-second fuses. Ah, have you ever tried to shorten a fuse? 
If your hand sweats, it blows your fingers off. Three men on each side, 12 grenades, men at the top and bottom of the incline with machine guns, and a large party afterwards to clear up the mess. The general was sitting in an open car, Mercedes, with a couple of staff men. Oh, I don't know, it was, it was very easy. I'll never forget that man sitting in the Mercedes, looking at the grenade lying at his feet, and trying at the same time to dislodge the grenade that was on the folded tonneau cover of the car. There was very little left of those men. But we'd been trapped, you see. The men in the car were decoys, prisoners, shackled into the cars, forced to ride. In the heavy trucks at the rear of the convoy, a crack unit. Oh, they came at us like, like hot knives through butter. Four of us escaped. One is blind, and the others... The girl, Elizabeth, she didn't talk. She didn't betray us. I wish to God in a way that she had. Who then? Oh, there's more. You're hungry for stories. I will give you more than even you will stomach. We never believed them when they warned us what reprisals they would take. They brought out the children from the school, and they stood them against the wall, and the children were singing. Ask the priest, Father Joseph. He wasn't a priest then. We watched it. We watched them shoot down those children. And they had already killed Elizabeth. Your girl. Mm. You would, I suppose, say that, yes. And the 60 graves in the church. The children. What do you think? Well, no memorial, nothing. For what? Who? People like you to come and gape at, gawp at, rake over? And if we don't, it's forgotten. Is that a good thing? They hide you. Why? Because I organised the ambush. I planned it. I did it without thought of the consequences, and I led them into that trap, and the men were killed, and after them the children too. Because I didn't think. They think I am a hero. Was it your fault? Elizabeth died in that gutter naked. I thought only of her. She was the bait, and I took the bait, as they knew that I would. And the betrayer? Oh, him. <laughs> uh, we set out, those of us who survived, and we killed our man. Spit in the wind. But those children, those men, because... Because I love that girl. I live with that in my skull each day of my life. You want Ella to go with you when you leave? I think so, yes. Hmm. I will be in the garden. Find her, would you? so long since it all happened. No one cares about it, not now. Some do. They must do. They were brave men. Playing games. Were you brave? I felt exhilarated, yes. We're landed with what we have in this world. I miss those men and those women who died. Yet you, people like you, can waste their deaths doesn't matter for you, but each day I watch it. Every waking moment of my life is spent watching what happened in my head. It's no exaggeration. People may forget. I don't. It's locked away. Private. Because even you can't begin to understand what it truly means. I live here, tucked away, quietly out of the eye of the world, because the people here choose to let me. I'd be afraid to leave. Oh, damn. Oh, oh, yes, yes. I have been damaged. Yeah, yes, I admit I am damaged. Here in my rose garden I work. The flowers don't stop being beautiful. Your friends will die. That young man's friends will die, Ella, with white headstones, and they will lie in rows. It helps to remember. Six rows in, four up. 
Charles, mother, father. My friends have no stones. I am alive and working and I hide. Oh, I sometimes ache to forget what I have seen and what is constantly in my skull. I'm afraid of the anger, the despair and the hatred. Well, I'm not unique. I'm not. It's in all men. I remember because, because it is burned there. We took our betrayer and we eviscerated him. So much awful. Uh, you dismiss it as meaningless. Oh, it is other people's sufferings you dismiss. Those 60 children. Elizabeth, who died silent. The betrayer himself, who was so silent and so frightened. I don't refuse to tell the story because of what will happen to other people, not entirely. Not so much as because of my fear of what will happen to me. My anger, I am afraid of, my hatred. Uh, I drink a good deal, I listen to music. I'm alone as much as I'm able to be. I retain my own control, but... But the balance is a delicate one. Ah... I know. Oh, it's all very close to the surface, Ella, and I don't expect you to understand a quarter of it. We're all afraid. Uh, you of loneliness, youth, and I... I am afraid of what is in my head. Inescapably. Who was the betrayer? Oh, you don't let go, do you? The man we killed was Jean-Luc, her first husband. Does my mother know? She knows that, yes. But you see, there's something more. He was the wrong man. He had been betrayed himself. Oh, my God. So who? That I will tell to no one. Ever. Ah, now... Now I think you had better go. Hmm? It is done. You're a lucky man, Alan. He's gone. Safely. Bouchard told me. Do you know why I stayed with the group? No. Because I was afraid. I was afraid of being a coward. So I stayed. Nothing touches you anymore, does it? Does that help? You hear a confession, acts of contrition, admissions, sins, guilt. Do they touch you? Or is it all now a blank, cold void? The Jews say there are seven men who carry with them the sins of all the world, the super scapegoats. We can't all feel guilty, my son. Ah, I wish then I had the strength of one of them. For I constantly have in front of me the memory of foul things feel empty, drained of all compassions. I feel anger, a great bile rising in me. I felt it today. I feel it. That boy came so lightly and asked for a story, as if he had the right. You didn't tell him? I told him something enough. We told you not to. We agreed. All of us agreed. You all promised. He has gone. Ella, too, has gone. I am left, father, with this great black thing on my back. Mary and I, we make confessions, the one for the other. I'm incapable of other than that. Not a spark of the real fire left in me. There was so much we hoped for. It's all time wasted. You mustn't think that. Truth. You know perfectly well. You hide from what you did behind your cloth, your faith. Well, what can I hide behind? Oh, I've done enough. Can't even care very much now. I lie in our bed each night and I sweat like a pig. I trespass each night I lie with Mary. I always have. Well, you know that. The day Jean-Luc was killed, she shut her eyes. She offers me what? A, a body once or twice, a bed, food, work, what else? Does she know the truth? Ah, it isn't important. We've marked out our boundaries. Our territories are safe, one from the other. Yet you stay. It's too late now. I've never meant to hurt her. 
But now Ella has gone. The wall is pulled down, and I'm afraid. You... you haven't been to confession for a long time, Alan. I... I haven't been able to. It might help. Believe me, we've all killed men, Alan, one way or another. That journalist? Uh, the first one who came? <laughs> Not I. Oh, I didn't suggest you, Joseph. We were all afraid of him, of what you might say. It's a heavy burden to carry. You must know the burden that I carry, too. I hear those little daily sins confessed at the grill. I sometimes ache to run through the village shouting what I carry, what I know. Of others? Or yourself? Both. And you? <laughs> I suppose I do. Yes. So, who had him killed? Bouchard, perhaps. I think Bouchard. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. He doesn't need to confess to me. He doesn't need to confess to anyone. He doesn't believe. So, Bouchard had him killed. When you talked, when the SS had finished with you in that place, when you talked, what did you feel? Betrayal isn't so very hard to achieve, Alan. It's in all of us. Christ teaches... Oh, I'm not concerned with Christ, Joseph. I'm concerned with you, that dead journalist, Bouchard. You betrayed us. Uh, yes, I know that. You told me and expected me to what? To react uh, in the old ways? I hoped, yes, that you would find a way to... I don't know. Punish you? Oh. Well, well. That man. You know why he was killed? Not the fear of you talking. Why should anyone but I care about that? It was because... He didn't care who was hurt by his delving. Because the people here are private and want to keep their privacy. They don't offer remembrance to those children, not their mothers nor their fathers. Their grief is private. You, you do, each year. That man was killed because he would bring pain to everyone here, but above all to you. You had no need to stay, but you stayed. You had no need to fight with us, but you fought. You had no need to remain here after it was over, except that you'd been, what can I say, broken. We love you, you see. And so you are protected. I wouldn't have given him the name of the real traitor, Joseph. You and I live with that knowledge, don't we? Yes, I do. I was once a man, Alan. I had appetites like any other man. I do still. Judas hanged himself, and that perhaps was easy. I have what I did in my mind every day of my life. As I do. But I betrayed them, not you. And I believe in a God who will not absolve that sin. You see? Good night, Alan. Come on, Ella. Oh, I'm not sure, Tony. Uh, get it over with. Oh, all right, Tony. If you're sure. Tony! Oh. Tony! Tony! Bloody good to see you, old son. <clears throat> Been away. Well. Oh, celebrating, I can see. Hello, oh, me dear. You'll <laughs> never introduce as George the name. What do you drink? Hmm? Here, Tony. Did you follow up that story? Uh, in a way. Juicy stuff, was it? Uh, you might think so. <laughs> I only want 10%, old son, eh? Well, you'll wait a long time. There's nothing I want to use. Not now. You seid verantwortlich! You all seid verantwortlich! Take care of Yes! In The Rose Garden by Nick McCarthy, Tony Parker was played by Nigel Anthony 
and Alan Bryant by Arnold Peters. Ella, Emily Richard, Father Joseph, Geoffrey Matthews, Monsieur Bouchard, William Edel, Inspector Lebrun, Brian Haynes, Mary Bryant, Eileen Barry, George, the man in the pub, Jack Holloway, Jill, Heather Barrett, and the hotel porter, Alan Devereux. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The French schoolchildren were played by the members of Form 3M of North Bromsgrove High School in Worcestershire. The play was produced and directed in our Birmingham studios by Roger Pine. And with that nice bit of foreshadowing by Dorothy L'Amour, we come to the event itself, which is the presence of Mae West in our company tonight. Miss West has carved such a sizable niche for herself in the Hall of Fame with her unique characterizations that not only is her name known in every home up and down the country, but the phrases and expressions which she has originated have almost become a part of the American language. For us, she forsakes the picture hats and sweeping dresses of the gay 90s, which you find so becoming in her new picture, and turns back time to step into the Garden of Eden and into the character of the most fascinating woman of them all, Eve. Wendell, will you set the scene for us? Well, of course, we find Adam and Eve in the famous Garden of Eden. And this light-hearted travesty about what might have taken place in those days when the world was young was written for us by Arch Oveler, one of radio's better-known writers. Under a spreading fig tree rests one Mr. Adam, sprawled out lazily in the hot sun. Eve, obviously, is bored beyond endurance as they play a game of cards with a deck of fig leaves. Listen, tall, tan, and tired... It's time I told you a thing or two. Ever since creation, I've done nothing but play in double solitaire. It's disgusting. It's got me down. Well, we've got a nice place here. That's the trouble. It's too nice. Well, I'm not complaining. Mm, but I want something to happen, a little excitement, a little adventure. A girl's got to have a little fun once in a while. There's no future under a fig tree. Oh. <laughs> now, come on, woman. Be like me. Why don't you relax and just take it easy? Hmm? Mm, because I'm a lady of big ideas. Yeah, what kind of ideas? Oh, hmm. you, you've no idea. <laughs> Listen, Adam, I've got to get a chance to expand my personality. Well, go on, expand. <laughs> I will, out there. Out there? You, you mean outside the gates of the Garden of Eden? Now you're talking. Oh, but, but who, who knows what's out there? Mm, I'd find out. Oh, no, no, we, we can't go. We, we've still got a lease on this place. You mean... <laughs> you mean to tell me a lease is the thing that's holding me back from developing my personality? Well, a lease is a lease. Anyway, we've got a nice place here. Temperature perfect, sun always shining, nothing but a heavy dew once in a while. Mm. <laughs> What are you, the Chamber of Commerce? Oh, go away and let me sleep, will you? L listen, Adam. I tell you, you got to get me out of this place. You got to break the lease. Yeah, but what for? This is Eden. Everything is peaceful and quiet and safe. That's the trouble. It's too safe. I tell you, it's disgusting. Well, what are you talking about? Adam, you don't know a thing about women. Oh, you apparently forget you were originally one of my own ribs. Yeah. A rib once, and now I'm beefing. <laughs> Me? I know everything about women. That's covering a lot of territory. <laughs> Listen, long, lazy, and lukewarm. <laughs> you think I want to stay in this place all my life? I do, and I tell you, you're one of my ribs. Yeah, but one of your floating ribs. A couple of months of peace and security and a woman's born all the way down to the bottom of a marriage certificate. Well, then what do you want? Trouble? Trouble. Listen, if trouble means something that makes you catch your breath, if trouble means something that makes your blood run through your veins like salsa water, mmm, Adam, my man, give me trouble. Oh, Eve, you, you, you don't want trouble. Uh, now, tell me the low-down truth. Ain't there any way you can break our lease? Well, yes, there is. But I won't tell you. No? No, this is paradise. Free light, free heat, free meals. What else could a man want? Answer me that. Oh, I got a good, couple of good ideas if you'll tell me how to break the lease. No, I won't do it. 
Oh, Adam. What? Come on over here. What for? To hold hands? Oh, <laughs> that old game? <laughs> Can't you think of something new? You know, you know nothing about nothing. Oh, yes, I do. I know more than you do, woman. Oh, what, for instance? I know all about the tree. What tree, man? What tree? That apple tree in the middle of the garden. The lease says that if we eat any of its fruit, we get thrown out of here. Oh, now, is that a fact? Sure, that's why there's a fence around it. I tell you, one bite of those apples and we get a dispossessed. Hmm, how fascinating. Adam, you can hold my hand now. No. No, I, I got a better idea. Oh, yeah? I'm listening. I'm waiting. Where? What are you going to do now? I think I'll go fishing. Oh. <laughs> how disgusting. Now, wait a minute. You can't talk to me that way. Do you realize I'm man number one? Yeah, but I'm your number one man. Well, oh, I'll see you around supper time. I'll be back. Oh, so that's the trouble. So it's a tree over there. Hmm. Hello, tree. How would you like to do a little lease breaking for a woman with ideas, mm hmm? Not room enough to squeeze through those slats for a woman of my personality. Now, if I only knew someone skinny enough. Salutations, oh, Mrs. Eve. Oh, if it isn't Mr. Snake. Hello, long, dark, and slinky. Mm. Mrs. Eve, why are you standing by that tree? Stop wiggling and I'll tell you. <laughs> Listen, I know you don't approve, but I've got a little proposition to make. I certainly refuse to listen. What is it? Do you think uh, with the proper provocation you could squeeze through that fence around the tree? That's the forbidden tree. Oh, don't be technical. Answer me this, my palpitating python. Would you like to have this whole paradise to yourself? Certainly. Okay, then pick me a handful of fruit. Adam and I will eat it. And the Garden of Eden is all yours. What do you say? Sounds all right, but it's forbidden fruit. Listen, what are you, my friend in the grass or a snake in the grass? <laughs> but forbidden fruit... Are you a snake or are you a mouse? I'll... I'll do it. Mm. Now you're talking. Here, right in between those pickets. I'm... I'm stuck. Oh, shake your hips. There, there, now you're through. I shouldn't be doing this. Yeah, but you're doing all right. Now get me a big one. I feel like doing a big apple. <laughs> Here you are, Mrs. Eve. Mm. Ah, I see. <laughs> nice going, swivel hips. Wait a minute. It won't work. Adam will never eat that forbidden apple. Oh, yes, he will, when I'm through with it. Nonsense, he won't. He will if I feed it to him like women are going to feed men for the rest of time. What's that? Applesauce. <laughs> Eve? Where are you, Eve? Mm, waiting, my love, just waiting. Oh, hello, Eve. What have you been doing? Me? Oh, I've just been making a little history. Huh? <laughs> the first woman to make a monkey out of a snake. Say, how about supper? And don't tell me we got fig stew again. Oh, no, something new, so help me, something new. Here, have a bite of this. Whoa, what is it? A new kind of sauce. It's good for you. Uh... Are you sure? Mm, just to prove it's pure, 100% proof, I'll have a demi tasse of it myself. All right, I'll... Oh, well... No, no, wait. Before you eat, answer me this. Are you going to take me out of this dismal dump and give me a chance to develop my personality? Oh, Weave, are you going to start that over again? Mm, no, I'm going to end it. Eat your sauce, big boy, and hold your hat if you've got one. Oh, say... Say, this is darn good sauce. Where, where, where did you find it? Oh, oh, my head. Where? Oh, what happened to me? We've been dispossessed. Yeah, but, but why? Forbidden apple sauce. Oh, Eve, what have you done? I've just made a little more history, that's all. I'm the first woman to have her own way, and a snake will take the rap for it. But, Eve, we've lost the Garden of Eden. We're... We're... 
We're just... Eve, it's... It's as if I see you for the first time. You're beautiful. Mm, and you fascinate me. Your eyes. Oh, tell me more. Your... your lips. Come closer. I want to hold you closer. I want to... You want to what? Eve, what? What, what, what was that? That was the original kiss. Thank you, May. In just a moment, hear Best Plays. First, though, all of us look forward to a relaxing weekend these hot summer days. But weekdays, NBC brings you lots of easy listening, too, with Bob Hope and Dave Garraway, as well as a chance to visit with one man's family. For quiz Monday through Friday, there's It Pays to be Married and Second Chance. And, of course, the most up-to-the-minute direct reports from home and abroad on Morgan Beatty's famous News of the World. Yes, weekdays, listening's a pleasure, too. And now, best plays on NBC. From New York, where the American stage begins, NBC presents best plays transcribed with John Chapman. Best Plays, a series of hour-length dramas selected from the outstanding successes of the New York stage. Now, John Chapman, drama critic of the New York Daily News, is here to introduce Maureen Stapleton and Eli Wallach in The Rose Tattoo by Tennessee Williams. <laughs> Mr. Chapman. The author of our best play, Tennessee Williams, has managed to win one Pulitzer Prize and two Drama Critics Circle Awards, which is good going for a young man who is trying to work his way up in the theater. Better than his prize-winning ability, though, is Williams' ability to start people talking. For talk is as important to the stage as it is on it. All Williams' plays so far are easily remembered, including the one we are about to offer you, The Rose Tattoo. His first three heroines in The Glass Menagerie, A Streetcar Named Desire, and Summer and Smoke were repressed women. Trying a change of pace, Williams wondered what would happen if one of his women were unrepressed. The Rose Tattoo, which is a comedy for adults, is the result. Its successful production on Broadway brought sudden fame to the two leading actors, Maureen Stapleton and Eli Wallach, and we are happy to present them to you in this performance. Now the day is drawing toward the evening. This is the hour that we Italians call Prima Sera, the beginning of dusk. That is where we are in time. In place, imagine that we are somewhere between New Orleans, Louisiana and Mobile, Alabama, and that we are about to enter the house of Baronessa Serafina delle Rose, a dressmaker. Serafina! Serafina! Assunta! Is that you? Si. Buonasera, cara. Buonasera. Come on in. There is something wild in the air. No wind, but everything is moving. I don't see nothing moving, and neither do you. Hmm. Oh, Santa. Could you undo a couple of hooks? The dress is so tight on me. The baby's coming soon, huh? Soon. Asunta, I'll tell you something which maybe you won't believe. Huh? It's impossible to tell me anything that I don't believe. Siete, Sunta. I knew that I was to become a mother the very night it happened. There was something different. Davvero. Ah, siete. That night, I woke up with a burning pain on me. Here, a pain like a needle. Quick, quick, hot, little stitches. So I turned on the light. I looked at my breast. I saw the rose tattoo of my husband. Rosario's tattoo? On me. His tattoo. And when I saw it, I knew. Did Rosario see it? I screamed. When he woke up, it was gone. It only lasted a moment. But I did see it. And I did know when I seen it that in my body another rose was grown. Did he believe it that you saw it? 
No. He laughed. He laughed and I cried. Hmm. And he took you in his arms and then you stopped crying. <laughs> See? <laughs> oh, Serafina, for you everything has to be different. A sign, a miracle, a wonder of some kind. That's the truth. But why? Because you are more important? The wife of the barone? Ah, uh, in Sicily they call his uncle a barone. But in Sicily everybody's a barone that owns a piece of the land and a separate house for the goat. And here, what is the Barone della Rosa? He drives a truck of bananas. No, not bananas. Cosa dici, no bananas? On top of the truck is the bananas. But underneath is something else. Che altra cosa? Why, whatever it is that the brothers Romano want hauled out of the state, he hauls it for them underneath the bananas. And money. He gets so much money it spills from his pocket. Soon I don't have to make dresses. Soon I think you will have to make a black veil. Oh, no. No. Tonight's the last time he does it. Tomorrow, he quits hauling stuff for the brothers Romano. He pays for the ten-ton truck and works for himself. We live with dignity in America then. Our own truck. Our own house. In the house, everything will be electric. But tonight, Asunta, stay with me. I can't swallow my heart. Not till I hear the truck stop in front of the house. And his key in the lock in the door. In his hair, Asunta, he wears oil of roses. And when I wake up at night, the air, the dark room, it's full of roses. With him, time doesn't pass. Hmm. You say the clock is a liar? No. <laughs> I say the clock is a fool. I don't listen to it. My heart is my clock. My heart don't say tick, tick. It says love, love. Now, I have two hearts in me. Both of them saying love, love. Asunta, I can't swallow my heart. A woman must not have a heart too big to swallow. By Buona Sera. Oh, stay with me. I have to visit a woman who drank red poison because of a heart too big for her to swallow. Ah, uh, go then. I'll not be alone. It's so wonderful having two lives in the body. Not one, but two. I'm heavy with life. I'm big. Big, big with life. You want something? Yes, I heard you do sewing. Yes, I do sewing. Come in. You can sit right down there. How fast can you make a shirt for me? Well, that all depends. I got a piece of silk with me. I want it made into a shirt for a man I'm in love with. Tomorrow's the anniversary of the day we met. Here's the material. Oh, que bella stuff. Oh, that would be wonderful stuff for a lady's blouse. I want a man's shirt made with it. Silk? This red for a shirt for a man. <laughs> this man is wild like a gypsy. Oh, a woman should not encourage a man to be wild. A man that's wild is hard for a woman to hold. But if he was tame, would the woman want to hold him? Hmm? I'm a married woman in business. I don't know nothing about wild men and wild women. I don't have I'll pay time. you three times the price you ask me for it. Oh. Money's not the object. But it's got to be ready tomorrow. He. Uh, pin the measurements and your name on the silk and the shirt will be ready tomorrow. The name, please? My name is Estelle Hohengarten. Here, you write it on the car. You come tomorrow. It'll be ready if I have to work all night. Serafina did work all night. Perhaps in order to finish the shirt. Or maybe it was just to keep her mind away from her husband who had still not returned from his trip. When morning came, I was the first one to know why. Because Father DiLeo came and asked me to go with him and break the news to her. As we came up into the yard, her sewing machine was still going. There's still a light in the house? She's still working. Asunta, uh, will you tell her that Rosario is dead? Oh, Father, it will not be necessary to tell her. She will know when she sees us. <sighs> Serafina! 
Who's that? Asunta. Father. Serafina. Rosario. Don't speak. Don't tell me. My child, we must... Don't speak! Don't speak! She's lost the baby. But Serafina is a very strong woman and it won't kill her. But she's trying not to breathe. Asunta, this is a hypodermic. In the arm with the needle if she screams or struggles to get up again. I capisco, doctor. For three years after Rosario's death, Serafina did not leave the house. She didn't comb her hair and always wore the same dirty old petticoat. And the time she wasn't sewing, she spent it kneeling down in front of the marble urn where she kept her husband's ashes. On the morning her daughter Rosa was to graduate from the high school, a woman that I'd never seen before came by my porch and stopped. Could you tell me where I might find Rosa Della Rosa? Um, what do you want with her? I'm a high school teacher. Have you seen her? Rosa? I see her this morning, at Serafina's window. And you know how? How? <laughs> Naked. Why? What did she do? Do? You know what she said? Signora, Signora, please call this numero and ask for Jack. And tell Jack my clothes are locked up so I can't get out from the house. Then Serafina come. She grabbed the girl by the hair and she pulled up from the window and she slammed the shutters right on my face. Who is Jack? Oh, he's a sailor. She met him at the high school dance. <laughs> and you know, somebody tells Serafina. That's why she locked up the girl's clothes and she can't leave the house. Oh, baby, something's going on in that house. I hear someone. That's Serafina's house. I don't know. She got her wrist, Serafina. No, 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 She got her wrist. She got her wrist, my daughter. Madonna. Madonna me. Mrs. Della Rosa, your daughter has not cut her wrist. Now, come in and see her. Get it, get it. Your daughter's all right. Rosa, Rosie, come here and show your mother that you're not bleeding to death. Mama, it's all right. Oh, now. it's still bleeding. Listen to daddy, Mama. <laughs> so ashamed I could die. See the way she looks at me. I got a wild thing in my heart. Let's not have any more outbursts of emotion. Out... Out... You make me sick. Sick to my stomach, you make me. You, school, you start all this trouble. You, you give this dance and she gets mixed up with a sailor. Don't listen to her. Don't pay any attention to her, Miss York. I'm ready to go to the high school. What do you think you want to do at this high school? How high is this high school? Look, I'll show you. It's high as that pile of dirt out there in the street. Mama, stop it. Now, wait a minute. minute. I ain't through talking. I just hear teacher. I'm so ashamed I could die. I'm ashamed. Mama, you look disgusting. Disgusting. Disgusting! You hear what my daughter called me? She called me disgusting. Mrs. Delarosa. Why don't you take a bath, get dressed, and come to the graduation? See, maybe that's what I'll do. I'll go on ahead with Rosa. You come on when you're ready. Will you? I'll come. In 15 minutes, I'll be there. Don't bother me now. Please, I'm late for the graduation and I can't find the graduation friend. You've got plenty of time. You, do you hear the band playing? They're just warming up. Now, Serafina, where's my blouse? Your blouse? Oh, it's not ready. Look, i got to get to the high school now. Well, I've got to get to the depot in that blouse. We're going to the American Legion parade in Orleans. All right, give it to me. I'll stitch them together. 
Oh, if you make me late for my daughter's graduation, I'll make you sorry somehow. Now, now, Bessie, don't wet out your feet before we get to the city. Oh, Molly told me the town is full of excitement. They're dropping paper sacks full of water out of hotel windows. No kidding. <laughs> A double dog dare anybody to try that on me. <laughs> hey, you two ladies, watch how you talk. This here is a religious house. You're sitting in the same room with our lady and the blessed ashes of my husband. Well, excuse me. You know, Bessie, she used to have a sweet figure. A little bit plump, but attractive. Uh -huh. But sitting there at that sewing machine for three years in a slip and not stepping out of the house is naturally give a hip. <laughs> if I didn't have hips, I'd be a very uncomfortable woman when I sat down. Mm -hmm. Hey, who's that? Two legionnaires are on the highway. Legionnaires? No kidding. Uh -oh. oh, he's looking this way. Yes, I um, uh, uh, Mademoiselle from on the chair, Paul Labor. Now take your blood and get out. This is the house of Rosario de la Rosa. And those are his ashes in the marble urn. And I won't have improper things going on here. Nor dirty talk, neither. Who's talking dirty? You are. Dirty talk all the time. Men, 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 men. You two men crazy things, you. Sour grapes. Sour grapes is your trouble. You're just wild with envy. When I think of men, I think about my husband. My husband was a Sicilian. And maybe that's the reason. I'm not man crazy, and I don't like hearing the talk of women that are. Oh, no, let's go. Forget no, about it. Just wait a minute. Listen, I don't accept insults from no one. Ah, uh, go on. Go on to New Orleans, you two men crazy things, you. And do what you want. But not in my house. At my window, in front of my husband's ashes. I'm not interested in that sort of man-crazy business. I remember my husband with the body of a young boy and hair on his head, black and thick as mine is, and skin on him, smooth and sweet as a yellow rose. <laughs> a rose, was it? Yes. Yes, a rose. A rose. Yes, a rose. Of a gangster shot smuggling dope under a load of bananas. Oh, so, so let's go. My no. folks was peasants. But he, he come from the landowner. Signor Eli, my husband. I'm satisfied to remember the love of a man that was only mine. Never touched by the hand of nobody. Nobody but me. Just me. Never touched by nobody. Never. Nobody but me. I know somebody that could a tale unfold. And not so far from here, neither. Not no further than the, the square roof is. That place on... On Esplanade? Estelle Hohengarten. Yes, Estelle Hohengarten, the blackjack dealer from Texas. What did you say? Everybody's known it but you, Serafina. I'm just telling the facts that come out at the inquest while, while you was in bed with your eyes shut tight and a sheet pulled up over your head like a, a, a female ostrich. And it was a romance. Not just a fly-by-night thing, but a steady affair that went on for more than a year. Liar. And he had a rose tattoo on his chest. And Estelle was so gone on him, she went on down to Bourbon Street and had one put on her. You liar. You liar! Oh, let's go, let's go. She's gonna hit you. She liar. better not. Liar! <laughs> liar! 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 Are you there, Mama? Rosa? Yeah, she's in there. Well, I better go and wait outside for a while. Well, you stay right here. Mama, Jack's with me. Are you dressed up nicely? <laughs> Why is it so dark in here? Uh, wait a minute. <gasps> Mama! Oh, Mama, you said you were dressed up pretty. Rose, you, uh, graduate all right. Mama, this is Jack Hunter. 
Uh, hello, Mrs. Del Rosa. It sure is a pleasure to meet you, ma'am. Uh, I was hoping to see you at the graduation. Uh, I guess Mama was too worn out to go. Rosa, shut the front door and, and lock it. There was a um, policeman here and two women. We had a fight. I'm sorry you didn't make the graduation, Miss Del Rosa. What? What? I think that your mama... Show her your prize, Rosa. Look what I got, Mama. What? Digestive knowledge. Everything's in them from abracadabra to zoo. My sister was jealous. She just got a diploma. Diploma? Where is it? You... Didn't you get no diploma? Sexy, Mama. Echolo, grab the grab Yes, ma'am, Mrs. Del Rosa. You certainly got a right to be very proud of your daughter. I am proud of the memory of her father. He was a baron. Now, who are you? Mama, I just introduced him. His name is Jack Hunter. What are you hunting, Jack? Mama! Same as all of them? To have a good time. And the devil cares who pays. Well, I'm sick of men. I'm almost as sick of men as I am of women. Rosie, you get out of here. I want to talk to this boy. I didn't bring Jack here to be insulted. Go on, honey, go on. And let your mama talk to me. I think your mama's just got a slight wrong impression. Yes, I got an impression. I'll go get dressed. Oh, mama, don't spoil it for me. This is the happiest day of my life. Mrs. Del Rosa? Della Rosa. Mrs. Della Rosa, I'm sorry about this. Believe me, Mrs. Della Rosa, the last thing I had in mind was getting mixed up in a family situation. What did you do with my daughter at that high school dance? We danced. And the next night? What did you do? The next night we went to the movies. What did you do there? At the movies? We ate a bag of popcorn and watched the movie. She came home at midnight. She told me she's with her girlfriend studying civics. Whatever story she told you, it ain't my fault. And the night after that? Last Tuesday, we went roller skating. Afterwards, we went to a drugstore and had an ice cream soda. Alone? At the drugstore? No, it was crowded. And the skating rink was full of people skating. You mean you have not been alone with my daughter? Alone or not alone, what's the point of that question? I still don't see the point of it. We are Sicilians. We do not leave the girls alone with boys they are not engaged to. Mrs. Della Rosa, this is the United States. We are Sicilians. We are not cold-blooded. My girl, she is innocent. Mrs. Della Rosa, I got to tell you something. Uh, you might not believe it. It, it. It's a hard thing to say. But I, I'm also, I, I'm also innocent. What? No. I do not believe it. That's true, though. You, a sailor? Yes, ma'am. Mrs. Della Rosa, Mrs. Della Rosa, I, I no. don't... Two weeks ago, I was slapping her wrist for scratching mosquito bites. And she rode on a bicycle to the school. Now, all at once, I got a wild thing in the house. She says she's in love. Now, you. You say you're in love, too? Yes, ma'am, I do. I'm in love very much. What are you? Catholic? Me? Yes, ma'am, Catholic. You don't look Catholic to me. Oh, dear, Mama, how do Catholics look? How do they look different from you anyone else? You stay out till I call you. Now, turn around. Do what, ma'am? I said turn around. Turn around, please, for me. Why do they make them pants so tight? Well, that's a question you'll have to ask the Navy, Mrs. Delarosa. And that gold earring. Why do you wear a gold ring in your ear for, huh? He's crossing the equator, Mama. He was initiated into the court, uh, and that's when he gets to wear a gold earring. Now, you earring. see that? You see what a wild thing I got in my house? Mrs. Del Rosa, I guess the Sicilians are very emotional people. And I want nobody to take advantage of that. You got the wrong idea about me, Mrs. Del Rosa. You say you are Catholic? Yes, ma'am. Then kneel down in front of Our Lady. All right, ma'am. Now what? Now, you say after me what I say. Yes, ma'am. I promise 
the Holy Mother, that I will respect the innocent of the daughter Mama. of... A... Will you get out of here? What, are you going to say it? Well, yes, ma'am. I prom... What was it again, ma'am? I promise the Holy Mother. I promise the Holy Mother. That I will respect the innocence of the daughter Rosa. Of Rosario della Rosa. That I will respect the innocence of the daughter Rosa of Rosario della Rosa. Cross yourself. Now get up. I'm satisfied now. Mom, I've never been so mortified in all my life. Come on, Jack, let's go. Where are you going? We're going in three sailboats to Diamond Bay. Oh. Well, go then. But you be careful. He still don't look like a Catholic to me. Buongiorno, Serafina. Buongiorno. I'm surprised to see you sitting outdoors like this. What is this thing you're wearing? I think it is an undergarment. I must tell you. The change in your appearance and behavior since Rosario's death is shocking. Shocking. I knew this was going to happen when you broke the church law and had your husband cremated. Set up a little idolatrous shrine in your house and give worship to a bottle of ashes. Are you listening? Yes. Seraphine. You, you're still a young woman. Eligible for marriage and bearing again. I remember you dressed in pale blue silk at mass one morning, Easter, yes. <laughs> like a lady wearing a piece of the weather. Oh, how proudly you walk. <laughs> Too proudly. I walk with my husband. Now you crouch and shuffle about barefoot. You live like a convict, dressed in the rags of a convict. Why don't you go in the house, get dressed? Go in the house. I will go in the house. If you will answer one question, will you answer one question? I will, if I know the answer. Father, you used to hear the confessions of my husband. Yes. Did he ever speak to you of a woman? Serafina, you know better than to ask me such a question. I don't break the church laws. The secrets of the confessional are sacred I to got me. to know. You could tell me. I've got to know. Uh, let, let, let go of me, Not till you tell me, Father. Father, you will tell me. Oh, please tell me. Or I'll go mad. Uh, I'll please. go back in the house and smash the urn with the ashes if you don't tell me. What could I tell you if you would not believe the known facts? The known facts? Who knows the known facts? Nobody knew my rose of the world but me. And now they can lie because the rose ain't living. Uh, please. They want the marble urn broken. They want me to smash it. They want the rose ashes scattered because I had too much glory. Uh, and they don't want glory like that in nobody's heart. Serafina, take your hands off me. When you tell me, I'll let you go. Oh, it's been a long time. I wanted to break out like let this. Let go of me, Serafina. Must I call for help? Yes, go. Call for help, but I won't let you go till you tell me. You're not a respectable woman. No, I'm not respectable. I'm a woman. No, no, you're not a woman. You're an animal. See, si. see, si, animal. It's an animal. You tell him. Shout it up and down the block. Serafina. He is attacking the priest. He'll tear the black suit from him. Unless he tells that the women in this town are lying to us. Serafina. Tell me. Asunta. Asunta. Father. No. Father, you tell me. Please tell me. See? I let to go. No. I'm not an animal. Please. Please tell me. Serafina. Serafina, mia. Keep away from me. Oh, Father, are you all right? Thank you, Asunta. See. Si. Serafina, won't you go inside to get dressed? Leave me alone. Both of you. Go away and leave me alone. In a moment, Act Two of The Rose Tattoo, starring Maureen Stapleton and Eli Wallach. Now, Act Two of the Best Plays production of The Rose Tattoo, starring Maureen Stapleton and Eli Wallach.
the father de Leo left, Serafina sat for the rest of the afternoon on the porch. From time to time, I would look out to see if she was all right. And once, when I went to the window, I saw a strange man get out of a car on the road and go up to the porch where she was sitting. Good afternoon, lady. What do you want? Well, I got a little novelty here which I'm offering to just a few lucky people at what we call an introductory price. Know what I mean? No. <clears throat> well, lady, this thing here that I'm dropping right in your lap is bigger than television. I sell directly to merchants, but when I stopped over there to have my car serviced, I seen you taking the air on the stoop, I thought I'd walk... Hey! Where are you rolling? <clears throat> now, lady, this little article has a deceptive appearance. Now, first of all, I want you to notice hey! how... The... Hay is for horses. Now, madam, allow me to show you what happens I'm when you... I'm talking to you. Something giving you gas pains, macaroni. My name is not macaroni. All right, spaghetti. I'm not macaroni, I'm not spaghetti. I'm a human being that drives a truck of bananas. I drive a truck of bananas for the Southern Fruit Company for a living. Not to play cowboys and Indians on no highway with no rotten road hog. I give you the sign to pass me. You tell me and give me the horn. And, and then on that curb, you go past me and make me drive off the highway. I don't like that, no sir. And I'm glad you stop here now. Take the cigar out of your mouth. Take out the cigar. Take it out for me, greaseball. Huh? It, if I take it out, I'll push it down your throat. I got three dependents. If I fight, I get fired. Well, I'm gonna fight and get fired. Take out the cigar. Suppose I don't. Then I'll just take it out for you. Well, let's see you try, eh? I got your license number, Macaroni. I know your boss. You drop that. Drop that. Hey, lady. Lady, I gotta go in the house. Hey, you stay out of there. Where do you think you're going? Hey, please, leave me alone. I, got, I gotta be alone. Leave me alone, please, now. Hey, you. What are you doing in here? Why'd you come in my house? Hey lady, hey, lady, please leave me alone. You got no business in here. I got to cry after a fight. I'm sorry, lady. I, I, what? What's the matter with you? I always cry after a fight, but I don't want the people to see me. It's not like a man. A <laughs> man is no different from nobody else. <laughs> everybody, everybody cries sometimes. <laughs> I always cry when somebody else is crying. Hey, lady, lady. <laughs> No, hey, lady, don't, don't cry. Oh, why should you cry? I stop. I stop. I stop in a minute. This is not like a man. I'm ashamed of myself. I stop now, please, lady. Hey, your jacket is torn. How come many jacket is torn? Oh, dear. No, no, you take it off. I'll sew it up for you. I do, uh... I do so. I got three defendants that he took down my license number. Oh, people are always taking our license numbers and telephone numbers and numbers that don't mean nothing all the numbers. Three defendants, not citizens even. No, they leave checks, no nothing. Now, he, he's going to complain to the boy. I wanted to cry all day. He said he fired me if I don't stop crying. Will you please stop crying so I can stop crying? I'm a sissy. <laughs> Excuse me, I, I'm ashamed. No. Oh, no. No. Don't you be ashamed of nothing. The world is too crazy for people to be ashamed in it. I'm not ashamed. I had two fights on the street today. And my daughter, she called me disgusting. Ah. Uh. I, um, I gotta sew this by hand. I broke my machine in a fight with two women. That's what they call a cat fight. Ah. I'm, I'm ashamed of what happened. Crying is not like a man. Oh, nobody saw you but me. To me, it don't matter. You, you're a simpatica molto. It was not just a fight that makes me break down. No, you and me too. What was the trouble today? Well, 
My name is Manjakalalu, <laughs> which means eat a horse. It's a comical <laughs> name, I know. Well, today at the Southern Fruit Company, I find on the pay envelope, not Manjakalalu, eat a horse in big print. Uh, inside the envelope, I find a notice. My wages have been gone she. You know what gone she is? Yeah. Gone she, eat a horse, road hog, all in one day, that's too much. I go crazy, I boil, I cry, I'm ashamed, but I'm not able to help. Even a what truck driver's a human being. A human beings they must cry. Yes, they must cry. I couldn't cry all day, but now I cry. I feel much better. When my husband was here, I never cried. Excuse me for asking, but where is your husband? Them are his ashes in the marble urn. Ah. He was a baron. I, I hope he's resting in peace. You, you reminded me of him when you took off your shirt. He hauled bananas. Isn't that what you do? Si, senor. In a ten-ton truck? No, an eight-ton truck. My husband hauled bananas in a ten-ton truck. Oh, he was a baron. On his chest, he had the tattoo of a rose. I, I'll tell you something about the tattoo of my husband. Well, he had this rose tattoo on his chest. And one night, I woke up with a burning pain on me here. I turned on the light. I looked at my breast. And on it, I saw the rose tattoo of my husband. On me. On my breast, this tattoo. Mastrano. And that was the night that... I got to speak frankly to you. I must speak frankly. We're grown-up people. That was the night I conceived my son. <sighs> the little boy I lost when I lost my husband. I don't know why I told you, but I like how you talk. You know, there are some people, they want to make everything dirty. Two, two of them kind of people that came to my house today. And they told me a terrible lie. In front of the ashes. It was so awful a lie. If I thought it was true, I'd smash the urn and throw the ashes away. What lie did they tell you? No. No, I don't want to talk about it. I just want to forget it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I would forget anything that makes you unhappy. Yeah. Hey, you know, this is a cozy little home-like place you got here. Oh, oh it's Volto Modesto. You got a nice place, too? I got a place with three dependents in it. What dependents? I got one old maid sister, one feeble-minded grandmother, one lush of a pop. They got the Pachisi habit. They play the game of Pachisi morning, night, and noon, and they, and they pass a bucket of beer around the table. They got the beer habit, too? Oh, yeah. And the numbers habit, especially my grandmother. She's a very sweet old lady who don't think it's necessary to pay the grocery bill so long as there's money to play on the numbers. Today, the ideal grocery company, they garnish my wages. Eh, there, now, I, I told you my whole life. <laughs> and now I, I got to make a telephone call. Who you got to call? I'm calling my boss in Biloxi to explain why I'm late. Oh, the call to Biloxi is a 10-cent call. Uh, don't worry about it. I'm not worried about it. You'll pay it. You got a sensible attitude toward life. Hello? Now give me the Southern Fruit Company in Biloxi, 787. You're a bachelor, huh? With three dependents. I'll tell you my hopes and dreams. Who? Me? I'm hoping to meet some sensible older lady. Maybe a lady a little bit older than me. I don't care if she's a little bit too plump or not such a stylish dresser. The important thing in a lady is understanding. Good sense. And I wanted to have a well-furnished house and a profitable little business of some kind. Oh, and uh, such a lady with a well-furnished house and a business, what does she want with a man with three dependents? They got the Parcheesi habit, the beer habit, playing the numbers. Love and affection in a world that's lonely, cold. Vanessa, I'm a healthy young man existing without no life of my own. That call is ten cents for three minutes. Is the line busy? No, not the line, but the boss. The charge for the call goes higher. 
This ain't the phone of a millionaire you're using. Now get your boss on the phone and hang up the what? phone. What? What? Mr. Sicardi? I was tricks at the Southern Fruit Company this hot afternoon. Ha <laughs> ha! It's much of a What? What? You, you got the complaint already? Wait. Well, same type of hardy. No. This road hog was. Hello? Hello? Uh, Mr. Sicardi? <laughs> a man with three dependents out of a job. Uh, I ain't uh, through sewing your jacket, but. But it's too dark to see the work anymore. I, I got a suggestion to make. You open the bottom drawer of that bureau there. You'll, you'll find the shirt in white tissue paper. You can wear it while I'm fixing this. It was made for somebody, and they never called for it. Is there a name pinned to it? A stone? No, don't tell me that name. What a beautiful shirt. The color of a rose. <laughs> Seta, seta pura. Mm. This shirt is too good for Manja Carl. Everything here is too good for Manja Carl. Nothing is too good for a man. If the man is good, you are welcome to wear it. <laughs> How does it feel, huh? The silk kind of. Feels like a girl's hands. It'll make you less trouble. There's nothing more beautiful than a gift between people. Uh, now you're smiling. You like me a little bit better. <laughs> you know, what they should have done when you was a baby. Why? They should have put tape on your ears to hold them back to your head. So when you grow up, they wouldn't stick out like that. <laughs> like wings on a little Cupid doll. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, got, I gotta go now. You... You've been troppo gentile, Mrs. I am the widow of the Baron Della Rosa. Excuse the way I'm not dressed. I'm not always like this. Sometimes I fix myself up. When my husband was living, when my husband comes home, I had on a clean dress. Sometimes I even put a rose in my hair. A rose in your hair would be pretty. For a widow, it ain't the time of roses. When can I bring the shirt back? When you pass by again? I pass by tonight for supper. Will it? Uh, well, look at the window. If the shutters are open and there's a light in the window, you can stop by for your jacket. But if the shutters are closed, you better not stop by because uh, my daughter will be home. She's gone on a picnic. She might be home early, but not not that there's nothing wrong with two grown people having a conversation, but, uh -huh. but my daughter's 15. And I gotta be careful to set her a perfect example. But if there's a light in the window, then you'll be expected. Arrivederci. Good evening. Signora Della Rosa. Is something the matter? I didn't expect to see you looking so pretty. You, you are a young little widow. <laughs> you are, uh, fix yourself up. Uh, I've been to the ideal barbers. I got the whole works. You got rose oil in your hair. See, si. all your little rosa. You like the smell of it? See. Si. Uh, shall we sit down? I guess that's better than standing up. Shall we sit down on that sofa? You take the sofa. I'll sit down on this chair. You don't like to sit down on a sofa? I talk just as good on a chair as I talk on a sofa. What do you, uh, hit your shoulders so much like that for, huh? Oh, that, that's a nervous habit. Oh. I thought maybe the suit don't fit you good. I bought this suit to get married in four years ago. But you didn't get married. I give her the girl... A zircon instead of a diamond. She had it examined, the door was slammed in my face. <laughs> I think maybe I do the same thing myself. By the zircon? No, slam the door. Her eyes were not sincere looking. You, you've got sincere looking eyes. 
Uh, give me a hand so I could tell your fortune. Oh, tell me if you can... If my husband... If my... What do you see? I see uh, two men in your life. One very handsome. One not handsome. His ears are too big, but not as big as his heart. He has three dependents and enough love for three men. Oh, you talk a sweet mouth. Well, what's in that fancy red box? That's a, a present I bought for a nervous but nice little lady. Open it. Ah, oh, chocolate. Hey. Oh, gracias, gracias. But I'm too fat. You're not fat. You're just, just pleasing and plump. Don't talk that way. It makes me nervous. I get nervous, I start to cry. Uh, hey, let's talk about something to take your mind off your troubles. You, you say you got a young daughter? Her name is Rosa. She's only 15. But she's got a boyfriend, does she? She met a sailor. Oh, dear. No wonder you seem so nervous. I don't want to let her go out with this sailor. He wears a gold ring in his ear. Oh, no, no, son. Mm. Did, did he have a tattoo? Did who have what? The sailor, friend of your daughter. Did he have a tattoo? Why do you ask me that? Ah, because most sailors, they got a tattoo. How do I know if he had a tattoo or not? I got a tattoo. You got a tattoo? Si, si, veramente. What kind of tattoo you got? What kind do you think? Ah, uh, I think you got um, a South Sea girl without no clothes on. No, huh? no South Sea girl. Then you got uh, a big red heart with mama written on it. Uh, wrong again, Baroness. Uh, uh, wait, I'll take off my shirt and show you. What are you doing? It's hard to take off your shirt. Now wait, wait till I tell you to look. One second now. Okay, look. Ah. No. No, not a rose. See, si. see, si, on a rose. Oh, I don't, I don't feel very good. The air. Que fate, que fate, que di? The house has a tin uh, roof on it. The air is closed. I can't breathe. Good that. I didn't mean to surprise you. No, please, don't talk about it. Anybody could have a rose tattoo. It don't mean nothing. Uh, when did you get that tattoo put on your chest? I got it tonight, after supper. That's what I thought. I wanted to be close to you, to make you happy. I want so bad to... Hey! What's the matter, Baroness? I, I only want to make you happy. Tell it to the Marines. You got that tattoo? And that box of candy after supper, and you came here to fool me. I got the box of chocolate a long time ago. How long ago? If that's not too personal a question. I got it the night the door was slammed in my face by the girl I give the zircon. <sighs> well, let that be a lesson to you. Don't try to fool women. You're not smart enough. I guess you want me to go away and give back the red shirt. Oh, keep the shirt. I don't want it back. And stop hitching your shoulders. You make me nervous. Well, is it my fault you've been a widow too long? You make a mistake. You make a mistake. Both of us make a mistake. Hey, uh, we should have been friends. But I think we meet the wrong day. Suppose I go out, I come in the door again, and we start all over. Oh. No. No, it's no use. The day was wrong to begin with. It started with them two women. They told me today that my husband was mixed up with um, a woman at the square roof. Hey, what was the name on that shirt? On that slip of paper, do you remember? I remember the name because I know the woman. The name was Estelle Hohengard. You take me there. Take me to the square roof. Wait, wait, there's something I have to get for you. This I take with me. Hey, Baroness, who do you want to take them scissors for? To cut the lying tongue out of a woman's mouth. You take me there. They got a cover charge I'll there. charge them a cover. The fund will start at midnight. I'll start it sooner. The floor show commences at midnight. I'll commence it. Now, you take me there now. I'll cut the heart out of that woman. She cut the heart out of me. Uh, nobody's going to cut the heart out of nobody. What are you doing? That's Flanard, 970. Hey, you ain't paid for the call this afternoon yet. Who are you calling now? I want to speak to the blackjack dealer, please. Mr. Stow Hohengarten. No, don't talk to that woman. She lied. Oh, not a Stow Hohengarten. She deals a straight game of cards. 
Estelle, this is Monte Carlo. I got a question to ask you, which is a very personal question. It's got to do with a very good-looking truck driver, not living now, but once on a time thought to have been a very well-known character at the square roof. His name was... Hey, Baroni, so what was his name? Rosario Della Rosa. Rosario Della Rosa was the name. Rivero? Rivero? Give me that phone. Hello? This is the wife speaking. What do you know of my husband? What is the lie? Don't you remember? I brought you the rose-colored silk to make him a shirt. You said, for a man. And I said, yes, for a man that's wild, like a gypsy. But if you think I'm a liar, come here and let me show you his rose tattooed on my chest. <laughs> what are you doing? This is the earth. That holds the ashes of a road. What an answer. A minute ago, I pushed you away. Now I do not push you away. Buona notte, Mr. Monte Cavallo. You, you make me go home now? No, no. Can't take the thing. You make out like you're going. You drive the truck down the road and hide it. Then you come back, and I leave the back door open for you to come in. Ah, 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 capisco, capisco. capisco. Arrivederci! Buona notte! Buona notte, buona notte! And give them my love! Give everybody my love! Arrivederci! Tomorrow. Where to? Guatemala. Is that a long trip? After Guatemala, Rio, and Buenos Aires, then around the Straits of Magellan and back up the west coast of South America, putting in at three ports before we dock at San Francisco. This was the happiest day of my life. This is the saddest night. Is your mother asleep? Mm-hmm. Probably dreaming about my father. Is that what she wants me to do, just dream about Ralph? Well, she knows that her Rosa is a rose. And she wants her rose to have someone better than me. Better than you? Well, you see me through rose-colored glass. I see you with love. Yes, but your mama sees me with common sense. Honey, I gotta go. You'd have to break my arms, too. Oh, Rosa, you want to drive me crazy. I want you not to leave me. You're a very young girl, 15. 15 is too young. Gotta save some of those feelings for when you're grown up. I am grown up. Grown enough to be married. Oh, I gotta be going, I gotta. I won't let you. Now listen to me, Rosa. Today on that island, I remember that promise I made your mother and I kept it. What time in the afternoon must you be on the boat? Five. Why? What will you be doing till five? I'm going to check in at some flea bag hotel on North Rampart Street, and then I'm going to get loaded. Do me a little favor. Before you get loaded, will you look in the waiting room at the Greyhound bus station, please, at 12 o'clock noon? Why? You might find me there, waiting for you. Well, your mama would never let you go. I'll find some way. I want you to give me that little gold ring on your finger. I want to give you my heart to keep forever. And ever and ever. In all my life, I never knew nothing so sweet. It's you and Milo. Look for me at 12 noon. I'll be there somehow. Rosa, you stay here. You gonna call the police? I'll get rid of him. You stay here. I'm coming with you. You hear me? Stay here. I'm not by myself. You've been drinking, too. You can smell it. 
Now what? Hey, you, man. What are you doing in my house, huh? You get up. Get out of here. You want to call the police? What an ace. I have a beautiful dream of you. Beautiful You dream. get out of here. Quick. What an ace, huh? I love get you. Get out. But last night Don't you... Don't talk say... to me. Don't say nothing. Get out before I kill you. What an ace, huh? I come back tonight, man. Police! What an ace, sir. Whoa, boy. Who was that man? I, I don't know how he got in. Maybe the, maybe the back door was open. Huh? Oh. Yes, maybe it was. Maybe he, maybe he climbed in the window. He fell down the chimney, maybe. Rosa, I want you to understand about that man. That was a man. That was a man. That, that was a man. Can't you think of a lie, Mama? He was a truck driver, Carter. He got into a fight. And uh, I took pity on him. I, I let him sleep under Sophie. Carter. Carter. He was Sicilian. He had rose oil in his hair and the rose tattoo of your father. I dreamed he was your father. I'm not... I'm sorry. How beautiful is my daughter. Mama... If I leave now, I can still see Jack before a ship sail. I'm going. Go then, Rosa. Go to the boy. I'll be back tonight. Rosa. Rosa. Sit up here. Asunta. I heard you call the police. Are you in trouble? Asunta, the urn is broke. The ashes are spilt on the floor, and I cannot touch them. But there are no ashes. A man, when he burns, he leaves only a handful of ashes. No woman can hold him. The wind must blow him away. Under the Lafayette! Serafina. He is standing on the road. He has no shirt on. But on his chest is the tattoo of a rose. Asunta, I'll tell you something maybe you won't believe. Oh, Phil, it is impossible to tell me anything that I don't believe. When I hear his voice, I feel someday that I will be a woman again. I feel on my breast the burning of the rose. Someday I shall carry again in my body two lives. Two. Two lives again. Two. Rande della Felice. Dove vai, Serafina? Vengo. Vengo, amore. Baronesa. Amore. Baronesa. Maybe now I call you Serafina. <laughs> You have just heard the Best Plays production of The Rose Tattoo, starring Maureen Stapleton and Eli Wallach. And here once more is your host, drama critic John Chapman. Our thanks and our applause to Miss Stapleton, Mr. Wallach, and company for their performance. Next week, we shall try a different kind of comedy, Kiss the Boys Goodbye. At the time she wrote this hit, the author signed her name Claire Booth. She is better known now as our ambassador to Italy, Claire Booth Luce. This comedy won new fame for an actress, Helen Clare, and we shall have Miss Clare with us next week in her original role. This is Chapman saying goodbye until then. The Rose Tattoo was transcribed and adapted for radio by Earl Hamlet. Heard the cast were Jane Webb as Rosa, with Louis Van Ruten, John McGovern, Agnes Young, Anne Diamond, Bob Hastings, Virginia Payne, and from the original Broadway cast, Jane Hoffman as Flora and Augusta Morigi as Asunta. Best Plays is an NBC production supervised by William Welch and directed by Edward King.
Your announcer is Fred Collins. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Let's go to the opera. The Book of the Month Club welcomes you to the 25th in its series of opera programs sung in English. This evening, in response to many requests from the radio audience, our music is drawn entirely from one opera, Richard Strauss, Der Rosenkavalier. Our soloists are three Metropolitan Opera artists, Mimi Benzel, Mary Henderson, and Martha Lifton, and Mr. Robert Marshall of the concert stage and radio. The orchestra is under the direction of the young American conductor, Mr. Thomas Sherman. <laughs> Rosen Cavalier is the story of a princess who tries to recapture her youth in a romance with a young nobleman, Octavian. But Octavian finds real love with another. The mood of the opera is set in this sparkling music of the prelude. Mr. Thomas Sherman has begun our program of excerpts from Richard Strauss' Der Rosen Cavalier with a prelude to the opera. In the first act, the princess is upset by a visit from her cousin, a coarse middle-aged baron. He wants to marry Sophie, the pretty daughter of a merchant, and asks the princess to make the traditional arrangements. After the baron leaves the princess, she expresses her disgust for his vulgarity and thinks back over her own unhappy marriage, which was arranged in the same cold-blooded way. 
Mary Henderson as the princess sings, Now There He Goes. That was Mary Henderson as the princess in Garros and Cavalier, singing, Now There He Goes. The princess is continually being interrupted by all sorts of hangers-on. Among them is an Italian tenor who seeks her patronage. In this aria, Strauss imitates the old Italian operatic style. Robert Marshall, as the Italian tenor, sings, Di Rigori Armato.
That was Robert Marshall singing the tenor aria from Der Rosenkavalier. Following an 18th century tradition, the part of the young nobleman, Octavian, is sung by a woman. In the opera, Octavian is chosen as the Rosenkavalier, or Knight of the Rose, to represent the baron in the presentation of a rose to Sophie. During the ceremony, Octavian and Sophie become infatuated with each other. Mimi Benzel as Sophie and Martha Lipton as Octavian sing the lovely duet, Mine is the Honor, from Der Rosenkavalier. <laughs>
audience applauds Mimi Benzel and Martha Lipton, who just sang a duet from the second act of Eros and Cavalier. We shall hear other selections from this opera presently. During the brief intermission, I want to tell you about a new book just published, titled A Treasury of Grand Opera. It is certain to appeal particularly to you who are listening to this program. It gives a perfectly grand presentation of some of the greatest operas of all time. And with its attractive format and beautiful illustrations by Raffaello Bozzoni, son of the great pianist, it is one of the handsomest books of the season. The editor, Henry Simon, gives all the necessary background information you need for each opera, how it came to be written, its place in the composer's life, its literary and stage history. Then, scene by scene, he tells the story of the opera, analyzing the music for the layman. Finally, there is the actual musical score of all the principal arias, duets, and so forth. 300 pages in all, arranged to delight the heart of the average amateur pianist and with a separate vocal line. In addition, Mr. Buzzoni, the illustrator, has prefaced each opera with a lovely full-page illustration in two colors and each scene with striking black-and-white drawings. A Treasury of Grand Opera is a book you can't afford to miss as a music lover. Even when this beautiful book was in preparation, the Book of the Month Club was so intrigued with its possibilities that it was uh, set aside as a reserve book dividend. Now the club will distribute the Treasury of Grand Opera to members as their book dividend for January and February of next year. Meanwhile, the Book of the Month Club is offering a copy free to new members who begin their subscription now. Write to the Book of the Month Club care of this station if you... The Jack Benny Program. Quality of product is essential to continuing success. <laughs> Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So round, so firm, so fully packed. So free and easy on the draw. LSMFT. 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 Of course. You said it. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So round, so firm, so fully packed. So free and easy on the draw. At 49, American. Year after year, at market after market, independent tobacco experts present at the auctions can see the makers of Lucky Strike consistently select and buy the finer, the lighter, the naturally milder Lucky Strike tobacco. Ripe, rich tobacco, fine Lucky Strike tobacco. That means real deep down smoking enjoyment for you. Profit by the experience of tobacco experts. Remember, in a cigarette, it's the tobacco that counts. So smoke that smoke of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. The Lucky Strike program, starring Jack Benny with Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Larry Stevens, and yours truly, Don Wilson. And now, ladies and gentlemen, since this is our first program of the new year, I'd like to bring you a man who has made two important resolutions. The first resolution was to give every member of his cast a raise. The second resolution was to forget the first one. <laughs> and here he is, Jack Benny. Thank you, thank you. Hello again, this is Jack Benny talking, and Don, Don, I thought that was a very unfunny introduction. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, I happen to think it was very funny. Well, I don't care what you think. <laughs> you know, you may not know this, Don, but you can get brand new, shiny 1946 announcers without waiting for Detroit to make up its mind. <laughs> You know, I wouldn't mind having a thin announcer for a change. I'm getting pretty sick of looking at a pot that big without flowers in it. <laughs> so just... Oh, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Happy New Year, Don. Well, same to you, Mary. Hey, what about me? Aren't you going to thank me for the swell time I showed you New Year's Eve at that nightclub? Yeah, but next time, let's not go home at 11.30. <laughs> now, Mary, you know very well that we didn't get home till daybreak. Boy, was I raring. <laughs> you should have seen him, Don. Jack drank one bottle of Coca-Cola, jumped up on the chandelier, beat his chest, and yelled, Look at me, I'm Tarzan. <laughs> yes, sir. And he fooled everybody if he hadn't opened his shirt. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, yeah? Well, how about that Tarzan yell I gave? That wasn't a Tarzan yell. You sat on a hot light bulb. <laughs> now, Mary. And then he drank another bottle of Coca-Cola without a chaser yet. <laughs> Guy can have a little fun, Candy. Anyway, I was the life of the party. You were nothing but a big show-off. I was not a show-off. Then why did you ask the waiter to throw you out? <laughs> I just did that for a gag. Now, Mary, you know very well we had a marvelous time. We danced all evening. Okay, I had a marvelous time. You're darn tootin'. <laughs> Say, Mary, is Jack a good dancer? I don't know. It's the first time I ever did the minuet. <laughs> oh, stop, will you? You've done the minuet before. Yeah, but not while the band was playing Cow Cow Boogie. <laughs> Mary, now, on New Year's Eve, you gotta let yourself go, you Say, know. Jack, what'd you do at the stroke of 12? What did he do? He said, Happy New Year, took an aspirin, and passed out. <laughs> well, I wasn't out long, sister. <laughs> and, Don, when I came to, I went around and kissed every woman in the place. You did? Yeah. And Mary was so jealous, she tried to stop me. I wasn't jealous. I was only trying to tell you the place was closed, and those women were mopping up. <laughs> I was wondering why they, why they all wore upsweep hairdo. <laughs> anyway, let's forget about me. How about you, Don? Did you have a good time New Year's Eve? Oh, I sure did, Jack. At the stroke of 12, I crawled out of the fireplace and filled all the stockings with toys. Fill the stockings with toys? On New Year's Eve? Don, you, you were seven days late. I know, I was stuck in the chimney. <laughs> Well, that's terrible. You could have fallen down and hurt yourself. Yes, but I was lucky enough to catch the flu. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you... You, uh... You what? I was in the chimney, but I was lucky enough to catch the flu. <laughs> Don, um... Uh... Don, I, uh, I have an arrangement with Abbott and Costello. We leave them alone, and they leave us alone. <laughs> so, let's, so let's try it. Well, happy... Hello, Larry. Happy New Year. Same to you, Jack. Did you, Jack? Why, well, Larry, what's come over you? You've always called me Mr. Benny. Well, don't you remember? On New Year's Eve, you said I could stop calling you Mr. Benny and call you Jack. When did I tell you that? Right after your second Coke. <laughs> you mean before the aspirin tablet? <laughs> well, Larry, I still like the idea of you calling me Mr. Benny. I mean, it adds a little dignity to the program and shows you have respect for me. Uh, do you want me to call you Mr. Benny, too? No, no, that won't be necessary, Mary. Gee, I can call him Jack. <laughs> and now, folks... Wait till the girls at the May Company hear about this. Now, wait a minute. Don't get smart, Miss Livingston. Oh, do call me Mary. Now, cut that out! <laughs> Come on, Larry, let's have your song. Now, Mary, you behave yourself, will you? It's a grand night for singing The moon is flying high And somewhere a bird who is bound to be heard Is throwing his heart at the sky It's a grand night for singing The stars are bright above the earth is aglow, and to add to the show, I think I am falling in love, falling, falling in love. Maybe it's more than the earth, shiny and silvery blue. Maybe the reason I'm feeling this way has something to do with you. It's a grand night for singing. The moon is flying high. And somewhere a bird who is bound he'll be heard is throwing his heart at the sky. It's a grand night for singing. 
stars are bright above. The earth is aglow, and to add to the show, I think I am falling in love. Falling, falling in love. Falling. for singing sung by Larry Stevens. And very good, Larry. By the way, kid, uh, you uh, you made a record of that song, didn't you? Yes, I did. Well, it's a great number. I'd like to have one of those records, Larry. Well, why don't you buy one, Mr. Benny? It only costs 75 cents. Well, I, I thought about buying one, kid, but you see, uh, I just wanted your song, and the record has something else on the other side, you see? So I, I didn't feel like paying for uh, both sides. Maybe they'll slice it for you. <laughs> No, no, I asked them. <laughs> and, you sh and you should have heard... Hello, Dante. Hi, you, Libby. And a good, good evening to you, Mr. Benny. What? <laughs> Mr. Benny, Phil, what's that? One of my New Year's resolutions. Respect for the boss. I made it on New Year's Eve. Well, that's a nice resolution. They told me I made it, and I'm going to keep it. <laughs> I thought so. Phil, I never saw a guy like you. You keep going to parties, but you never know what happens. You can't even remember if you've had a good time. Jackson, when I get up the next morning, brush my teeth, and the bristles fall out of the toothbrush, I know I had a good time. <laughs> oh. Hey, look, uh, how about you, Jackson? Did you have fun New Year's Eve? Uh, yes, Phil. I went over to the... Uh, That's all, Jackson. If you can remember, you didn't have fun. <laughs> well, I can't remember all of it. And, Phil, as long as you're making resolutions, you could have made another one. During this new year, why don't you learn something about music? You mean I should be like Stokowski? No, Phil, no. All I ask is, all I ask is when you look at your music stand and see a piece of paper that has lines across it and little black dots all over it, don't turn to your boys and say, there's a spy around here, this stuff is in coal. <laughs> Little as they know, it embarrasses them. <laughs> all right, Jackson, all right. That'll be another one of my resolutions. Oh, speaking of resolutions, Jack, I made a resolution that during 1946, I'm going to find new ways to tell people about Lucky Strike cigarettes. You are, kiddo? Yes. <laughs> Instead of saying LSMFT stands for Lucky Strike means fine tobacco, I'm going to say it backwards. What? I'm going to say TFMSL stands for tobacco fine means strike lucky. <laughs> But, Don, isn't that a bit ridic? <laughs> well, Jack, at least it's different. Remember how I always used to say lucky strikes are so round, so firm, so fully packed, so free and easy on the draw? Uh-huh. Well, listen to it this way. Draw the uneasy and free so, packed fully so, firm so, round so. <laughs> well, mouth my shut. <laughs> Pack so, firm so, round so. Rin so. Happy little walk. Mary! <laughs> Don. <laughs> Don, if I were you, I'd forget about doing the commercial backwards. Just do it the regular way. Well, okay. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we will have a number by Phil Harrison as orchestra who will play it not backwards, not forwards, but in their usual manner. <laughs> They'll start in the middle and blast both ways. <laughs> All right, Phil, let's... Oh, have... wait a minute, Jack. <laughs> what is it, Mary? I meant to tell you that the way over here, I stopped off at your house, and while I was there, Fred Allen called. Fred Allen, huh? Well, what did the dead end of Allen's Alley have to say? <laughs> I haven't heard such language as Mama stepped on Papa's bare foot with her track shoes on. <laughs> well, Mary, Allen didn't have to use that kind of language, even if he was talking about me. It wasn't his fault, Jack. He was reading one of those contest letters. Oh, 
He's just jealous because more people hate me than him. <laughs> That's all. What about the contest, Jack? Have the winners been picked yet? Uh, not yet, Don. The judges are reading the letters as fast as they can. But on Sunday, January 27, three weeks from tonight, we'll announce the winners. Three weeks from tonight. It won't be very long until I'll be paying off the prize. Hey, Jackson, as long as you're paying off, how about that little bet I want from you on the Rose Bowl game? Phil, I didn't see the game, so the bet's off. <laughs> uh, I mean, how, how do I know that USC lost? Huh? Are you kidding? The score was printed in every newspaper in the country. So what? Last Wednesday, I picked up the newspaper on my front lawn, and it said no rain today. Paper was so wet, I could hardly read it. <laughs> So don't be too sure about USC losing. Jackson, are you crazy? 90,000 people were at that game and saw Alabama win. I don't care if 100,000 people saw. I'm not taking the word of a lot of strangers. <laughs> That's the way rumors get started. <laughs> I'm not taking anybody's word. That's why Jack went to Europe last summer. He wanted to make sure the war was over. Yeah. He hasn't been to Japan yet, so he's still got his house blacked out. Mary, let's drop the whole... I'll get it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny. This is Rochester. Rochester. Rochester, you know I'm on the air. What did you call for? It's about Nottingham, your New English butler. He must be crazy. What's the matter now? When you left the house this morning, did you tell him to take the Christmas tree off the grand piano, cut it up into little pieces, and burn it? Yeah, did it fit in the fireplace? Oh, but the keyboard! <laughs> well, Rochester, do you mean to say that Nottingham damaged my grand piano? Damaged it? Boss, you know in front where it says Steinway and Sons? Yes. Well, the father's in business for himself now. <laughs> Oh, my God. Rochester, why didn't you stop him? Stop him? Smock him? He wouldn't listen to me. <laughs> but my grand piano, it's ruined. I told you I saved the keyboard. The keyboard? Why would you just save that? Boss, you know how I feel about ivory. <laughs> I should have known. Well, Rochester, did anything else happen? Not until the fireman got there. The fireman? Yeah, when Nottingham threw the pen in the fireplace, the flame shot up all over the roof. Well, did the firemen put it out? They sure did. I went outside and watched them. They climbed up a ladder, stuck a hose down the chimney, and turned it on full force. Uh-huh. And, boss, I couldn't understand how a chimney could hold so much water till I opened the front door. <laughs> what? That tide hit me so hard, I thought Frank Thomas was coaching it. <laughs> Don't tell me the house was flooded. Flooded? You know that picture of Whistler's mother you got in the library? Yes. Well, the frame's still there, but she's in the living room diving for pennies. <laughs> Rochester, stop with the jokes. Did you save my parrot? Boss, the last time I saw your parrot, he was sailing down the hall in your dirty hat shouting, Mr. Christian, come here! <laughs> Oh, don't be so silly. Now, let the water out the back door. We might as well water the garden while we've got it. <laughs> okay, goodbye. Goodbye. What happened, Jack? What, ha what always happens when I leave the house? Come on, Phil, let's have a band number. <laughs>
Snow, played by Phil Harris and his orchestra. Now, ladies and hey, gentlemen... Hey, Jackson, come on. How about paying me that dough you owe me on the Rose Bowl game? Phil, I told you I didn't see the game. But, Jack, you said you went to the Rose Bowl. How come you didn't see the game? Well... I'll tell you, Don. He wouldn't be interested. Yes, I would. What happened, Mary? Oh. Well... Jack had tickets for the game, and he told Phil and me to meet him in front of Tunnel 16 at 1.30. 1.30, 1.30. Who was that? Well, when Phil and I got to the bowl, Jack wasn't there yet. So we waited and waited. You should have seen the crowd down. There were thousands of people pushing and shoving. Come on, Phil, let's go in. We can't, Libby. We've got to wait for Jackson. He's got the tickets. Why didn't he come with us? Well, you know how romantic Jack is. He's bringing his girlfriend, Gladys Abisco, to the game. Yeah, she's a pretty cute kid when she's all dressed up. You know, I think Jackson's kind of stuck on that little waitress. Yeah, but he's getting indifferent now that meat rationing is over. <laughs> you know him. Hey, Mary, Mary, look. Here comes Jackson and Gladys now. Gee, Gladys, I never saw you look so nice. You're sure pretty when you get all dialed up. Thanks, Speedy. <laughs> I mean it. Boy, am I lucky I met you. Ain't it the truth? <laughs> That's fate for you. You know, I'd never have met you if I hadn't been hungry that night. Gee, I'll never forget. I was driving along looking for a place to eat, and I... Drove right past Ciro's and the Trocadero and the Macambo. And it was just fate that made me turn into Simon's drive-in. <laughs> and there, like a vision of loveliness, you came toward me. Gee, you smelled so good. Yeah, it was chicken gumbo night. <laughs> Twenty-five cents a bowl. A meal in itself. Oh, look, Gladys, there's Mary and Phil. Well, here we are, kids. Gladys, you know Mary, don't you? Sure. Hello, Mary. Hello, Gladys. Gee, that's a pretty fur. Did you trap it yourself? <laughs> I should say not. Speedy ran over it on the way out here. Gladys. Hit it again, Jackson. It's still wiggling. <laughs> don't be funny. Gladys meant that it slipped off her shoulder and ran over it accidentally. Didn't you, Gladys? You tell him, big boy. You got the lips for it. <laughs> yeah. Come on, kids. Here's our gate. Let's go in. Tickets, tickets. Hold your own stubs, please. Here you are. Oh, hello, Gladys. Hello, Annie. What's the special tonight? Beef soup and boiled potatoes. <laughs> oh, come on, Gladys. Forget business for a while. Okay, Speedy. Here's tunnel 16 over this way, Jackson. Now, let's stick together. Say, Gladys, you still work at the Shamrock Cafe? No, I'm back at the drive-in. Speedy thought I ought to be outside where it's healthy, yeah. <laughs> Darn right. What's the use of being in California if you can't enjoy the sun? Yeah, but I sure wish I could get off the night shift. <laughs> you will, honey. Just save your tips. That's all. I do, but every time I get a little ahead, you want to go to a movie or something? <laughs> Well, it won't always be that way. Hey, look who's here. Hiya, Gladys. Happy New Year. Same to you, Lefty. Lefty? Hmm, you know everybody, don't you? That's Lefty Flanagan. What a sport. He always orders a la carte. <laughs> don't talk to him. But Lefty's a big tipper. Oh. Hiya, Lefty. <laughs> now, let's see. Where do we... Hey, look, there's a hot dog stand. Let's make with a mustard. Yeah, want a hot dog, Gladys? I'm not hungry right now. You can get me one when we're inside. Better get one now, Gladys. You know Seedy. That's Speedy. <laughs> All right, I'll go over and buy the hot dog. You kids wait here so you won't get lost, huh? Hey, mister, four hot dogs, please. Yes, sir. Pickle in the middle and the mustard on top. Just the way you like them and they're all red hot. <laughs> World Cup is coming up. <laughs> How, uh... How, uh... How much are they? Uh, three cents a piece. Three cents? Uh-huh. Why do you sell them so cheap? Taste them. <laughs> oh, say, do they look... Say, they do look like pretty tough weenies. Tough, ho, ho, ho. <laughs> what suitcase handles they would make? <laughs> Well, they still look good to me. Give me four. Uh, 
What kind of mustard do you want on them? What kind? Well, I got strong, mild, and Christmas night. <laughs> oh, mild, I guess. Okay, here you are. Four hot dogs covered with mild mustard. Thanks. Gee, they're kind of messy. Haven't you got some rolls to put them in? With rolls, it's five cents. With pickles, it's ten cents. With relish, it's 15 cents. And with my cabinet of soda, you couldn't afford it. <laughs> Well, just give me the roll. Here you are. Here you are. Thank you. Pickle in the middle and the mustard on top, just the way you like them in the roll. Right? Yeah. Here you are, kids. Take your hot dog. Thanks. Gee, I'm thirsty. What are we going to drink with our hot dog? Here you are, Gladys. Put that back in your pocket. <laughs> Now, let's go in. Stubbs, please. Let's see the numbers on your stubs. Here you are. Right this way. Just follow me at... Oh, hello, Gladys. Why, hello, Nick. How are things? Fine. I'm on parole now. <laughs> come on, come on. Show us our seats. Hey, listen to the cheering section. Hey, these seats are okay, aren't they, kids? Yeah, right on the 40-yard line. Hey, Jackson, care to make a little bet on the game? Okay, Phil, you take Alabama, I'll take USC. Hi, pal. Hey, is this seat taken, old pal, old pal? <laughs> oh, great. Look, mister, how about sitting someplace else? No, thanks. I never touch it. <laughs> hmm. This would happen to me. How much do you want to bet, Jackson? How much do? Any amount you say, brother. Just name it. Okay, 50 bucks. Hmm, 50 dollars? Okay, it's a bet. We must be sitting higher than I thought. <laughs> Don't worry, I know what I'm doing. Peanuts, popcorn, chewing gum, peanuts, popcorn. Hello, Gladys, chewing gum. <laughs> oh, hello, Ryzen. I'm going to say, Gladys, must you say quiet, hello? Quiet, quiet. I don't want to hear the game. The game hasn't started yet. No, thanks. I never touch it. <laughs> Gee, they're a husky bunch of fellows. Yeah, listen to that crowd. Here they come running right past us. Hello, Gladys! 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 Now, look, I... Son, Speedy, dear, the boys on the USC team always eat at the drive-in. They voted me Miss Pigskin of 1945. I don't care what they voted you. Gosh, what a crowd. Yeah, I'll bet there's 90,000 people here. Oh, that's terrible. 90,000 people without a home. <laughs> What are you talking about? This housing shortage is terrible. Look, they've got homes. They're here for the game. Oh, you're just saying that because I'm your pal. You're not my pal. I never saw you before in my life. No, thanks. I never touched it. I don't know. I don't know why I always have to... Hey, Jackson, look. Here comes the Alabama team. Hey, those Alabama fellas look pretty good, don't they, Gladys? Thank you. Oh, Gladys, you all! <laughs> Gladys, you all! That's the last straw. I'm leaving. I'm not even going to stay and see the game. And let me tell you something else, Gladys. You and I are through. Our engagement is broken. Goodbye. But, Speedy, if you're breaking our engagement, what about the ring? I'm not giving it back to you. <laughs> Goodbye. So there you are, Don. That's exactly what happened at the Rose Bowl on New Year's Day. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, three weeks from tonight on January 27th, we will announce the winners of the I Can't Stand Jack Benny contest. Now, Jack will be back in just a minute, but first, here is my good friend, L.A. Speedy Riggs. What do auctioneers, buyers, and warehousemen, men who know tobacco best, say about Lucky Strike? Well, just listen to the words of Mr. Thomas Jefferson Green, independent tobacco auctioneer of Walnut Cove, North Carolina. He said, For many years, I've noticed that at the different markets where I've been auctioneering, Lucky Strike has bought tobacco that was ripe and mild. So for my own cigarette, naturally, I picked Lucky Strike. Been smoking them for 21 years. Independent tobacco experts like Mr. Green surely know that it takes fine tobacco to make a fine cigarette. And Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Yes, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So smoke that smoke of fine tobacco, Lucky Strike. 
So round, so firm, so fully packed, so free and easy on the draw. The famous tobacco auctioneers heard on tonight's program are Mr. L.A. Speed Riggs of Goldsboro, North Carolina. And Mr. F.E. Boone of Lexington, Kentucky. At 49, I'm American. And this is Basil Risedale speaking for Lucky Strike. L.S.M.F.T. 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 A fact known the world over. Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. So round, so firm, so fully packed. So free and easy on the draw. Mary, I wish you'd stop telling Don everything that happens to me. Oh, I'm sorry, Jack. I won't do it again. Okay. Say, Mary, how would you like to go out to dinner now? And later we'll go dancing. No, not while you're wearing Gladys's ring. Well, I can't get it off. <laughs> Good night, folks. <laughs> This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Brian Roberg, www.brianroberg.org. The Innocence of Father Brown by G. K. Chesterton The Secret Garden Aristide Valentin, chief of the Paris police, was late for his dinner, and some of his guests began to arrive before him. These were, however, reassured by his confidential servant, Ivan, the old man with a scar and a face almost as gray as his mustaches, who always sat at a table in the entrance hall, a hall hung with weapons. Valentin's house was perhaps as peculiar and celebrated as its master. It was an old house, with high walls and tall poplars almost overhanging the same, but the oddity, and perhaps the police value, of its architecture was this, that there was no ultimate exit at all except through this front door, which was guarded by Ivan and the armory. The garden was large and elaborate, and there were many exits from the house into the garden. But there was no exit from the garden into the world outside. All round it ran a tall, smooth, unscalable wall with special spikes at the top. No bad garden, perhaps, for a man to reflect in whom some hundred criminals had sworn to kill. As Ivan explained to the guests, their host had telephoned that he was detained for ten minutes. He was, in truth, making some last arrangements about executions and such ugly things. And though these duties were rootedly repulsive to him, he always performed them with precision. Ruthless in the pursuit of criminals, he was very mild about their punishment. Since he had been supreme over French, and largely over European, palatial methods, his great influence had been honorably used for the mitigation of sentences and the purification of prisons. He was one of the great humanitarian French freethinkers, and the only thing wrong with them is that they make mercy even colder than justice. When Valentin arrived, he was already dressed in black clothes and the red rosette, an elegant figure, his dark beard already streaked with gray. He went straight through his house to his study, which opened on the grounds behind. The garden door of it was open, and after he had carefully locked his box in its official place, he stood for a few seconds at the open door looking out upon the garden. 
A sharp moon was fighting with the flying rags and tatters of a storm, and Valentin regarded it with a wistfulness unusual in such scientific natures as his. Perhaps such scientific natures have some psychic prevision of the most tremendous problem of their lives. From any such occult mood, at least, he quickly recovered, for he knew he was late and that his guests had already begun to arrive. A glance at his drawing-room when he entered it was enough to make certain that his principal guest was not there, at any rate. He saw all the other pillars of the little party. He saw Lord Galloway, the English ambassador, a choleric old man with a russet face like an apple, wearing the blue ribbon of the garter. He saw Lady Galloway, slim and thread-like, with silver hair and a face sensitive and superior. He saw her daughter, Lady Margaret Graham, a pale and pretty girl with an elfish face and copper-colored hair. He saw the Duchess of Mont Saint Michel, black-eyed and opulent, and with her, her two daughters, black-eyed and opulent also. He saw Dr. Simon, a typical French scientist, with glasses, a pointed brown beard, and a forehead barred with those parallel wrinkles which are the penalty of superciliousness, since they come through constantly elevating the eyebrows. He saw Father Brown, of Cobble, in Essex, whom he had recently met in England. He saw, perhaps with more interest than any of these, a tall man in uniform who had bowed to the Galloways without receiving any very hearty acknowledgment, and who now advanced alone to pay his respects to his host. This was Commandant O'Brien of the French Foreign Legion. He was a slim, yet somewhat swaggering figure, clean-shaven, dark-haired, and blue-eyed, and, as seemed natural in an officer of that famous regiment of victorious failures and successful suicides, he had an air at once dashing and melancholy. He was by birth an Irish gentleman, and in boyhood had known the Galloways, especially Margaret Graham. He had left his country after some crash of debts, and now expressed his complete freedom from British etiquette by swinging about in uniform, saber, and spurs. When he bowed to the ambassador's family, Lord and Lady Galloway bent stiffly, and Lady Margaret looked away. But for whatever old causes such people might be interested in each other, their distinguished host was not specially interested in them. No one of them, at least, was in his eyes the guest of the evening. Valentin was expecting, for special reasons, a man of worldwide fame, whose friendship he had secured during some of his great detective tours and triumphs in the United States. He was expecting Julius K. Brain, that multimillionaire whose colossal and even crushing endowments of small religions have occasioned so much easy sport and easier solemnity for the American and English papers. Nobody could quite make out whether Mr. Brain was an atheist or a Mormon or a Christian scientist, but he was ready to pour money into any intellectual vessel, so long as it was an untried vessel. One of his hobbies was to wait for the American Shakespeare, a hobby more patient than angling. He admired Walt Whitman, but thought that Luke P. Tanner of Paris, Pennsylvania, was more progressive than Whitman any day. He liked anything that he thought progressive. He thought Valentin progressive, thereby doing him a grave injustice. The solid appearance of Julius K. Brain in the room was as decisive as a dinner bell. He had this great quality, which very few of us can claim, that his presence was as big as his absence. He was a huge fellow, as fat as he was tall, clad in complete evening black, 
without so much relief as a watch chain or a ring. His hair was white and well brushed back like a German's. His face was red, fierce and cherubic, with one dark tuft under the lower lip that threw up that otherwise infantile visage with an effect theatrical and even Mephistophelian. Not long, however, did that salon merely stare at the celebrated American. His lateness had already become a domestic problem, and he was sent with all speed into the dining room with Lady Galloway on his arm. Except on one point, the Galloways were genial and casual enough. So long as Lady Margaret did not take the arm of that adventurer, O'Brien, her father was quite satisfied. And she had not done so. She had decorously gone in with Dr. Simon. Nevertheless, old Lord Galloway was restless and almost rude. He was diplomatic enough during dinner, but when, over the cigars, three of the younger men, Simon the doctor, Brown the priest, and the detrimental O'Brien, the exile in a foreign uniform, all melted away to mix with the ladies or smoke in the conservatory, then the English diplomatist grew very undiplomatic indeed. He was stung every sixty seconds with the thought that the scamp O'Brien might be signaling to Margaret somehow. He did not attempt to imagine how. He was left over the coffee with Brain, the hoary Yankee who believed in all religions, and Valentin, the grizzled Frenchman who believed in none. They could argue with each other, but neither could appeal to him. After a time this progressive logomachy had reached a crisis of tedium. Lord Galloway got up also and sought the drawing-room. He lost his way in long passages for some six or eight minutes, till he heard the high-pitched didactic voice of the doctor, and then the dull voice of the priest, followed by general laughter. They also, he thought, with a curse, were probably arguing about science and religion. But the instant he opened the salon door he saw only one thing. He saw what was not there. He saw that Commandant O'Brien was absent, and that Lady Margaret was absent too. Rising impatiently from the drawing-room, as he had from the dining-room, he stamped along the passage once more. His notion of protecting his daughter from the Irish-Algerian ne'er-do-well had become something central and even mad in his mind. As he went towards the back of the house, where was Valentin's study, he was surprised to meet his daughter, who swept past with a white, scornful face, which was a second enigma. If she had been with O'Brien, where was O'Brien? If she had not been with O'Brien, where had she been? With a sort of senile and passionate suspicion, he groped his way to the dark black parts of the mansion and eventually found a servant's entrance that opened on to the garden. The moon with her scimitar had now ripped up and rolled away all the storm rack. The argent light lit up all four corners of the garden. A tall figure in blue was striding across the lawn towards the study door. A glint of moonlit silver on his facings picked him out as Commandant O'Brien. He vanished through the French windows into the house, leaving Lord Galloway in an indescribable temper, at once virulent and vague. The blue and silver garden, like a scene in a theatre, seemed to taunt him with all that tyrannic tenderness against which his worldly authority was at war. The length and grace of the Irishman's stride enraged him as if he were a rival instead of a father. The moonlight maddened him. He was trapped as if by magic into a garden of troubadours, a Watteau fairyland, and, willing to shake off such amorous imbecilities by speech, he stepped briskly after his enemy. 
As he did so, he tripped over some tree or stone in the grass, looked down at it first with irritation, and then a second time with curiosity. The next instant, the moon and the tall poplars looked at an unusual sight, an elderly English diplomatist running hard and crying or bellowing as he ran. His hoarse shouts brought a pale face to the study door, the beaming glasses and worried brow of Dr. Simon, who heard the nobleman's first clear words. Lord Galloway was crying, A corpse in the grass! A blood-stained corpse! O'Brien at last had gone utterly out of his mind. We must tell Valentin at once, said the doctor, when the other had brokenly described all that he had dared to examine. It is fortunate that he is here. And even as he spoke, the great detective entered the study, attracted by the cry. It was almost amusing to note his typical transformation. He had come with the common concern of a host and a gentleman, fearing that some guest or servant was ill. When he was told the gory fact, he turned with all his gravity instantly bright and businesslike, for this, however abrupt and awful, was his business. Strange, gentlemen, he said as they hurried out into the garden, that I should have hunted mysteries all over the earth, and now one comes and settles in my own backyard. But where is the place? They crossed the lawn less easily, as a slight mist had begun to rise from the river. But under the guidance of the shaken Galloway, they found the body sunken in deep grass, the body of a very tall and broad-shouldered man. He lay face downwards, so that they could only see that his big shoulders were clad in black cloth, and that his big head was bald, except for a wisp or two of brown hair that clung to his skull like wet seaweed. A scarlet serpent of blood crawled from under his fallen face. At least, said Simon, with a deep and singular intonation, he is none of our party. Examine him, doctor, cried Valentin rather sharply. He may not be dead. The doctor bent down. He is not quite cold, but I am afraid he is dead enough, he answered. Just help me to lift him up. They lifted him carefully an inch from the ground, and all doubts as to his being really dead were settled at once and frightfully. The head fell away. It had been entirely sundered from the body. Whoever had cut his throat had managed to sever the neck as well. Even Valentin was slightly shocked. He must have been as strong as a gorilla, he muttered. Not without a shiver, though he was used to anatomical abortions, Dr. Simon lifted the head. It was slightly slashed about the neck and jaw, but the face was substantially unhurt. It was a ponderous, yellow face, at once sunken and swollen, with a hawk-like nose and heavy lids, a face of a wicked Roman emperor, with, perhaps, a distant touch of a Chinese emperor. All present seemed to look at it with the coldest eye of ignorance. Nothing else could be noted about the man except that, as they had lifted his body, they had seen underneath it the white gleam of a shirt front, defaced with a red gleam of blood. As Dr. Simon said, the man had never been of their party. But he might very well have been trying to join it, for he had come dressed for such an occasion. Valentin went down on his hands and knees and examined with his closest professional attention the grass and ground for some twenty yards round the body, in which he was assisted less skillfully by the doctor 
and quite vaguely by the English lord. Nothing rewarded their grovelings except a few twigs, snapped or chopped into very small lengths, which Valentin lifted for an instant's examination and then tossed away. Twigs, he said gravely, twigs and a total stranger with his head cut off. That is all there is on this lawn. There was an almost creepy stillness, and then the unnerved Galloway called out sharply, Who's that? Who's that over there by the garden wall? A small figure with a foolishly large head drew waveringly near them in the moonlit haze, looked for an instant like a goblin, but turned out to be the harmless little priest whom they had left in the drawing room. I say, he said meekly, there are no gates to this garden, do you know? Valentin's black brows had come together somewhat crossly, as they did on principle at the side of a cassock. But he was far too just a man to deny the relevance of the remark. You are right, he said. Before we find out how he came to be killed, we may have to find out how he came to be here. Now listen to me, gentlemen. If it can be done without prejudice to my position and duty, we shall all agree that certain distinguished names might well be kept out of this. There are ladies, gentlemen, and there is a foreign ambassador. If we must mark it down as a crime, then it must be followed up as a crime. But till then I can use my own discretion. I am the head of the police. I am so public that I can afford to be private. Please heaven, I will clear every one of my own guests before I call in my men to look for anybody else. Gentlemen, upon your honor, you will none of you leave the house till tomorrow at noon. There are bedrooms for all. Simon, I think you know where to find my man, Ivan, in the front hall. He is a confidential man. Tell him to leave another servant on guard and come to me at once. Lord Galloway, you are certainly the best person to tell the ladies what has happened and prevent a panic. They also must stay. Father Brown and I will remain with the body. When this spirit of the captain spoke in Valentin, he was obeyed like a bugle. Dr. Simon went through to the armory and rooted out Ivan, the public detective's private detective. Galloway went to the drawing room and told the terrible news tactfully enough, so that by the time the company assembled there, the ladies were already startled and already soothed. Meanwhile, the good priest and the good atheist stood at the head and foot of the dead man, motionless in the moonlight like symbolic statues of their two philosophies of death. Ivan, the confidential man with the scar and the mustaches, came out of the house like a cannonball and came racing across the lawn to Valentin like a dog to his master. His livid face was quite lively with the glow of this domestic detective story, and it was with almost unpleasant eagerness that he asked his master's permission to examine the remains. "'Yes, look, if you like, Ivan,' said Valentin. "'But don't be long. We must go in and thrash this out in the house.' Ivan lifted the head, and then almost let it drop. "'Why?' he gasped. "'It's—' "'No, it isn't. It can't be. "'Do you know this man, sir?' No, said Valentin indifferently. We had better go inside. Between them they carried the corpse to a sofa in the study, and then all made their way to the drawing room. The detective sat down at a desk quietly, and even without hesitation. But his eye was the iron eye of a judge at a size. 
he made a few rapid notes upon paper in front of him, and then said shortly, Is everybody here? Not Mr. Brain, said the Duchess of Mont Saint Michel, looking round. No, said Lord Galloway, in a hoarse, harsh voice, and not Mr. Neil O'Brien, I fancy. I saw that gentleman walking in the garden when the corpse was still warm. Ivan, said the detective, go and fetch Commandant O'Brien and Mr. Brain. Mr. Brain, I know, is finishing a cigar in the dining room. Commandant O'Brien, I think, is walking up and down the conservatory. I am not sure. The faithful attendant flashed from the room, and before anyone could stir or speak, Valentin went on with the same soldierly swiftness of exposition. Everyone here knows that a dead man has been found in the garden, his head cut clean from his body. Dr. Simon, you have examined it. Do you think that to cut a man's throat like that would need great force? Or, perhaps, only a very sharp knife? I should say that it could not be done with a knife at all, said the pale doctor. Have you any thought, resumed Valentin, of a tool with which it could be done? Speaking within modern probabilities, I really haven't, said the doctor, arching his painful brows. It's not easy to hack a neck through even clumsily, and this was a very clean cut. It could be done with a battle-axe, or an old headsman's axe, or an old two-handed sword. But, good heavens, cried the duchess, almost in hysterics. There aren't any two-handed swords and battle-axes round here. Valentin was still busy with the paper in front of him. Tell me, he said, still writing rapidly. Could it have been done with a long French cavalry saber? A low knocking came at the door, which, for some unreasonable reason, curdled everyone's blood like the knocking in Macbeth. Amid that frozen silence, Dr. Simon managed to say, A saber. Yes, I suppose it could. Thank you, said Valentin. Come in, Ivan. The confidential Ivan opened the door and ushered in Commandant Neil O'Brien, whom he had found at last pacing the garden again. The Irish officer stood up disordered and defiant on the threshold. "'What do you want with me?' he cried. "'Please sit down,' said Valentin in pleasant, level tones. "'Why, you aren't wearing your sword. Where is it?' "'I left it on the library table,' said O'Brien, his brogue deepening in his disturbed mood. "'It was a nuisance. It was getting—' "'Ivan,' said Valentin, "'please go and get the commandant's sword from the library.' Then, as the servant vanished, "'Lord Galloway says he saw you leaving the garden "'just before he found the corpse. "'What were you doing in the garden?' "'The commandant flung himself recklessly into a chair. "'Oh!' he cried in pure Irish, "'admiring the moon!' Communing with nature, me boy. A heavy silence sank and endured, and at the end of it came again that trivial and terrible knocking. Ivan reappeared, carrying an empty steel scabbard. This is all I can find, he said. Put it on the table, said Valentin, without looking up. There was an inhuman silence in the room, like that sea of inhuman silence round the dock of a condemned murderer. The Duchess's weak exclamations had long ago died away. Lord Galloway's swollen hatred was satisfied and even sobered. 
the voice that came was quite unexpected. "'I think I can tell you,' cried Lady Margaret, in that clear, quivering voice with which a courageous woman speaks publicly. "'I can tell you what Mr. O'Brien was doing in the garden, since he is bound to silence. He was asking me to marry him. I refused. I said in my family circumstances I could give him nothing but my respect. He was a little angry at that. He did not seem to think much of my respect. I wonder, she added, with rather a wan smile, if he will care at all for it now, for I offer it to him now. I will swear anywhere that he never did a thing like this. Lord Galloway had edged up to his daughter, and was intimidating her in what he imagined to be an undertone. "'Hold your tongue, Maggie,' he said in a thunderous whisper. "'Why should you shield the fellow? Where's his sword? Where's his confounded cavalry?' He stopped because of the singular stare with which his daughter was regarding him, a look that was indeed a lurid magnet for the whole group. "'You old fool!' she said in a low voice, without pretense of piety. "'What do you suppose you were trying to prove? "'I tell you this man was innocent while with me. "'But if he wasn't innocent, he was still with me. "'If he murdered a man in the garden, "'who was it who must have seen? "'Who must at least have known? "'Do you hate Neil so much as to put your own daughter?' "'Lady Galloway screamed.' Everyone else sat tingling at the touch of those satanic tragedies that have been between lovers before now. They saw the proud, white face of the Scotch aristocrat and her lover, the Irish adventurer, like old portraits in a dark house. The long silence was full of formless historical memories of murdered husbands and poisonous paramours. In the center of this morbid silence, an innocent voice said, Was it a very long cigar? The change of thought was so sharp that they had to look round to see who had spoken. I mean, said little Father Brown, from the corner of the room, I mean that cigar Mr. Brain is finishing. It seems nearly as long as a walking stick. Despite the irrelevance, there was assent as well as irritation in Valentin's face as he lifted his head. "'Quite right,' he remarked sharply. "'Ivan, go and see about Mr. Brain again, and bring him here at once.' The instant the factotum had closed the door, Valentin addressed the girl with an entirely new earnestness. "'Lady Margaret,' he said. We all feel, I am sure, both gratitude and admiration for your act in rising above your lower dignity and explaining the commandant's conduct. But there is a hiatus still. Lord Galloway, I understand, met you passing from the study to the drawing room, and it was only some minutes afterwards that he found the garden and the commandant still walking there. "'You have to remember,' replied Margaret, with a faint irony in her voice, "'that I had just refused him, so we should scarcely have come back arm in arm. "'He is a gentleman, anyhow, and he loitered behind, and so he got charged with murder.' "'In those few moments,' said Valentin gravely, "'he might really—' "'The knock came again.' and Ivan put in his scarred face. "'Beg pardon, sir,' he said, "'but Mr. Brain has left the house.' "'Left!' cried Valentin, and rose for the first time to his feet. "'Gone, scooted, evaporated,' replied Ivan, in humorous French. "'His hat and coat are gone, too. 
and I'll tell you something to cap it all. I ran outside the house to find any traces of him, and I found one, and a big trace, too. What do you mean? asked Valentin. I'll show you, said his servant, and reappeared with a flashing naked cavalry saber, streaked with blood about the point and edge. Everyone in the room eyed it as if it were a thunderbolt, but the experienced Ivan went on quite quietly. I found this, he said, flung among the bushes fifty yards up the road to Paris. In other words, I found it just where your respectable Mr. Brain threw it when he ran away. There was again a silence, but of a new sort. Valentin took the saber, examined it, reflected with unaffected concentration of thought, and then turned a respectful face to O'Brien. Commandant, he said, we trust you will always produce this weapon if it is wanted for police examination. Meanwhile, he added, slapping the steel back into the ringing scabbard, let me return you your sword. At the military symbolism of this action, the audience could hardly refrain from applause. For Neil O'Brien, indeed, that gesture was the turning point of existence. By the time he was wandering in the mysterious garden again in the colors of the morning, the tragic futility of his ordinary mien had fallen from him. He was a man with many reasons for happiness. Lord Galloway was a gentleman and had offered him an apology. Lady Margaret was something better than a lady, a woman at least, and had perhaps given him something better than an apology as they drifted among the old flower-beds before breakfast. The whole company was more light-hearted and humane, for though the riddle of the death remained, the load of suspicion was lifted off them all, and sent flying off to Paris with the strange millionaire, a man they hardly knew. The devil was cast out of the house. He had cast himself out. Still, the riddle remained, and when O'Brien threw himself on a garden seat beside Dr. Simon, that keenly scientific person at once resumed it. He did not get much talk out of O'Brien, whose thoughts were on pleasanter things. "'I can't say it interests me much,' said the Irishman frankly, "'especially as it seems pretty plain now. Apparently Brain hated the stranger for some reason.' lured him into the garden, and killed him with my sword. Then he fled to the city, tossing the sword away as he went. By the way, Ivan tells me the dead man had a Yankee dollar in his pocket. So he was a countryman of brains, and that seems to clinch it. I don't see any difficulties about the business. There are five colossal difficulties, said the doctor quietly like high walls within walls. Don't mistake me. I don't doubt that Brain did it. His flight, I fancy, proves that. But as to how he did it? First difficulty. Why should a man kill another man with a great hulking saber when he can almost kill him with a pocket knife and put it back in his pocket? Second difficulty. Why was there no noise or outcry? Does a man commonly see another coming up waving a scimitar and offer no remarks? Third difficulty. A servant watched the front door all the evening, and a rat cannot get into Valentin's garden anywhere. How did the dead man get into the garden? Fourth difficulty. Given the same conditions, how did Brain get out of the garden? And the fifth, said Neil, with eyes fixed on the English priest, who was coming slowly up the path. Is a trifle, I suppose, said the doctor, but I think an odd one. When I first saw how the head had been slashed, 
I suppose the assassin had struck more than once. But on examination I found many cuts across the truncated section. In other words, they were struck after the head was off. Did Brain hate his foe so fiendishly that he stood sabering his body in the moonlight? Horrible, said O'Brien, and shuddered. The little priest, Brown, had arrived while they were talking, and had waited, with characteristic shyness, till they had finished. Then he said awkwardly, I say, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I was sent to tell you the news. News? repeated Simon, and stared at him rather painfully through his glasses. Yes, I'm sorry, said Father Brown mildly. There's been another murder, you know. Both men on the seat sprang up, leaving it rocking. And what's stranger still, continued the priest, with his dull eye on the rhododendrons, it's the same disgusting sort. It's another beheading. They found the second head actually bleeding into the river, a few yards along Brain's road to Paris, so they supposed that he— "'Great heaven!' cried O'Brien. "'Is Brain a monomaniac?' "'There are American vendettas,' said the priest impassively. Then he added, "'They want you to come to the library and see it.' Commandant O'Brien followed the others towards the inquest, feeling decidedly sick. As a soldier, he loathed all this secretive carnage. Where were these extravagant amputations going to stop? First one head was hacked off, and then another. In this case, he told himself bitterly, it was not true that two heads were better than one. As he crossed the study, he almost staggered at a shocking coincidence. Upon Valentin's table lay the colored picture of yet a third bleeding head, and it was the head of Valentin himself. A second glance showed him it was only a nationalist paper called The Guillotine, which every week showed one of its political opponents with rolling eyes and writhing features just after execution for Valentin was an anti-clerical of some note. But O'Brien was an Irishman, with a kind of chastity even in his sins, and his gorge rose against that great brutality of the intellect which belongs only to France. He felt Paris as a whole, from the grotesques on the Gothic churches to the gross caricatures in the newspapers. He remembered the gigantic jests of the revolution. He saw the whole city as one ugly energy, from the sanguinary sketch lying on Valentin's table up to where, above a mountain and forest of gargoyles, the great devil grins on Notre Dame. The library was long, low, and dark. What light entered it shot from under low blinds and had still some of the ruddy tinge of morning. Valentin and his servant Ivan were waiting for them at the upper end of a long, slightly sloping desk, on which lay the mortal remains, looking enormous in the twilight. The big, black figure and yellow face of the man found in the garden confronted them essentially unchanged. The second head, which had been fished from among the river reeds that morning, lay streaming and dripping beside it. Valentin's men were still seeking to recover the rest of this second corpse, which was supposed to be afloat. Father Brown, who did not seem to share O'Brien's sensibilities in the least, went up to the second head and examined it with his blinking care. It was little more than a mop of wet white hair, fringed with silver fire in the red and level morning light. The face, which seemed of an ugly, empurpled, and perhaps criminal type, had been much battered against trees or stones as it tossed in the water. "'Good morning,' 
Commandant O'Brien, said Valentin, with quiet cordiality. You have heard of Brain's last experiment in butchery, I suppose. Father Brown was still bending over the head with white hair, and he said, without looking up, I suppose it is quite certain that Brain cut off this head, too. Well, it seems common sense, said Valentin, with his hands in his pockets. Killed in the same way as the other, found within a few yards of the other, and sliced by the same weapon which we know he carried away. Yes, yes, I know, replied Father Brown submissively. Yet, you know, I doubt whether Brain could have cut off this head. Why not? inquired Dr. Simon, with a rational stare. Well, doctor, said the priest, looking up blinking, can a man cut off his own head? I don't know. O'Brien felt an insane universe crashing about his ears, but the doctor sprang forward with impetuous practicality, and pushed back the wet white hair. Oh, there's no doubt it's brain, said the priest quietly. He had exactly that chip in the left ear. The detective, who had been regarding the priest with steady and glittering eyes, opened his clenched mouth and said sharply, You seem to know a lot about him, Father Brown. I do, said the little man simply. I've been about with him for some weeks. He was thinking of joining our church. The star of the fanatic sprung into Valentin's eyes. He strode towards the priest with clenched hands. And, perhaps, he cried with a blasting sneer, perhaps he was also thinking of leaving all his money to your church. Perhaps he was, said Brown stolidly. It is possible. In that case, cried Valentin, with a dreadful smile, you may indeed know a great deal about him, about his life, and about his... Commandant O'Brien laid a hand on Valentin's arm. Drop that slanderous rubbish, Valentin, he said, or there may be more swords yet. But Valentin, under the steady, humble gaze of the priest, had already recovered himself. Well, he said shortly, people's private opinions can wait. You gentlemen are still bound by your promise to stay. You must enforce it on yourselves and on each other. Ivan here will tell you anything more you want to know. I must get to business and write the authorities. We can't keep this quiet any longer. I shall be writing in my study if there is any more news. Is there any more news, Ivan? asked Dr. Simon, as the chief of police strode out of the room. Only one more thing, I think, sir, said Ivan, wrinkling up his grey old face. But that's important, too, in its way. There's that old buffer you found on the lawn and he pointed without pretense of reverence at the big black body with the yellow head. We've found out who he is, anyhow. Indeed, cried the astonished doctor. And who is he? His name was Arnold Becker, said the under-detective, though he went by many aliases. He was a wandering sort of scamp, and is known to have been in America, so that was where Brain got his knife into him. We didn't have much to do with him ourselves, for he worked mostly in Germany. We've communicated, of course, with the German police. But, oddly enough, there was a twin brother of his, named Louis Becker, whom we had a great deal to do with. In fact, we found it necessary to guillotine him only yesterday. Well, it's a rum thing, gentlemen, but when I saw that fellow flat on the lawn, I had the greatest jump of my life. 
if I hadn't seen Lewis Becker guillotined with my own eyes, I'd have sworn it was Lewis Becker lying there in the grass. Then, of course, I remembered his twin brother in Germany, and following up the clue, the explanatory Ivan stopped, for the excellent reason that nobody was listening to him. The commandant and the doctor were both staring at Father Brown, who had sprung stiffly to his feet and was holding his temples tight like a man in sudden and violent pain. Stop! 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 he cried. Stop talking a minute, for I see half. Will God give me strength? Will my brain make the one jump and see all? Heaven help me. I used to be fairly good at thinking. I could paraphrase any page in Aquinas once. Will my head split? Or will I see? I see half. I only see half. He buried his head in his hands and stood in a sort of rigid torture of thought or prayer while the other three could only go on staring at this last prodigy of their wild twelve hours. When Father Brown's hands fell, they showed a face quite fresh and serious, like a child's. He heaved a huge sigh and said, Let us get this said and done with as quickly as possible. Look here, this will be the quickest way to convince you all of the truth. He turned to the doctor. Dr. Simon, he said, you have a strong headpiece, and I heard you this morning asking the five hardest questions about this business. Well, if you will ask them again, I will answer them. Simon's pince-nez dropped from his nose in his doubt and wonder, but he answered at once. Well, the first question, you know, is why a man should kill another with a clumsy saber at all, when a man can kill with a bodkin. A man cannot behead with a bodkin, said Brown calmly, and for this murder beheading was absolutely necessary. Why? asked O'Brien with interest. And the next question? asked Father Brown. Well, why didn't the man cry out or anything? asked the doctor. Sabres in gardens are certainly unusual. Twigs, said the priest gloomily, and turned to the window which looked on the scene of death. No one saw the point of the twigs. Why should they lie on that lawn, look at it, so far from any tree? They were not snapped off, they were chopped off. The murderer occupied his enemy with some tricks with the saber, showing how he could cut a branch in mid-air, or what not. Then, while his enemy bent down to see the result, a silent slash, and the head fell. Well, said the doctor slowly, that seems plausible enough, but my next two questions will stump anyone. The priest still stood looking critically out of the window and waited. You know how all the garden was sealed up like an airtight chamber, went on the doctor. Well, how did the strange man get into the garden? Without turning round, the little priest answered. There never was any strange man in the garden. There was a silence and then a sudden cackle of almost childish laughter relieved the strain. The absurdity of Brown's remark moved Ivan to open taunts. Oh, he cried, then we didn't lug a great fat corpse onto a sofa last night? He hadn't got into the garden, I suppose. Got into the garden, repeated Brown reflectively. No, not entirely. Hang it all, cried Simon. A man gets into a garden, or he doesn't. Not necessarily, said the priest, with a faint smile. What is the next question, doctor? I fancy you're ill, exclaimed Dr. Simon sharply. 
but I'll ask the next question if you like. How did Brain get out of the garden? He didn't get out of the garden, said the priest, still looking out of the window. Didn't get out of the garden? exploded Simon. Not completely, said Father Brown. Simon shook his fists in a frenzy of French logic. A man gets out of a garden, or he doesn't, he cried. Not always, said Father Brown. Dr. Simon sprang to his feet impatiently. I have no time to spare on such senseless talk, he cried angrily. If you can't understand a man being on one side of a wall or the other, I won't trouble you further. Doctor, said the cleric very gently, we have always got on very pleasantly together. If only for the sake of old friendship, stop and tell me your fifth question. The impatient Simon sank into a chair by the door and said briefly, the head and shoulders were cut about in a queer way. It seemed to be done after death. Yes, said the motionless priest. It was done so as to make you assume exactly the one simple falsehood that you did assume. It was done to make you take for granted that the head belonged to the body. The borderland of the brain, where all the monsters are made, moved horribly in the Gaelic O'Brien. He felt the chaotic presence of all the horsemen and fish women that man's unnatural fancy has begotten. A voice older than his first father seemed saying in his ear, Keep out of the monstrous garden where grows the tree with double fruit. Avoid the evil garden where died the man with two heads. Yet, while these shameful symbolic shapes passed across the ancient mirror of his Irish soul, his Frenchified intellect was quite alert, and was watching the odd priest as closely and incredulously as all the rest. Father Brown had turned round at last, and stood against the window, with his face in dense shadow. But even in that shadow, they could see it was pale as ashes. Nevertheless, he spoke quite sensibly, as if there were no Gaelic souls on earth. Gentlemen, he said, you did not find the strange body of Becker in the garden. You did not find any strange body in the garden. In face of Dr. Simon's rationalism, I still affirm that Becker was only partly present. Look here, pointing to the black bulk of the mysterious corpse. You never saw that man in your lives. Did you ever see this man? He rapidly rolled away the bald, yellow head of the unknown and put in its place the white-maned head beside it. And there, complete, unified, unmistakable, lay Julius K. Brain. The murderer, went on Brown quietly, hacked off his enemy's head and flung the sword far over the wall. But he was too clever to fling the sword only. He flung the head over the wall also. Then he had only to clap on another head to the corpse, and, as he insisted on a private inquest, you all imagined a totally new man. Clap on another head, said O'Brien staring. What other head? Heads don't grow on garden bushes, do they? No, said Father Brown huskily, and looking at his boots. There is only one place where they grow. They grow in the basket of the guillotine, beside which the chief of police, Aristide Valentin, was standing not an hour before the murder. Oh, my friends, hear me a minute more before you tear me in pieces. Valentin is an honest man, if being mad for an arguable cause is honesty. But did you never see in that cold, gray eye of his that he is mad? He would do anything, anything, 
to break what he calls the superstition of the cross. He has fought for it and starved for it, and now he has murdered for it. Brain's crazy millions had hitherto been scattered among so many sects that they did little to alter the balance of things. But Valentin heard a whisper that Brain, like so many scatterbrained skeptics, was drifting to us, and that was quite a different thing. Brain would pour supplies into the impoverished and pugnacious Church of France. He would support six nationalist newspapers like the guillotine. The battle was already balanced on a point, and the fanatic took flame at the risk. He resolved to destroy the millionaire, and he did it as one would expect the greatest of detectives to commit his only crime. He abstracted the severed head of Becker on some criminological excuse and took it home in his official box. He had that last argument with Brain that Lord Galloway did not hear the end of. That failing, he led him out into the sealed garden, talked about swordsmanship, used twigs and a saber for illustration, and... Ivan of the Scar sprang up. "'You lunatic!' he yelled. "'You'll go to my master now. I'll take you by—' "'Why, I was going there,' said Brown heavily. "'I must ask him to confess, and all that.' Driving the unhappy Brown before them like a hostage or sacrifice, they rushed together into the sudden stillness of Valentin's study. The great detective sat at his desk, apparently too occupied to hear their turbulent entrance. They paused a moment, and then something in the look of that upright and elegant back made the doctor run forward suddenly. A touch and a glance showed him that there was a small box of pills at Valentin's elbow, and that Valentin was dead in his chair. And on the blind face of the suicide was more than the pride of Cato. End of the Secret Garden Next programme, Saturday Night Theatre, which is called The Subject Was Roses. In the series The Time of My Life at ten past ten tonight on Radio 4, Lord Robins will be talking to Gordon Snell about the years in which his political views were formed, late, nine, late 20s and 30s. And this conversation with Lord Robins will be illustrated by archived recordings of conditions in Manchester in the late 30s, and the voices of two of his closest associates for many years, Hugh Gateskill and George Bryan. And that's in the time of my life at ten past ten tonight on Radio 4 for uh, listeners, except those uh, in Northern Ireland. And now, Saturday night... Shopping. Before breakfast? I needed some things. We've only got one soldier boy home from the wars, not a whole division. The party used up a lot last night. It was a lovely day. Timmy still asleep? Haven't heard him. Better give me mine. Coffee's on. I thought we'd all have breakfast together. I have to go downtown. Ruskin wants to see me. I'm, uh, I'm gonna stop at St. Francis on the way. To offer a prayer of thanks. You want toast? Yeah. All those casualties, and he never got a scratch. We're very lucky. What do you want on it? Marmalade. Freeman boy dead. Mullen boy crippled for life. Makes you wonder. Think he enjoyed the party? He seemed to. First time I ever saw him take a drink. He drank too much. <laughs> he don't get out of the army every day. He was sick during the night. Probably the excitement. It was the whiskey. You should have stopped him. For three years he's got along fine without anyone telling him what to do. I had to hold his head. No one held his head in the army. That's what he said. Well, that didn't stop you. He's not in the army anymore. It was a boy that walked out of his house three years ago. 
A man that's come back in. You sound like a recruiting poster. And you sound ready to repeat the old mistakes. Mistakes? Uh, pardon me. You said mistakes. A slip of the tongue. I'd like to know what mistakes you're referring to. I'd really like to know. Okay. He was 18 when he went away. Until that time, he showed no special skill at anything. But you treated him like it was a... a protege. I think you mean prodigy. What I really mean is baby. <laughs> For a baby, he certainly did well in the army. I didn't say he was a baby. I said you treated him like one. You were surprised he did well. You didn't think he'd last a week. Bless us and save us, said Mrs. O'Davis. Do you know why you were surprised? Joy, joy, said Mrs. Malloy. Because you never understood him. Mercy, mercy, said old Mrs. Percy. I never doubted that he'd do as well as anyone else. Where he's concerned, you never doubted, period. If he came in here right now and said he could fly, you'd help him out the window. But if you're saying I have confidence in him, you're right. And why not? Who knows him better? Is there more coffee? He's exceptional. Here we go again. Yes, exceptional. In what way? I refuse to discuss it. Well, a person who's going to be famous usually drops a few clues by the time they're 21. I didn't say famous. I said exceptional. Well, what's the difference? <laughs> you wouldn't understand. And here's something you better understand. You can't treat him as though he'd never been away. He's not a kid. If you had stopped him from drinking too much, that would have been treating him like a kid. This is where I came in. He was trying to keep up with you, and you knew it. You sound like you're jealous. The two of you so busy drinking, you hardly paid any attention to anyone else. You are jealous. <laughs> Don't be absurd. He and I got along better yesterday than we ever did before, and you're jealous. Well, well, well. Can't Ruskin wait till Monday? No. And don't pretend you're disappointed. What a charming little breakfast you and he will have together. You're welcome to stay. My ears are burning already. I've never said a word against you, and you know it. And don't forget my excursion to Montreal. It was always your own actions that turned him against you. And the convention. Don't leave that out. The curtains. The, the curtains for Timmy's room. They're coming today. I don't know anything about curtains. Yes, you do. I do not. They'll be ten dollars. Well, what's the matter with the old ones? They're worn out. They look all right to me. Well, they aren't all right. Ten dollars for curtains? Timmy will want to bring friends home. And they'll notice the curtains? Ah, oh, the old squeeze play, huh? Are you going to give me the money? Yeah. yeah. Say hello for me. I, I gotta go. And I need five dollars for the house while you're at it. I gave you fifteen yesterday. I told you, the party used up a lot. That party cost close to a hundred dollars. Well, it was worth it. Did I say it wasn't? Okay, you get the money. Here. Good morning. Champ. Good morning, son. We thought you were going to sleep all day. I smell the coffee. Mother said you were sick during the night. Uh, I'm fine now. I was a little rocky myself. I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> what time is your appointment? 11.15. It's 25 hours. Mr. Ruskin wants to see me this morning. Oh, that's too bad. Why? Well, I... Uh, I thought we might take in the ball game. So why don't you? Here's your juice, Tim. You know I can't. Uh, look, Tim, this thing with Ruskin means a sure sale. I understand. We'll go tomorrow. Yeah, my mother expects us for dinner tomorrow. Well, how about next Saturday? All right. We'll get box seats. The works. Sounds fine. Swell. Well, I gotta go. What time will you be home? I'll call you. I'll be at my mother's. I, uh... I understand none of your old clothes fit. Only got your uniform to wear, huh? That's right. Well, meet me downtown on Monday. We'll get you some new ones. Okay. What'd you say that ribbon was for? Oh, what? What this? Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's a combat infantry badge. How about that? Well, it's not as important as it sounds. <laughs> well, we'll have to sit down and have a real talk. I want to hear all about it. All right. Great to have you home. It's great to be home. Mullen boy crippled, Freeman boy dead. We are very lucky. Uh, uh, I know. Stopping off at St. Francis this morning to offer a prayer of thanks. See you later. Right. <laughs> well, how did you sleep? Fine. How's he feeling? All right. He looks a lot older. It's been three years. It must have seemed strange, sleeping in your own bed. Yeah. How's his business? Who knows? 
And the coffee market's up. I hope you're hungry. I can't get over the change in him. Guess what we're having for breakfast. Honey, it's not just the way he looks. Guess what we're having for breakfast. Uh, guess what we're having. What? Guess. I don't know. Yes, you do. No. Sure you do. What is it? Ah, you're fooling. What is it? What's your favorite? Uh, bacon and eggs? Well, now I know you're fooling. No. Oh, I forgot what a tease you were. I'm not teasing. Waffles! We're having waffles! Fine. Well, you used to be crazy about waffles. I, I still am. Well, I've got the waffle batter ready. Swell. Your first morning home, you're entitled to whatever you want. I want waffles. I used the last egg in the batter. I want waffles. Really? <laughs> Cross my heart. All right. Hey, I see a new butcher. Yeah, quite a few new stores. Pop said the Bremen's moved. Mm-hmm. And the Costellos. Hey, do you remember old Zimmer the tailor? Yeah, sure. Well, a few weeks ago, a woman brought him a coat she wanted altered. Zimmer started to fix it. Then, very politely, excused himself, went up to the roof, and jumped. No one knows why. Well, who was the woman? Mrs. Levin. Oh, that explains it. That's not funny. Sorry. What a thing to say. I said I'm sorry. I'm surprised at you. Listen, Savus. What did you say? Bless us and save us. As in... Bless us and save us, said Mrs. O'Davis. Joy, joy, said Mrs. Malloy. What's the matter? I never expected to hear that nonsense from you. It beats swearing. You used to cover your ears when your father said it. I'll never say it again, ma'am. Don't talk to me like that. I, I'm sorry. I don't know, don't know what's wrong with me this morning. I, I don't think I slept well. Too much excitement, the party and all. Will you have bacon with it? Uh, no, just the waffles would be fine. Did you like the party? Yeah. I wish the house had looked better. Well, what's wrong with it? Oh, it needs painting. The sofa's on its last legs. And the rugs. Oh. Well, now that you're here, I'll get it all fixed up. It looks fine to me. <laughs> I still can't believe you're here. <laughs> I find it a little hard to believe myself. You are here? You want to pinch me? Well, go ahead. Well, go on. <laughs> hey, you believe it now? Hey, <laughs> what are you doing? Now let go. Well, cut it out, Mom. Cut it out. <laughs> One pinch to a customer. It's an old house rule. <laughs> the, the waffles must be ready. The, the, the light on the iron went out. Isn't that what it means when, when that little light goes out? Yes. <laughs> What's the matter? What's wrong? What is it? What is it? <laughs> What? Why did they have to stick to say? With the waffles? I can't remember the last time they stuck. But what's that to cry about? I've looked forward to this morning for three years, and nothing's right. Now, why do you say that? No one thing. What isn't right? No one single thing. But would you please stop? The things you've been saying. Your attitude. What things? What attitude? You haven't even asked about Willis. How is he? Every time I look at you, you avoid me. Oh, now, that's ridiculous. Look, you're doing it now. I am not. How could you forget the waffles were your favorite? I... I just forgot. Well, then, you, you must have forgotten a lot of things. Hey, I'll tell you one thing I didn't forget. The dance. The one we were going to have the first morning I was home. What made you think of that? It's been on my mind all along. <laughs> I'll bet. I was about to turn the radio on when you started crying. I'll bet. If you're through, I'll do it now. 
Are you through? <laughs> I haven't danced in so long. I've probably forgotten how. Hey, right. <laughs> well, shall we, uh, shall we have a go at it? Uh, I can't remember the last time I danced. Come on. You really want to? Yeah. Well, yes, for it. Not a girl. Here we go. Oh, forgot how to dance. Who are you kidding? Well, I guess it's one of those things you never forget. You have been taking lessons. But of course. You come here often? No, oh, first time. Yeah, me likewise. You by yourself? Mm, with a girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, we need something lively. Oh, now, no. don't move. Oh. Hey, ho! Oh. Well, what do you say? Well, the spirit's willing. Let's go. <laughs> oh, not bad, not bad. Oh, what will the neighbors think? Oh, wait. <laughs> We're coming into the home stretch. Hang on. I'm getting dizzy. <laughs> hey. Hang on. I can't you? do it anymore. <laughs> hang on. I can. Hang on. Hang on. I can. I... <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Oh. <laughs> Are you all right? I think so. Oh, boy. <laughs> that is enough of that. I am dead. Absolutely dead. Oh, oh so am I. Yeah, I. I can't remember the last time I laughed like that. I can. We were driving to the lake, and we stopped at that dinky carnival. Yeah, the time I got you to go on that ride. Your father thought we'd lost our minds. He kept begging the man to stop the engine. Which made us laugh all the harder. You know something? What? I really believe you're here now. So do I. What are you going to do today? I don't know. Why don't you come to Mama's with me? We're going there for dinner tomorrow. Willis would love to see you. I'll see him tomorrow. When we told him you were coming home, he began to sing. It's the first time he's done that in months. All right. I'll go. We won't stay long. All right. Well, hello. Hi, huh. Pop. Uh, don't get up on my account. We, we were dancing. We fell down. What did you forget? Nothing. Why did you come back? I changed my mind. If you still want to go to the ball game, it's a date. What about Ruskin? Ah, oh, the hell with it. You still want to go? Yeah. Well, what about Willis? What about Willis? Well, Jimmy was going to see him this afternoon. Well, I'll see him tomorrow. But I told him you'd be over today. Before you even asked me? No, I, I, I thought sure you'd want to go. You'd no right to do that. Well, what'll I tell him? Tell him I'll see him tomorrow. He'll be disappointed. Well, that's not my fault. The game starts at 12. I just have to get my tie. You haven't eaten. We'll grab something on the way. Came out of St. Francis and started for the subway. It was halfway there when I thought of Mr. Freeman. What wouldn't he give to be able to spend a day with his son? Made me turn around and come back. Well, why are you mad? You told me to take him to the game. And you always do what I tell you? Bless us and save us. Corporal Cleary reporting for duty. Kiss your mother goodbye. Hey, hey that's not a duty. So long, Mom. We won't be late. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't told that one in years. You know, I was considered a very funny fella because uh, of you. <laughs> hello? Anybody home? We're still at the mother's. Hey, uh, I better put the roses in water. Uh, stand out of beer? Sure. Okay, you do the flowers, I'll get the beer. You know where she keeps a vase or anything? How would I know? Have a look in the kitchen. Stick them in a jug or someplace. Okay. Yeah, this'll do. Why aren't you supposed to bang the ends? What for? Well, I don't know, so they keep longer or something. Son, about roses, I know very little. Leave it for your mother. Just stick them in water, leave it to her. A 
Do you remember all those jokes of mine? It came to me, I guess. I don't remember most of them myself. Here's your beer. Oh, thanks. I'll, uh, I'll take the roses through while we drink, too. The Chicago Cubs. Think it'll help them? <laughs> Can it hurt? To the Cubs. To the Cubs. Ah, 16 to 3. I'm Jeez. still glad we went. So am I. Ah, that was a beautiful catch up, mate. Yeah. Mm. For a moment, I thought he lost it in the sun. <laughs> so they really went for the old man's jokes. <laughs> Especially the ones about Uncle Mike. Such as? The Pennsylvania hotel guy. Oh, Columbus told that one to the Indians. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Mike was a famous man in our outfit. Yeah, joking aside, he was quite a guy. Stood 6'3", weighed close to 250. I remember his picture. He was in the Spanish-American War. I know. Got hit by a bullet once and knocked him out. When he came to, he was lying on a field full of wounded men. Hey, how about that? I'm telling you war stories. Go on, you do the talking. About what? Well, you must have seen some pretty bad things. Not as much as a lot of others. So maybe you'd rather not talk about it. I don't mind. You know, I'd like to hear what you have to say. I, I don't know how to begin. Well, anything that comes to mind. Oh. You want to know the bravest thing I ever did? Yeah. The first night we were in combat, I slept with my boots off. Well, go on. Well, that's it. Well, you, you slept with your boots off? <laughs> Doesn't sound like much, does it? <laughs> Not offhand. Well, you see, the fellas who eventually cracked up were all guys who couldn't sleep. Now, if I hadn't decided to take my boots off, I'd have ended up being one of them. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> you you, you want to know the smartest thing I ever did? Mm, sure. I never volunteered. Huh? One day, the lieutenant bawled me out for it. I said, I said, sir, yeah. sir, if there is anything you want me to do, you tell me and I'll do it. Huh? But if you wait for me to volunteer, you'll wait forever. Well, what do you say to that? Nothing printable. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, Pop, the fact is, I, I wasn't a very good soldier. Well, you did everything they asked you. Yeah, but the good ones do more. You'd have been a good one. <laughs> what makes you say that? Well, I can tell. Well, thanks. You're welcome. Yeah. You know, it's one of the big regrets of my life that I was never in the service. I know. So the day World War I was declared, I went to the recruiting office. When they learned I was the the sole support of the family, they turned me down. I keep wondering what difference it might have made in my life. Then I, I wonder how I'd have made out. I wouldn't have settled for a desk job. I'd have gotten to the front. I'm sure of yeah. that. But, but once there, how would I have done? Fine. Well, how do you know? You're a born fighter. Well, they say a lot of fellas who were terrors as civilians turned to jelly when they heard those bullets. No, not you. Well, uh, doesn't seem so, but you can't be sure. And that's always bothered me. Uh, how about another? Fine. Oh, maybe we shouldn't. <laughs> Why? Well, your mother blames me for you getting sick last night. Says I encouraged you to drink too much. It wasn't what I drank. It was the excitement. Well, that's what I told her. Look, I'll open two more. You, you just uh, sit there. Oh, all right, all right. Can't say I don't feel like it. You know something? What? The reminder of her father. What will? The roses will. Oh. Her father used to send her roses every birthday. Dozen red ones. Never missed. Even at the end. Look, uh, tell her... Tell her they were your idea. What? Tell her the roses were your idea. Why? Why, she... She got a kick out of it. All right. <laughs> if you like. Here you go. Thanks. Here. You call it this time. To, uh... To the two nicest fellas in the house. Yes, hey, I'll <laughs> buy that. <laughs> it's funny how you acquire a taste for things. Yeah. You know, when, when I was a kid... I couldn't even stand the smell of beer. <laughs> Believe it or not, I was the same. We we seem to have gotten over it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
can I, uh... Can I say something to you? Sure. Uh, you won't take it the wrong way. No. I owe you an apology. Well, for what? Well, you were always sick. Always home from school in one thing or another. I never thought you'd last in the army. Neither did I. <laughs> really? Hmm. Really? When Dr. Goldman heard they took you, he, he said it was ridiculous. When they put you in the infantry, he said it was inhuman. And when I survived, he said it was a miracle. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, no, I don't think it was a miracle. I think we just underestimated you. Especially me. That's what I wanted to apologize for. You... Remember that corny thing that you used to recite about mm -hmm. about how a, a boy likes his father? Oh, yeah. You know, he, he thinks his father is the, is the greatest guy in the world until he's 15. Uh -huh. Then the doubts start. And then by the time he's 18, he's, he's convinced his father is the worst guy in the world. Uh -huh. uh, 25, the doubts start again. And 30, it occurs to him that, well, the old man wasn't so bad after uh -huh. all. And then at, at 40... Now what he about it? Well, there, there is some truth to it. Oh, I think you've had too much to drink. Look, I'm not, I'm not saying you're a saint. Well, that's a relief. But taking into account where you started from and the obstacles you had to overcome, well, what you've done is something to be proud of. Well, no, well look, thank you. Look, how many guys that you grew up with even turned out legitimate? Not many. And most of them are still scraping along where they started. That's true. How many years of school did you have? I had to quit after the fourth grade. And I have met college graduates who don't know nearly as much as you about the things that really count. It must have been Yale, man. No, 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 no. I'm serious. Yeah, and speaking of college, if you get into one of those big ones and it's more than the GI Bill pays for, I'll help you out. Well, thanks. No, that's just between you and me. Why? I don't want people getting wrong notions. About what? That I'm loaded. Are you loaded? That don't be ridiculous. That doesn't answer my question. The question's ridiculous. That's still no answer. No, I'm not loaded. How much do you have? What? How much money do you have? Oh, is this your idea of a joke? No. Then why are you doing it? I don't want to take money from you if you can't afford it. I can afford it. Some of the places I applied at are pretty expensive. I can afford it. Then you must be loaded. I am not loaded. We have a summer place, a car. And now you tell me you can afford any school in the country. You gotta be fairly loaded. If I hear that word once more, I'm marching right out the door. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you haven't changed a bit. You look as though I'd ask you to betray your country. <laughs> <laughs> you son of a gun. I really had you going. <laughs> Some joke. Well, say, Pop. What? How much do you have? <laughs> Enough's enough. <laughs> I think we'd better change the subject. But well, how did you meet Mother? Hmm? You said change the subject. <laughs> you know all about that. Just that you picked her up on the subway? It wasn't like that at all. Well, then I don't know all about it. I picked her up. It, it makes her sound cheap. I'm sorry. First time I spoke to her was on the subway, but there's more to it. Well, tell me. Why? Why? Well, I might become a writer. I might want to do a story about it someday. A writer? Maybe. Well, that's the first I heard about that. Me too. Must be oh. the beer. <laughs> <laughs> now, what, what year was it that you met her? Uh, 1921. A writer? Yeah, a writer. Where, where, where were you working at? At Emerson's. And? Well, one morning I saw her walk by. That afternoon she passed again. Same next day. Turned out she worked around the corner. I... You sure you want to hear this? Uh-huh. One evening I happened to be leaving at the same time she did. Turned out we took the same subway. She got off at 72nd Street. Well, to make a long story short, I got a seat next to her one day and we started talking. And that's it? Yeah. Sounds like an ordinary pickup to me. Well, it wasn't. I... I left some things out. Such as? Oh, I, I don't remember. That was 25 years ago. Now, the way I heard it, you followed her for a month before you finally got the nerve to speak. But you didn't know the story. And to convince her of your intentions, that they were honorable, you asked if you might call at her home. True or false? Well, true. 
<laughs> oh, gee, you wouldn't believe how nervous I was. If she didn't make it any easier, pretended the whole thing was a complete surprise. Bernhardt couldn't have done it nicer. Or, or look nicer. Uh, all in blue. Blue dress, blue hat, blue shoes. Everything blue. Light blue. And dignified. Oh, and look at her. You knew she was a lady. My family called her the lady. To their minds, it was an insult. How do we get onto this? You were telling... Ah, oh, join the party. We're having a little hair of the dog. <laughs> how was the game? Oh, one-sided. Pop was just telling me how you met. What? He asked me. And his version is a little different from yours. Well, what do you mean? He says that you chased him. Yeah, that'll be the day. Says you did everything but stand on your head to attract his attention. That's what he said. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, you too. <laughs> well, then, how about a beer, eh? Oh, no, thanks. Oh, come on. Oh, well, all right. That's a girl. Now, you sit down. I'll go get it. Yeah, well, just a glass. Uh, well, what did he tell you? About what? Well, about how we met. Oh, that. Well, he said... He said you were dressed in blue and nobody ever looked nicer. That's what he said. <laughs> I'll bet. Didn't you say that? I'm a stranger here. Did he tell you how he used his friend, Eddie Barnes? Bless us and save us. Every night they'd get in the subway, <sighs> stand right in front of me and have a loud conversation about how well they were doing in business. Oh, it wasn't every night. Poor Eddie had to go an hour out of his way. That's what I call a friend. <laughs> Best I ever had. Here you go. Here's your beer. Oh, what, what's the matter? Where did they come from? Oh, the roses? Hmm. Oh, uh, Pop got them for you. You did? Uh, yeah. They're beautiful. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. What made you do it? Oh, uh, uh, we happened to pass a place. I know you like them. I haven't had red roses since Papa died. He used to send me a dozen on my birthday. Never missed. I remember. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm going to cry. Oh, you, you don't bring flowers, they cry. You do, they cry. I'm sorry. What's to be sorry? He was the kindest, gentlest man that ever lived. I know. <laughs> oh, I'm all right now. Yeah, drink your beer. You'll feel better. Yeah, maybe so. To happy days. To yeah, happy, happy days. days. They're, they're just beautiful. <clears throat> Yeah, talking of Eddie Barnes before, yeah, God rest his soul. It reminds me of the time old Emerson put up a second-hand car for the man who sold the most coffee over a three-month period. <laughs> yes. Yes. I won it, but I, I couldn't drive. <laughs> Eddie said he'd teach me. We didn't get two blocks from the office when he ran broadside into an ice truck. <laughs> <laughs> how, how about that ride to Connecticut? Oh, he yeah. He practically killed us all. Yeah, what, what was the name of that place we stayed at? Uh, the, the Rainbow uh, Grove. Yeah, that's right. Big, fat, red-haired Dame Rabbit. Mrs. Eh? Uh, Hanlon. Yeah. My friends all call me Daisy. <laughs> I dubbed her the Will Rogers of Connecticut. She never met a man she didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> I listen, do, you, do you remember the night you, Eddie, and a couple of the others picked her up bed and all oh. and left her sleeping in the middle of the baseball field? <laughs> in the morning when we went out to play, she was still there. <laughs> oh, what did you do? We ruled that any ball hitting her on the fly was a ground rule double. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we had a lot of fun at that place. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder if it's still there. Yeah, I wonder. Now, let's take a ride someday and see, huh? Yeah, all right. Uh, where are you going? Uh, I've got to start supper. Oh, forget it. We're eating out. Yeah, but I, I bought a steady. It'll keep. Where would you like to go, champ? Oh, maybe he is a date. Bring her along. I don't have a date. Well, I thought you'd be seeing that Davis girl. Oh, that's finished. Now, she was a nice girl. She was a dunce. John. Pop is right. Oh, you meant and you are too kind. <laughs> well, where are we going? Look, you two settle it while I see a man about a dog. Uh, how about the Concourse Plaza? Hmm? All right. Yeah. Had a nice day today. Yeah. I'm glad. He's quite a boy. <laughs> That's what I've been telling you for years. We talked about things, you know, really talked. The way Eddie and I used to. 
Oh, the hell with the Concourse Plaza. Let's go downtown. Let's go to New Yorker, huh? Oh, you are in a good mood. Because I want to go downtown? Well, that and, and the roses. Are you going to talk about those roses all night? I just wanted to thank you for them. You already have. You sound as though you're sorry you got them. Now, don't be ridiculous. Why are you angry? Well, I, I, I'm just tired about hearing about them. Guy, get some roses, big deal. You're embarrassed. I am not. You did something nice that you're embarrassed. Well, you don't know what you're talking about. Don't worry. I won't tell anyone. Nettie, please. Oh, all right. But I want to let you know how much I appreciate it. Good. Now, I'm glad. Yeah, but I do. I... I really do. John... We haven't been to the New Yorker in years. I wonder if they've still got the ice show. Do you suppose we'll have any trouble getting in on a Saturday night? No. Oh. Well, what do you decide? We're going to the Hotel New Yorker. Well, digga, 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 doom. And after that, we're going to the Diamond Horseshoe, and then to the Sawdust Trail. <laughs> Sounds like our night to howl. That's what it is. Whoa! <laughs> you call that a howl? <laughs> now that is what I call a meal. <coughs> oh, excuse me, Mac. <laughs> Guess I just never was brung up proper. <laughs> I guess you just never was. What hope does that give me? <laughs> Every hope in the world, son. When you got real low people like your mother and me for parents, you got no place to go but up. <laughs> <laughs> you speak for yourself. Yeah, I do. I usually do. <laughs> hey, Mom, you like to dance? Oh, no, not yet, Timmy. Not after all that food. I'd collapse. No, you wouldn't. Come on. Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Corporal Cleary. Yes, sir. Corporal Cleary, in this matter, I outrank you. I happen to be married to the lady. Mm -hmm. What's more, she's my wife. <laughs> Dun, ta -da -da. <laughs> I thank you. So, now, may I have the pleasure, or is your card full? Well, I do declare. I dare say, kind sir, I could find room for you. A gavotte, perhaps? A gavotte, indeed. <laughs> My arm, Mrs. Cleary. Oh. Let us step us a measure. Hey, what about me? You, Corporal, you can call the flunky and have him bring another gallon of champagne. My lady and I will have us quite a thirst after all this gavotte. <laughs> Whatever the Colonel says. That's my boy. See you later. Oh, Colonel. Uh, yes, Corporal. What you don't fall over your sword. <laughs> Ready for another one, chap? You bet. <laughs> I'll get him. No, 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 no. You sit there. Talk to your mother. Take half an hour in this crowd. If I can remember which way's the bar. Ah, uh, you'll find out okay. Just close your eyes and home in on it. You son of a gun. Uh, not for me. I'll pass. Oh, come on, Nettie, do you go. No, 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 I know when I've had enough. Well, just a beer. Then. No, I said no, and I mean no. Okay, okay, whatever you want. Cigarette, Mom? Well, you know I don't smoke. Who do you think you're out with? This is your mother, remember? Well, how about that? And where do you come from? I've been here all the time. Uh, hey, yes, you have. Well, that's what mothers are for. Do you like this place? It's okay. Why, you want to move on? Well, I, I was thinking that maybe after you've had the next drink, we could, well... What? Go home? Mm -hmm. well, yeah. It's after 12. Oh, come on, Mom. The night's young. I'm having a great time. Pop's having a great time. I thought you were. Well, why don't you have another drink? Not every day you got your only son back from the biggest war in history. Come on. Relax. Enjoy yourself. I was. I mean, I am. Well, it's getting awful crowded in here, and um, don't you think that maybe you've had enough to drink already tonight? Nope. Emphatically, no. Nope. Look, don't worry about me. I'm fine. Come on, let's dance, huh? We should be able to find a square foot free over there somewhere. Come on. For me. All right. All right, I'll be good. Oh, can you dance to this? Tonight, lady, I could dance to anything. Come on, let's go. Hey, 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 where are you two off? Trying to lose the old man, huh? 
Look, this place is getting too full. Let's finish these up and move on. Now, what do you say? Yeah, well, I, I was just thinking... Sure, the... Pop! Wait, hey, hey, hey. How about the sawdust train? That's what we planned. Now, get your hat, Nettie. Tim, out and grab a cab. I'll get the check. Now, come on, kids. Let's not waste any time. We got a lot of drinking, a lot of dancing to do, yeah? Listen to that man. Listen to him. He's great. What I'd give to play like that. You want to be a musician now? Sure. Well, that's one thing I'll never be. Thank the Lord for small mercies. It's a bum's life. You're going to college. Sure, I'm going to college. You don't stay at college forever. One day I'm going to have to be something. You bet you'll be something. Really something. You'll get yourself a good law degree, go any way you like. Business, the courts, politics. Hey, with a law degree, get into Congress and the Senate, and then, well, lawyers have been in the White House before today, and I guess they will again. <laughs> How about that, eh, Nettie? How about Timmy for President of the United States of America? Yeah, how about it? Mm. All you need is a million dollars. Slow down a bit, Pop. I gotta get a college yet. And everybody that gets there doesn't get a degree along with the entrance exam. They uh, like you to do a few other things as well, you know. Well, you'll do them. You'll do them fine. You'll get a degree with no trouble at all. Good law degree. Well, maybe he doesn't want to study law. Of course he does. And he's got a cleary head in his shoulders. He can see things the right way up. Actually, he did think that he might have a go at American and English literature. Maybe learn a thing or two about writing. See what I mean? Oh, that'll pass. Everybody his age wants to write a novel. Okay. Write a novel. Write two. But get a meal ticket first. Anyway, that's what I said. Yeah, we heard you. Anyway, things are getting far too serious. We're not here to talk, what do you call it, vocational guidance. We're here to enjoy ourselves. Hey. But time for another drink. And then another dance. And then a... another drink. And then another dance. And then another bottle. <laughs> hey, waiter. Hey. We smell her something. Yeah, come on over here. Come on. Same again all around. <laughs> Some of those stairs taken away. I think they grow in the night. I'll see to it first thing tomorrow. Good. Open the door. Yeah, I can't find my key. I can't find the door. Oh, honestly. <laughs> now, where would you be if you were my key? Here, I'll do it. <laughs> you ever see such pretty hair? Don't stop mm. that. That's beautiful hair. Will you please let me open this door? <laughs> Home to wife and mother. You know, someday we'll break our necks because you refuse to leave the light. Uh, by the light of, of the silvery moon. Now, look, that's just Mal enough. Whatever you say, Antoinette. Well, I say to Ben. Shank of the evening. Come here, Mrs. Cleary. Give your old man a bit of a squeeze. Oh, please, John, not so fast. <clears throat> no, sir, you can't beat a law degree. Springboard for anything. So they say. Well, anyone can be a lawyer. How many people become writers? That's my point. You should be proud to have a son who wants to try something different. Did I say I wasn't proud of him? Ebrick, Debrick, Cadidra, Slattern. What? What's that? The, huh? the guy in the red jacket who leads the horses to the post of Jamaica. He always says that when they reach the starting gate. Ah. Ebrick, Cadabrick, Cadidra, Slattern. And here are your horses for the fifth race. As long as you can say it, you're not drunk. Abracadabra, Cadidra, Slattern. Abracadabra, Cadidra, Cadidra, Slattern. Oh, honestly. Cazebra, Cadidra. Not zebra, Cadidra. Uh, Abracadabra, Cadidra, Slattern. Abracadabra, Cadidra, Slattern. That's it. Come on, you got, you got dance a jig to that. Oh, Abracadabra, Cadidra, Slattern. Abracadabra, Cadidra, Slattern. Abracadabra, Cadidra, Slattern. John, Timmy, have you both lost your mind? Nothing wrong Ooh. with us, but a little nightcap wouldn't cure. I'll get a bottle. I'll nightcap you. Oh, I can't bear to hear married people fight. <laughs> 
We ought to go dance some more. Now I know you're drunk. Who was it used to call us before, Morton? Harold Bowen. I wish yeah. we were. Remember the first dance I took you to? Of course. I'll bet you don't. Of course I do. I have this magical feeling from vaudeville. Where was it then? The Crystal Terrace. And what was the first song? Look, it's too late for quiz games. It doesn't matter how cheap and thin the show is. As soon as the house lights go down and the band starts up, I could cry. The first song we ever danced to was Pretty Baby. Yeah. Pretty baby. Pretty baby. A blonde guy crewed it. Yeah, through a gold megaphone. You too remember. Well, of course. I got snoo under my skin. What's new? Nothing. What's new with you? Oh, look, what's he doing? Playing the palace. Look, will you please go to bed? In closing, I would like to do a dance made famous by the inimitable Pat Rooney. Uh, a maestro, if you please. Uh, 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 uh. The old gray. Oh, John. Da, 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 da. Timmy. Mama expects us at 12. We're running a bit late, folks. Yeah. No dance tonight. My mother thanks you. My father thanks you. My sister thanks you. And the Fellmans thank you. <laughs> <laughs> good night, good night, good night. Good night. Good night, Mrs. Cleary, whoever you are. Oh, good night, dear. It's a tough house, but I warmed him up for you. Thanks. Don't look now, but your leg's broken. The show must go on. Lucky lad. Honor to share the bill with you. Shake. Likewise. Sleep well, chap. Night, champ. Look, are you sure you don't want a stomach powder? Abracadabra cathedra slattern. See you in the morning. With the help of God. Abracadabra cathedra slattern. And here are your horses for... <laughs> uh, home two days and both nights to bed like that. Ah, he's entitled. You should hear some of the things he's been through. They overran one of those concentration Yeah, well, I don't want to hear about it now. <laughs> You're right. There's no way they're in the happy evening. Mm, I think we got some aspirin in the kitchen. You didn't say anything about a headache? I don't have a headache. Now, what's the matter? I read that if you put an aspirin in cut flowers, they, they keep longer. Oh. I wonder what made you get them. I don't know. Well, there must be some reason. Right. Well, just thought it'd be nice to do. It was. I like your dress. Oh, you've seen it before. It looks different. Everything about you looks different. Um, what mass are you going to? Ten o'clock. Well, I'd better set the alarm. Betty, I had a good time tonight. Yes, so did I. Did you really? Mm. Or were you putting it on for his sake? No, I, I really did. So did I. Uh, I'll set the alarm for 9 15. Now that he's back, we'll have lots of good times. Look, what's wrong between us? It's nothing to do with him. I didn't say it did. We have to solve our own problems. Of course. And they can't be solved in one night. I know. One night evening doesn't make everything different. Did I say it did? I guess you don't understand. <sighs> I forgot how nice you smell. Oh, spoil everything. I want things right. Would you think this is going to make them right? We have to start someplace. Start? Bless us, old slaver. Well, that's not my idea of a start. Nettie, I want you. I want you like I never wanted anything in my life. Oh, stop. Please. You're drunk. Do you think I could ask again if I was? Well, I'm not one of your hotel lobby whores. If you were, I wouldn't have to ask. A couple of drinks, a couple of jokes, and let's jump into bed. Maybe that's my mistake. Oh, let me alone. Maybe you don't want to be let asked. Let me alone. You've had the drinks. You've had the jokes. Stop. Stop it or I'll... All right. What happened? Um, the, the roses, I guess. I, I knocked them over. Sounded like a bomb. Huh. I'm sorry I woke you. I'll clean up. You, you go back to bed. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night, Pop. You moved me this afternoon. 
When you brought the roses, I felt something stir. I thought it was dead forever. It's not this. I don't understand. I had nothing to do with the roses. They were his idea. I said weak. Waste of time bringing good coffee into this house. I'm thinking about renting the lake house this summer. Business is off. Well, what do you say? About what? Renting the lake house. Timmy will be disappointed. How about you? Oh, I'm in favor of it. Of course you are. I wonder why. Morning. Good morning. Morning. Nice of you to join us. My pleasure. This isn't a hotel. We have our meals at certain times. We should have woke up. No, it's all right. Of course it is. Sit down. What do you want? Coffee. Just coffee? Yeah, my, my stomach's a bit shaky. Uh, you should have taken that stomach fighter. No, uh, it'll be all right. Two days, two hangovers. Is that what they taught you in the army? Cream, please. Oh. Thank you. I'm thinking of rent in the lake house. Well, how come? I can use the money. Oh. Well, that all you're gonna say? What do you expect me to say? I thought that house meant something to you. It does. But if you need the money... A bunch of strangers sleeping in our beds, using our things, doesn't bother you at all? It has to be. It? Of course, I forgot. What's a little summer cottage after the earth-shattering things you've been through? Mom, do you have more cream? Yeah, I'll get it. Yeah, well, what do you want more cream for? Coffee's strong. It's weak. But no, it, it's too strong for me. Here. Thanks. A few months in the army, they're experts on everything, even coffee. Now, who said that? By the time I was your age, I was in the coffee business nine years. Nine years. When I was 17, they sent me to Brazil for three months. I know. Yeah, I've never been out of New York before, but I went down there on my own and did my job. For Emerson, wasn't it? No uniform, no buddies. No Uncle Sam to lean on, just myself. All alone in that strange place. Well, that's the time you grew the mustache to look older. Yeah, who's telling the story? Sorry. 35 years in the business, he's gonna tell me about coffee. Look, I, I wasn't telling you anything about anything. I just said that for me, the, the coffee was too strong. What time's dinner? Mom expects us at 12. I suppose you'll wear your uniform. It's the only thing I have that fits. You sure? I mean, maybe you haven't grown as much as you think. It'll be ravioli. Yeah, <laughs> meatballs. GI Bill, home loans, discharge bonus, unemployment insurance. <laughs> you boys did pretty well for yourselves. Well, they did pretty well for us, too. Oh, say, can you see? What's your point, Pop? The war's over. I'll buy that. The world doesn't owe anyone a living, including veterans. I'll buy that, too. Let the Jews support you. Come again? Wasn't for them, we wouldn't have gotten into it in the first place. I thought you broke that record. Lousy kikes. John. I, I changed my mind. I'll have some toast. Don't tell me you've lost your great love for the Jews. Now, please. It's, it's all right. How nice of you to let me talk in my own house. I mean, not even a veteran. Would you mind telling me what you're mad about? Who's mad? Anything on the toast? Uh, honey, if you got it. Man states a few facts right away, he's mad. How about strawberry jam? No, no. If I get a halfway decent offer, I might sell the lake house. See? Yeah, all right. Now hurry up with your breakfast. What for? Mass starts in 20 minutes. You're not even dressed. Mass? Mass? What? I haven't been a mass so, oh, in over two years. You know that. Lots of bad habits you boys picked up. You'll have to get over. Not going to mass is not a habit I picked up. It's a decision I came to after a lot of thought. What way is that for a Catholic to talk? I haven't considered myself a Catholic for quite a while. Must be something wrong with my ears. You knew this was coming. Why pretend it's such a shock? Now there's a familiar alliance. So you've outgrown the faith, huh? It doesn't answer my needs. Outgrown your old clothes and outgrown the faith. Pop, will you listen to me? Billions of people have believed in it since the beginning of time, but it's not good enough for you. It's not a question of good enough. What do you say when people ask you what religion you are, huh? Nothing. You say you're nothing? Yeah. Oh, 
O'Clearys have been Catholic since... since the beginning of time. And now you, a Cleary, are gonna tell people that you're nothing? Yeah. You're an atheist, John. When you come to the... the blank after religion on those college applications, put down atheist, makes a big hit in those Ivy League places from what I hear. I am not an atheist. Then what are you? Why, I don't know. I'd like a chance to find out. You don't know what you believe in? Do you? Yeah. Well, tell me. Or go on. I believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I, I believe that God created man in his own image. I Look, Pop. Pop, if your faith works for you, I am glad. I'm very glad. I wish it worked for me, but it doesn't. Do you believe in God? Yes or no? I don't believe in heaven or hell or purgatory or... Yes or no? I believe there's something bigger than myself. Now, what you call it, or what it is, I don't know. Well, this is a fine how do you do. But yesterday, you said he was a man. A man has a right to decide such things for himself. Good morning, Father Riley. Good morning, Mr. Cleary. I understand your boy's out of service. Yes, Father. Where is he this fine Sunday morning, Mr. Cleary? Home, Father. Is he sick, Mr. Cleary? No, Father. Then why isn't he here in church, Mr. Cleary? He's become an atheist, Father. I am not an atheist. Whatever you are, I won't have it. I'm the boss of this house. If you want to go on living here, you'll do as I say. And I say you're going to church with me this morning. Do you know what you're doing? Keep out of this. No, you well, pay attention to him. It's all right. I'll go to church with you. I'll be out in a minute. Forget it. What? I said forget it. The Lord doesn't want anybody in his house who has to be dragged there. Score another one for your side, Nick. It has nothing to do with her. Wait till you're down on all fours someday. You'll be glad to see a priest then. We'll meet you at Mama's. I won't be there. But she expects us. We all have our disappointment. I said I'd go with you. No. What was all that about? Oh. Should have gone with him. Oh, I'll never understand that man. Well, why didn't I just go? Why did I have to make an issue? Uh, it wasn't your fault. No, it never is. When he's in one of those moods, there's nothing anyone can do. The Alliance. That's what he called us. Everyone's entitled to their own beliefs. Well, that, that's what we must seem like to him. An Alliance. Always two against one. Always us against him. Why? Look, if you're through eating, I'll clear the table. Didn't you hear me? Evidently, your father's not the only one who got up on the wrong side of bed this morning. Look, I am not talking about this morning. There's no need to shout. You and him and me and what's been going on here for 20 years. But it's got to stop. What's got to stop? We've got to stop ganging up on him. Oh, is that what we've been doing? Well, you said you never understood him. And never will. Have you ever really tried? Go on. Have you ever tried to see things from his point of view? What things? Well, the lake house, for instance. Well, the lake house? It's the pride and joy of his life, and you're always knocking it. Well, do you know why? Yes. Because he bought it without consulting you. Yeah, drove me out to this, this godforsaken lake, pointed to a bungalow with no heat or hot water, and said, that's where we'll be spending our summers from now on. An hour's ride from New York City isn't exactly godforsaken. It wasn't an hour's ride 20 years ago. The point is, would he have gotten it any other way? If he'd come to you and said he wanted to buy a cottage on a lake in New Jersey, would you have said yes? Well, I might have. No, no. Not if it had been a palace with 50 servants. I don't like the country. We'd have spent every summer right here. Well, my idea of a vacation is to, is to travel, see something new. You had a chance to see Brazil. Yeah, no, that was different. Yeah. And the fellow who took that job is a millionaire today. Yeah, and still living in Brazil. Which is not to be compared with the Bronx. So it's my fault we are not millionaires? Your mother might have loved Brazil. You violently objected to moving from Yorkville to the Bronx. Why? I hate the Bronx. But you insisted on your mother move up here. Well, they tore down her building. She had to move somewhere. Except for summers at the lake. Have you ever gone two days without seeing her? Only because of Willis. Where are you going? To get dressed. And then I'm going to church and apologize to him for acting like a fool. 
You'll, you'll be at Mama's for dinner. Only if he'll come with me. You look, you disappointed Willis yesterday. You can't do it again. Oh, yes, I can. Oh, how cruel. Cruel? Not as cruel as you're dragging me over there every day when I was little. And when I was bigger and couldn't go every day, concentrating on Sundays. Is it too much to give your crippled cousin one day a week? And when I didn't go there on a Sunday, I, I felt so guilty that I, I, I couldn't enjoy myself anyway. I hate Sunday. And I don't think I'll ever get over it. But I'm going to try. Well, how fortunate for the cripples in this world that everyone isn't as selfish as you. Now, why do you keep calling him a cripple? That is not the worst thing wrong with Willis. It's his mind. He's like a four-year-old. Can a four-year-old read a book? Yeah, yeah, he reads. After you drilling him every day for 20 years. But does he have any idea what he's reading about? Look, if you and the rest of them over there want to throw your lives away on him, you go ahead and do it. But don't try and sacrifice me to the cause. Excuse me, am I? Well, you have to admit I'm right, don't you? You and your mother and all the rest have missed out on a lot because of him. Now, I know it's not his fault, but I mean... Well, look, these days you've got to be realistic. I mean, you've got to face up to... Where you going? Your mother doesn't expect us till 12. Look, I'm coming. Just give me a minute to dress and I'll go with you. Now, look. Excuse me. No. I have to go out. No, wait. I told you, I won't be a second. Would you please pass me my pocket? Sure, yeah. Here. Hey, 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 wait a minute. This is like lead. You've got all your coins in here. You're taking your coins. What for? Will you please tell me what's going on? Thank you for the rosary. Oh, my God. God. I remember her sitting here like this the night she went to have John. Why would she just walk out, not tell anyone where she was going? I was... I was six. Without any reason. Dr. Goldman came at midnight and he took her to the hospital. Doesn't make sense. And after they left, I started to cry. You did too. Not like her. I asked you if you loved her and, and you nodded. And I asked you to say it. You hesitated, and I got hysterical. And to quiet me, you finally said, I love her. Maybe she's at Sophie's. No, no, I called Sophie. It's after 10. I called everybody. She's been gone 12 hours. And they all said they'd call back if they heard from her. If she's not here by 11 o'clock, I'm calling the police. I wonder what difference it would have made if John lived. I wonder what department you call. I remember you and I going to visit her at the hospital on a Sunday afternoon. I had to wait downstairs. It was the first time I ever heard the word incubator. Incubator. I guess you call missing persons. You're the last one who saw. The police will want to question you. She left the house at 10 a.m., Your Honor. Didn't say boo, but I assumed she was going to her mother's. Brown coat, brown hat. And when I got to her mother, she wasn't there. They hadn't seen her, hadn't heard from her. I had two helpings of ravioli and meatballs, came back here to wait. And when she didn't call by three o'clock, I started to worry. And drink? When she didn't call by three o'clock, I started to worry. I tried to get in touch with my father. Called all the bars I could think of. Is Mr. Cleary there? If he comes in, would you please tell him to call his house? Oh, it was like old times. I had dinner and went to a movie. Is Mr. Cleary there? Now, that shows how long I've been away. You never say, is Mr. Cleary there? You say, let me speak to Mr. Cleary. As though you know he was there. I was at a movie. Did it have a happy ending? Yeah. Uh, Gildo with Rita Hayworth and Glenn Ford. I didn't ask you what it was. Uh, the Lost Paradise. I didn't ask you what it was. What's the matter with you? You like a drink? No. And I think you've had enough. It's the first time I ever saw you refuse a drink. <laughs>
I want you to stop. But you are powerless to stop me. It's a, it's a lousy position to be in, I, I know. That's your last one. You touch that bottle and I leave. Joy, joy, said Mrs. Malloy. Louder, louder, said Mrs. Oh, what rhymes with loud? You were sick Friday night. Sick last night. Hello? Oh. No, oh, nothing. I said we haven't heard anything. And I know how long she's been gone. And of course I'm concerned. I don't care how I sound, I'm concerned. If she's not here by 11, that's what I'm gonna do. Well, that's a comforting bit of information. A mother again. Wanted to let me know how many muggins there's been lately. I got it. Earl Browder. What? Louder, louder, said Mrs. Earl Browder. I'm glad you can take the whole thing so calmly. To quote a famous authority, I don't care how I sound. I'm concerned. Ten after ten. The trouble with you is you haven't had enough experience in these matters. Well, the devil can she be? I am an old hand. Never done anything like this before in her life. All those nights I lay in bed waiting for your key to turn in the door. Part of me praying you'd come home safe. Part of me dreading the sound of that key, because I knew there'd be a fight. I'll give her a few minutes more. All those mornings, I woke up sick. I had to miss school. The boy's delicate, everyone said. He's got a weak constitution. I'll give it till half past. From the day I left this house, I was never sick. Not once. It took me a long time to see the connection. Where can she go? She has no money? Wrong. What? You said wrong. I want to know what you meant. Let go my arm. <clears throat> Thanks. She took her coins. What? Her coins. She took them with her. All of them? All of them. Why didn't you mention it before? She had over fifty dollars in dimes and quarters. A person could go quite a ways with fifty dollars. You saw her take them? Yep. Didn't it strike you as peculiar? Everything strikes me as peculiar. Or something you're not telling me. We all have our little secrets. There is something. Take you and your money, for instance. I want to know what it is. I mean, for all I know, we could be millionaires. I want to know why your mother left this house. Just between us chickens. How much do you have? Uh, I need a drink. Oh, no, you don't. Answer me. If you don't put that bottle down, I am leaving. I want an answer. See you around the pool hall. You ain't going nowhere. Answer me. This is a hell of a way to treat a veteran. I've taken all that crap from you. I'm going to. You want an answer? I want a drink. Is it a deal? Give me the bottle. Push the answer. I forget the question. Why did your mother leave this house? Well, we... we had an argument. About what? I don't remember. Probably something to do with your drinking. Yep. Yep. That's where it was. She said that I drank too much. She's right. Yep. I never thought I'd see the day when you and she would argue. Neither did I. She didn't say where she was going. Just took the coins and left? That's right. Beats me. Where are you going? To get something to eat. Eat? I didn't have any supper. A minute ago, you're so worried you couldn't even sit down. I'm just gonna have a sandwich. Have a banquet. What are you getting mad at me for? You're the one who argued with her. Which absolves you completely. She, she might jump off a bridge, but your conscience is clear. A person planning to do something like that doesn't take a bunch of change along. She thanked me for the roses. Don't you have any consideration for other people's feelings? Consideration? Don't you know how much it pleased her to think they were from you? You talk about consideration. How could you do it? Do you have any idea how I look forward to this morning? To mass and 
and, uh, and dropping in at Rafferty's afterwards with you in your uniform? Always the injured party. You'll be the injured party in about two minutes. I already am. Real rough you had it. Good food, good clothes. Oh, was a roof over your head. Hey, ho, everybody. It's count your blessings time. Yeah, I'll tell you what rough is. Being so hungry, you begged. Being thrown out in the street with your few sticks of furniture for all the neighbors to enjoy. Never sleeping in a bed with less than two other people. <laughs> Always hiding from collectors. Having to leave school at the age of ten because your father was crippled for life and it was your job to support the house. Oh, you had it rough, all right. The subject was roses. Where I couldn't have gone with your advantages. What I couldn't have been. I still want to know why you told her about the roses. Dear, we were having words. Uh, and it slipped out. Words about what? Well? Stop pushing or I'll tell you. Go on, go on. Okay. The humpin' I'm getting is not worth the humpin' I'm getting. You pig. I'm warning you. You pig. <coughs> well, hello, mother of mine. Sorry, I've had one. Where or have you too been? Many. I was I about to call the police. My cathedral is. I want to know where you've been. Are you going to tell me where you've been? You wouldn't believe me. Of course I'd believe you. You don't look well, Timmy. Appearances are deceiving. I feel terrible. Why wouldn't I believe you? You just wouldn't. Tell me and see. I went to the movies. Go on. That's it. You just went to the movies? That's right. You've been gone over 12 hours. I stayed for several shows. Are you trying to tell me you were at a movie for 12 hours? I knew you wouldn't believe me. I believe you. Thank you. What did you see? Now, that means you don't believe me. No, I guess not. I demand to know where you were. Well, I, uh, I went to the Hotel Astor, picked up a man, had a few drinks, a few jokes, went to his room. Stop it. Oh, but I was just getting to the best crowd. You're making a fool of yourself. Is there anything I could say that you would believe? Say, say you took a bus downtown, you walked around, visited the museum, had dinner, went to Radio City, and came home. I took a bus downtown, walked around, visited a museum, had dinner... Went to Radio City and came home. Went to Radio City and came home. I'll buy that. And if you've any sense, you buy a two-pop. I don't have any sense. I'm just a poor, ignorant slob whose wife's been missing 12 hours, and I want to know where she was. What difference does it make? Stay out of this. How? What are you going to tell your mother? Nothing. The poor woman's almost out of her mind. There's a joke here someplace. Well, at least call her and say you're home. But she'll want an explanation. When I tell her, she won't believe me any more than you did. I'll believe you when you tell the truth. What is truth? Sorry. I'll tell you this. In all my life, the past 12 hours are the only real freedom I've ever known. Did you enjoy it? Every moment. Why did you come back? I'm a coward. Will somebody tell me what's going on? You heard the question, ladies and gentlemen. Up there in the balcony, the bearded gent with... Oh, dear. Oh, dear me. I'm sorry, folks, but I'm just going to be ill. Oh, wait, dear. No, no, just leave me to dial phone. Just leave me to it. He didn't want me to hold his head. What happened to your coins? I spent them. How? I took a bus downtown, walked around, visited a museum. It wasn't for his drink and none of this would have happened. Why do you say that? If he didn't drink you and he wouldn't have argued. Well, isn't that why you left? Because you had an argument about his drinking? We had an argument. But it wasn't about drinking. What was it about? You, mostly. Go on. He thinks I don't give you enough credit. Feels you're quite a guy. He said we had to stop ganging up on you. That's what he said. Oh. Uh, I 
couldn't sleep. Neither could I. I, uh... came out to get a magazine. Do you feel all right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm okay now. What time is it? Almost two. Are you all right? Yes, sir. All right. I guess I'll turn in. Good night. Um, isn't there something you want to tell me? As a matter of fact, there is, but, uh, it, 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 it'll keep till the morning. You've decided to leave? Yeah. Well? Well, it, it's not a sudden decision. When are you leaving? In the morning. You see, this fella, this fella I'm in a high school with has a, has a flat on 22nd Street, and his roommate just got married, and, uh, he's looking for a replacement. Well, I figured that, uh, Hey. I'll give you a penny for him. Hmm? Oh. An apple core. What? An apple core. I was um, due to start working for a law firm. Passed all the interviews and had been notified to report for work the following Monday. On Sunday, my sister and I were walking in the park. And a blonde boy, who had a crush on me, but was too bashful to speak, demonstrated his affection by throwing an apple core, which hit me in the face. When I woke up Monday morning, I had the most beautiful black eye you ever saw. I was too embarrassed to start a new job looking like that, but I called in sick. They called back to say the position had been filled for somebody else. The next job I found was the one that brought your father and I together. I often think of that, Abercore. I wonder what my life would be like if it never been thrown. Everyone wonders about things like that. I was going in early to type up some dictation I'd taken the night before. The front street was deserted. As I walked, I had the sensation of being watched. I glanced up at the office I was passing and saw this young man, the father, staring down. He looked at me intensely, almost angrily for a moment, and suddenly realized I was looking back at him and he turned away. In that moment, I knew that that young man and I were not same time, I knew we would become involved. It was inevitable. Why? You had others to choose from? No. Yeah. All gentle, considerate men. All very much like my father. One of them was the baker from Patterson, New Jersey, that we always joke about. That fellow who brought a hat box full of pastries whenever he called on you? <laughs> Oh, what a sweet man. I begged me to marry him. What was it drew you to Pop? I think it was his energy. A certain wildness. He wasn't like my father at all. I was attracted. I was afraid. I've always been a little afraid of him. Then he was clearly a young man who was going places. Twenty-four when I met him, and making well over a hundred a week. Well, he had great money in those days, and his prospects were unlimited. M money was, was never plentiful in our house. I mean, we weren't poor like his people, you understand. Never without rent or food or tickets to the opera or nice clothes. But still, we weren't um, well-to-do. My father brought home stories from the hotel about the various big weeks who came in and what they wore and how they talked and acted. And we went to the opera and we had friends who were cultured. Musical Sunday afternoons. Those were Papa's happiest moments. Oh, yeah, I, I like good things. Things that the baker from Patterson and the others could
could never kiss me. But your father, surely you would. Mom. Well, the way he was grown, he'd be a millionaire. Well, that was his dream, you know, to be a millionaire by the time he was 40. Well, 1929 took care of that. He was never quite the same afterwards. But when I met him, ooh, he was cock of the walk. Good-looking, witty young Irishman. Everybody liked him. And those who didn't, at least feared him, because he was, he was a, a fierce fellow. Everyone wanted to go into business with him. Everyone wanted to be social with him. No, he was immediately at home, on a ship, a train, and any bar. Strangers thought he was magnificent. And he was. So long as the situation was impersonal. At his best. In an impersonal situation. But that doesn't include the home family. The baker from Patterson was all tongue-tied outside. In the home... Go to bed now. You want the light off? Yeah, please. When I left this house three years ago, I blamed him for everything that was wrong here. When I came home, I blamed you. Now I suspect that no one's to blame. Not even me. Good night. Who loves you, Matthew? You do, Paul. Why, Matthew? Because I'm a nice girl. One word from you. That's all it would take. I'm not so sure. Try. No. Do you want him to go? No. Then say something before it's too late. What do you want for breakfast? Oh, who cares about breakfast? Timmy's having scrambled eggs. Am I the only one who's upset by what's going on here? No. And how can you just stand there? Would you feel better if I wept? You'll weep when he's gone. But not now. Look, all I want you to do is to tell him how you feel. He knows that. You won't speak to him? I can't. You're the one who'll miss him most. For me, it, it, it's different. I got my business. I envy you. Look, just ask him to wait a couple of days and think it over. After a couple of days, we'd be used to having him around. It would be that much harder to see him leave. He might change his mind. Might not want to leave. He has to leave sometime. But not now. Not like this. The 22nd Street isn't the end of the world. If he leaves this house today, I don't want to see him ever again. If you say that to me, make it clear that you're speaking for yourself. Who's this fellow he's moving in? Oh, a boy he knew at high school. Everything he wants right here. Food, clothing, a room of his own. He has to move into a dirty, cold water flat. I think I understand his feelings. Home two days and gone again. The neighbors will have a field day. I'm going in to call him now. Huh? I want to see him alone. If you're wise, you won't start around. I want to see him alone. All right. What the heck do I say to him? I understand you've decided to leave us. Oh, no. What's this nonsense about your leaving? Your mother tells me you're moving out. I would like to know why. Oh, I demand to know why. Would you be so good as to tell me why? Oh, why, God damn it! Good morning. Morning. Mother said you wanted to see me. Uh, sleep well? Yeah. Good. Y you wanted to see me? <coughs> uh, Mother yeah. says you're leaving. Yeah. Rather sudden, isn't it? Well, not really. Mind telling me why? Well, I just think it's for the best. For who? For everyone. Dark oh, crap! No, wait, I, I... I didn't mean that. 
fact is, I, I don't blame you for wanting to leave. I had no business hitting you. That's not why I'm gone. You know, if there was any way I could undo last night, I would. It's not a question of last night. If I had to do it over again, I, I'd cut my arm off. Pop, listen. I, I don't know what gets into me sometimes. Pop. I am not leaving because of anything that happened last night. I always intended to leave. You never mentioned it? Well, I, I planned to stay a couple of weeks and then go. A couple of days isn't a couple of weeks. <laughs> it's not like going to China. Well, why two days instead of two weeks? Because I know that if I stay two weeks, I'll never leave. Look, if it's what I said yesterday about me being the boss and you'd have to do what I said, forget well, it. It's not that. I was just letting off steam. It's not that. As far as I'm concerned, you're a man. You, you can come and go as you please. Do as you please. That goes for religion, drink, and anything. How can I make you understand? Even girls. Yeah, I know how it is to be your age. Give me a little advance notice. I'll see you have the house to yourself whenever you want. Up for Christ's sake. What kind of language is that? Oh. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean that. Talk any way you want. I don't know what to say to you. <laughs> Look, what I said yesterday about the Jews. I was just trying to get a rise out of it. I know. See, at the time those bums from St. Matthew's jumped the eye-catch clothes, man. I was the one who saved him. I know. A whole crowd of people watching, but I was the only one who did anything. Do you think I could forget that? You stay another week. Just a week. I can. Stay till Wednesday? No. Do you have any idea how your mother looked forward to you coming home? Yes. Then how can you do it? Oh, we're just going round in circles. What happens to the lake house? What do you mean? Without you, what's the good of it? I'll be spending time there. I thought we'd have a real summer together like before the war. You're making this a lot tougher than it has to be. Did you expect me to say nothing? Like her? Are you through? Look, I know what the trouble is. You know what the trouble is? You're like me, stubborn. All the clear is a stubborn. Rather die than admit a mistake. Now, is that a fact, yes or no? I don't know. Well, here's one donkey who's seen the light. I've been wrong in my dealings with you, and I admit it. Pop. Not just wrong last night, but all along. Well, those days are gone forever, and, and I'll prove it. You know how much money I have? I don't want to know. $14,357. Pop. Plus a bit more in stocks. Now you admit that you made a mistake. Admit you... Don't really want to leave, and we'll forget the whole thing. I don't want to leave. See? But I'm leaving. Then go, and good riddance. Listen to me. The sooner the better. Will you listen to me? There was a dream I used to have about you and I. It was always the same. I'd be told that you were dead, and I'd run crying into the street. Someone had stopped me and asked me why I was crying. I might say, my father's dead and he never said he loved me. I only tried to make you stay for her sake. I had that dream again last night. And I was thinking about it this morning when something occurred to me that, that I'd never thought of before. She's the one who'll miss you. It's true you never said you loved me. But it's also true that I never said those words to you. Don't know what you're talking about. I say them now. I don't know what you're talking about. I love you, Pop. Sam. Sam, hey, Pop. <laughs> what I said about the money, that's strictly between us. I understand. Ready for breakfast? Sure. Yeah. Your bag's packed and ready to go. I, uh, I changed my mind. What? I changed my mind. Uh, I'm going to stay a few days more. Er, uh, I'm afraid that's out of the question. Uh, when you said you were going, I, I called the painters. They're coming to do your room tomorrow. You know how hard it is to get painters. If we don't take them now, it'll be months before they're free again. Well, then uh, I guess I'd better leave a schedule. Uh, I think so. Don't you, Nettie? Yes. Oh, I don't know why I bother to bring good coffee into this house. If it isn't too weak, it's too strong. If it isn't too strong, it's too hot. If it isn't too hot, it's too cold.
You've been listening to Cyril Shapps as John Cleary, Doreen Hepburn as his wife Nettie, and Donald Donnelly as their son Timmy in The Subject Was Roses by Frank D. Gilroy. The play was adapted for radio and produced in Northern Ireland by Roger Pine. Well, now we'll have the, the news at uh, 10 o'clock in about a minute and a half. Let's have a look tomorrow on Radio 3. If you happen to be an Irishman and of a certain age, your blood may be stirred by the theme and by at least one of the tunes of an opera from Glyndebourne, which will be having its first broadcast performance on Radio 3. It's called The Rising of the Moon, and it's by Nicholas Moore. Beverly Cross, the librettist, tells us the plot of the opera was invented during a lunch of game, pie and burgundy in a restaurant Tuesday, November the 26th, 1966, adding that the producer Colin Graham and the designer Osbert Lancaster also had a hand in it, and the composer was a hard taskmaster when it came to set it, setting it to music. I have to apologise because uh, we should have the weather, but uh, it's not at the moment the hand, so nothing I can do about it at the moment. We have it, I think, perhaps after the news. The uh, programme I'm talking about on Radio 3 uh, is tomorrow at 10 o'clock. This is BBC Radio 4. Here's the news read by Sean Kelly. Ministers of seven Arab countries are meeting in Tripoli on Monday to discuss their differences over Middle East peace negotiations. In Belfast, the army has again warned British troops about security precautions on or off duty. Merseyside, Glasgow and Aberdeen dockers have voted to return to work on Monday. At the start of the football season, there were disturbances at Reading and Bristol Rovers grounds. In the Middle East, Arab leaders are trying to resolve their differences over the American peace proposals. The foreign and defence ministers of seven countries have arranged to meet in Tripoli, the Libyan, Libyan capital, on Monday. The countries are Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Algeria, Sudan and Libya. The Lebanese foreign minister said his country hadn't been invited, but tonight the Prime Minister of the Lebanon arrived unexpectedly in Cairo. He was said to have a message, a message from President Halou. In Cairo, President Nasser has been meeting his senior policy advisers in emergency discussions about the rift among the Arabs. Yesterday, an envoy from Iraq, which leads the opposition to the American plan, flew in with a message from President Bakr. A report from the Egyptian capital tonight says the commander of the Soviet Air Force, Marshal Kutakov, has arrived there from Moscow. In Israel, a committee of ministers is drafting the formal Israeli reply to the American peace proposals. The cabinet have already announced their decision to accept the plan, though with reservations. The foreign minister, Mr. Iban, has said that President Nasser helped Israel to reach her decision. In a radio interview, he said Israel had three choices. She could reject the proposals, accept them unconditionally, or with reservations. President Nasser's acceptance, with qualifications, had left Israel free to do the same. After Thursday night's shooting by an army marksman of a Roman Catholic teenager in Belfast, British soldiers in Northern Ireland have again been warned to be cautious at all times, whether on or off duty. From Belfast, Chris Underwood. Some two months ago, a statement purporting to be from the Irish Republican Army warned that for every Irishman killed during the Troubles, two English soldiers would die in reprisal. This IRA warning was repeated during recent Troubles in the Catholic Falls area. Troops are instructed not to go to trouble areas while off duty, and if they do go out, to go out at least in pairs. As an added precaution, extra guards will be placed on military vehicles, and the army are doubling up on mobile patrol personnel. A statement from the governing body of the Apprentice Boys of Londonderry tonight 
decided that they will observe the government's ban on parades here and not march on August the 12th, the anniversary of the relief of the city. Instead, they will hold a rally and have asked that all pubs in Londonderry City should close for the day. But the ban was in fact defied tonight by 500 members of the Orange and Apprentice Boys in Dramara, County Down, who paraded to the opening of a new hall in the village. Extra police were on duty, but no attempt was made to stop the parade. In Belfast, Belfast this afternoon, shoppers had to leave the main Woolworth store in the city after an incendiary device had set paper alight in a storeroom on the third floor. Police and troops cordoned off the area as firemen moved in. Little damage was caused. An extremist organization in Dublin has claimed responsibility for two shooting incidents this week involving American servicemen, the latest last night. The man concerned, a Marine Lance Corporal, has now been discharged from hospital. The sailor, shot on Tuesday night from a passing car, is still detained. The extremist group, calling themselves the Invincibles, have said that if any of their members are caught, they'll kidnap an Irish bishop or a politician. Another organization, the Irish Indochina Solidarity Committee, has claimed responsibility for Tuesday night shooting. Final confirmation of the end of the dock strike came today when dockers on Merseyside and in Scotland voted to join their colleagues throughout the rest of Britain in a return to work on Monday. Philip Whitfield. 5,000 dockers met at the old Liverpool boxing stadium this morning and despite earlier uncertainties about whether or not dockers in this normally militant port would accept the Pearson recommendations, only a handful voted against acceptance of the terms. The shop steward's chairman said he was disappointed in the outcome of the Pearson report, but it would be suicidal to go it alone. And Mr Lou Lloyd, their district union official, said the vote to go back didn't mean an end to Merseyside's militancy. They would continue to fight the employers. 1,500 dockers from Glasgow similarly endorsed the return to work, and in Aberdeen, after dockers had voted for the return, they said they would give priority to shipping essential cargoes to the Orkneys and Shetland Isles. In fact, priority will be given at every port on Monday to moving perishable cargoes, fruit, meat and vegetables especially, which have lain in ships and dockside warehouses during the strike. On the employer's side, they will be working hard to hurry ahead with their modernization schemes for London, Southampton and Hull.